Chapter 1. One of the very first bullets comes in through the open window above the toilet where Luca is standing. He doesn't immediately understand that it's a bullet at all, and it's only luck that it doesn't strike him between the eyes. Luca hardly registers the mild noise it makes as it flies past and lodges into the tiled wall behind him. But the wash of bullets that follows is loud booming, and thudding, clack clacking with helicopter speed. There is a raft of screams, too, but that noise is short-lived, soon exterminated by the gunfire. Before Luca can zip his pants, lower the lid, climb up to look out before he has time to verify the source of that terrible clamor, the bathroom door swings open and mommy is there. Miho, Ben, she says, so quietly that Luca doesn't hear her. Her hands are not gentle, she propels him toward the shower. He trips on the raised tile step and falls forward onto his hands. Mommy lands on top of him and his teeth pierce his lip in the tumble. He tastes blood. One dark droplet makes a tiny circle of red against the bright green shower tile. Mommy shoves Luca into the corner. There's no door on this shower, no curtain. It's only a corner of his abuela's bathroom, with a third tiled wall built to suggest a stall. This wall is around five and a half feet high and three feet long, just large enough, with some luck, to shield Luca and his mother from sight. Luca's back is wedged, his small shoulders touching both walls. His knees are drawn up to his chin, and mommy is clinched around him like a tortoise's shell. The door of the bathroom remains open, which worries Luca, though he can't see it beyond the shield of his mother's body, behind the half-barricade of his abuela's shower wall. He'd like to wriggle out and tip that door lightly with his finger. He'd like to swing it shut. He doesn't know that his mother left it open on purpose. That a closed door only invites closer scrutiny. The clatter of gunfire outside continues, joined by an odor of charcoal and burning meat. Poppy is grilling carne asada out there and Luca's favorite chicken drumsticks. He likes them only a tiny bit blackened, the crispy tang of the skins. His mother pulls her head up long enough to look him in the eye. She puts her hands on both sides of his face and tries to cover his ears. Outside, the gunfire slows. It ceases and then returns in short bursts, mirroring, Luca thinks, the sporadic and wild rhythm of his heart. In between the racket, Luca can still hear the radio, a woman's voice announcing La Measure 100.1 FM Acapulco. Followed by Banda MS singing about how happy they are to be in love. Someone shoots the radio, and then there's laughter. Men's voices. Two or three, Luca can't tell. Hard boot steps on Abuela's patio. Is he here? One of the voices is just outside the window. Here. What about the kid? Mira, there's a boy here. This him. Luca's cousin Adrian. He's wearing cleats and his Hernandez jersey. Adrian can juggle a ballon de football on his knees 47 times without dropping it. I don't know. Looks the right age. Take a picture. Hey, chicken. Another voice says. Man, this looks good. You want some chicken. Luca's head is beneath his mammy's chin, her body knotted tightly around him. Forget the chicken, pendijo. Check the house. Luca's mommy rocks in her squatting position, pushing Luca even harder into the tiled wall. She squeezes against him, and together they hear the squeak and bang of the back door. Footsteps in the kitchen. The intermittent rattle of bullets in the house. Mommy turns her head and notices, vivid against the tile floor, the lone spot of Luca's blood, illuminated by the slant of light from the window. Luca feels her breath snag in her chest. The house is quiet now. The hallway that ends at the door of this bathroom is carpeted. Mommy tugs her shirt sleeve over her hand, and Luca watches in horror as she leans away from him, toward that telltale splatter of blood. She runs her sleeve over it, leaving behind only a faint smear, and then pitches back to him just as the man in the hallway uses the butt of his AK-47 to nudge the door the rest of the way open. There must be three of them because Luca can still hear two voices in the yard. On the other side of the shower wall, the third man unzips his pants and empties his bladder into Abuela's toilet. Luca does not breathe. Mommy does not breathe. Their eyes are closed, their bodies motionless, even their adrenaline is suspended within the calcified will of their stillness. The man hiccups, flushes, washes his hands. He dries them on Abuela's good yellow towel, the one she puts out only for parties. 
they don't move after the man leaves. Even after they hear the squeak and bang, once more, of the kitchen door. They stay there, fixed in their tight knot of arms and legs and knees and chins and clenched eyelids and locked fingers, even after they hear the man join his compatriots outside, after they hear him announce that the house is clear and he's going to eat some chicken now, because there's no excuse for letting good barbecue go to waste, not when there are children starving in Africa. The man is still close enough outside the window that Luca can hear the moist, rubbery smacking sounds his mouth makes with the chicken. Luca concentrates on breathing, in and out, without sound. He tells himself that this is just a bad dream, a terrible dream, but one he's had many times before. He always awakens, heart pounding, and finds himself flooded with relief. It was just a dream. Because these are the modern bogeymen of urban Mexico. Because even parents who take care not to discuss the violence in front of them, to change the radio station when there's news of another shooting, to conceal the worst of their own fears, cannot prevent their children from talking to other children. On the swings, at the football field, in the boys' bathroom at school, the gruesome stories gather and swell. These kids, rich, poor, middle class, have all seen bodies in the streets. Casual murder. And they know from talking to one another that there's a hierarchy of danger, that some families are at greater risk than others. So although Luca never saw the least scrap of evidence of that risk from his parents, even though they demonstrated their courage impeccably before their son, he knew, he knew this day would come. But that truth does nothing to soften its arrival. It's a long, long while before Luca's mother removes the clamp of her hand from the back of his neck before she leans back far enough for him to notice that the angle of light falling through the bathroom window has changed. There's a blessing in the moments after terror and before confirmation. When at last he moves his body, Luca experiences a brief, lurching exhilaration at the very fact of his being alive. For a moment he enjoys the ragged passage of breath through his chest. He places his palms flat to feel the cool press of tiles beneath his skin. Mommy collapses against the wall across from him and works her jaw in a way that reveals the dimple in her left cheek. It's weird to see her good church shoes in the shower. Luca touches the cut on his lip. The blood has dried there, but he scratches it with his teeth, and it opens again. He understands that, were this a dream, he would not taste blood. At length, Mommy stands. Stay here, she instructs him in a whisper. Don't move until I come back for you. Don't make a sound, you understand. Luca lunges for her hand. Mommy, don't go. Miho, I will be right back, okay. You stay here. Mommy pries Luca's fingers from her hand. Don't move, she says again. Good boy. Luca finds it easy to obey his mother's directive, not so much because he's an obedient child, but because he doesn't want to see. His whole family out there, in Abuela's backyard. Today is Saturday, April 7, his cousin Unifer's quinceañera, her 15th birthday party. She's wearing a long white dress. Her father and mother are there, Tio Alex and Tia Yemi, and Unifer's younger brother, Adrian, who, because he already turned nine, likes to say he's a year older than Luca even though they're really only four months apart. Before Luca had to pee, he and Adrian had been kicking the ballon around with their other primos. The mothers had been sitting around the table at the patio, their iced palomas sweating on their napkins. The last time they were all together at Abuela's house, Unifer had accidentally walked in on Luca in the bathroom, and Luca was so mortified that today he made mommy come with him and stand guard outside the door. Abuela didn't like it, she told mommy she was coddling him, that a boy his age should be able to go to the bathroom by himself, but Luca is an only child, so he gets away with things other kids don't. In any case, Luca is alone in the bathroom now, and he tries not to think it but the thought swarms up unbidden, those irritable words mommy and Abuela exchanged were perhaps the very last ones between them, ever. Luca had approached the table wriggling, whispered into Mammy's ear, and Abuela, seeing this, had shaken her head, wagged an admonishing finger at them both past her remarks. She had a way of smiling when she criticized. But Mommy was always on Luca's side. She rolled her eyes and pushed her chair back from the table anyway, ignoring her mother's disapproval. When was that ten minutes ago? Two hours. Luca feels unmoored from the boundaries of time that have always existed. Outside the window he hears Mammy's tentative footsteps, the soft scuff of her shoe through the remnants of something broken. 
a solitary gasp, too windy to be called a sob. Then a quickening of sound as she crosses the patio with purpose, depresses the keys on her phone. When she speaks, her voice has a stretched quality that Luca has never heard before, high and tight in the back of her throat. Send help. Chapter 2. By the time Mommy returns to pull Luca from the shower, he's curled into a tight ball and rocking himself. She tells him to stand, but he shakes his head and rolls himself up even tighter, his body flapping with panicked reluctance. As long as he stays here in this shower with his face lowered into the dark angles of his elbows, as long as he doesn't look Mommy in the face, he can put off knowing what he already knows. He can prolong the moment of irrational hope that maybe some sliver of yesterday's world is still intact. It might be better for him to go and look, to see the brilliant splatters of color on Unifer's white dress, to see Adrian's eyes, open to the sky, to see Abuela's gray hair, matted with stuff that should never exist outside the neat encasement of a skull. It might be good, actually, for Luca to see the warm wreckage of his recent father, the spatula bent crooked beneath his fallen weight, his blood still leaching across the concrete patio. Because none of it, however horrific, is worse than the images Luca will conjure instead with the radiance of his own imagination. When at last she gets him to stand, Mommy takes Luca out the front door, which may or may not be the best idea. If Los Sicarios were to return, what would be worse, to be on the street in plain sight, or to be hidden inside where no one might witness their arrival? An impossible question. Nothing is better or worse than anything else now. They walk across Abuela's tidy courtyard and Mommy opens the gate. Together they sit on the yellow painted curb with their feet on the street. The far side is in shade, but it's bright here, and the sun is hot against Luca's forehead. After some brief swell of minutes, they hear sirens approaching. Mommy, whose name is Lydia, becomes aware that her teeth are chattering. She's not cold. Her armpits are damp, and she has goose bumps across the flesh of her arms. Luca leans forward and retches once. He brings up a glob of potato salad, stained pink with fruit punch. It splats onto the asphalt between his feet, but he and his mother don't move away from it. They don't even seem to notice. Nor do they note the furtive rearrangement of curtains and blinds in nearby windows as the neighbors prepare their credible deniability. What Luca does notice is the walls that line his abuela's street. He's seen them countless times before, but today he perceives a difference, each house here is fronted by a small courtyard like Abuela's, hidden from the street by a wall like Abuela's, topped with razor wire or chicken wire or spiked fence posts like Abuela's, and accessible only through a locked gate like Abuela's. Acapulco is a dangerous city. The people take precautions here, even in Nice neighborhoods like this one, especially in Nice neighborhoods like this one. But what good are those protections when the men come? Luca leans his head against his mother's shoulder, and she puts an arm around him. She doesn't ask if he's okay, because from now on that question will carry a weight of painful absurdity. Lydia tries her best not to consider the many words that will never come out of her mouth now, the sudden monster void of words she will never get to say. When they arrive, the police pull yellow Asina del Crimen tape across both ends of the block to discourage traffic and make room for the macabre motorcade of emergency vehicles. There are a lot of officers, a whole army of them, who move around and past Luca and Lydia with choreographed reverence. When the senior detective approaches and begins asking questions, Lydia hesitates for a moment, considering where to send Luca. He's too young to hear everything she needs to say. She should dispatch him to someone else for a few minutes, so she can give forthright answers to these dreadful questions. She should send him to his father. Her mother. Her sister, Yemi. But they are all dead in the backyard, their bodies as close as toppled dominoes. It's all meaningless anyway. The police aren't here to help. Lydia begins to sob. Luca stands and places the cold curve of his hand across the back of his mother's neck. Give her a minute, he says, like a grown man. When the detective returns, there's a woman with him, the medical examiner, who addresses Luca directly. She puts a hand on his shoulder and asks if he'd like to sit in her truck. It says SEMEFO on the side, and the back doors are standing open. Mommy nods at him, so Luca goes with the woman and sits inside, dangling his feet over the back bumper. She offers him a sweating can, a cold refresco. 
Lydia's brain, which had been temporarily suspended by shock, begins working again, but it creeps like sludge. She's still sitting on the curb, and the detective stands between her and her son. Did you see the shooter? He asks. Shooters, plural. I think there were three of them. She wishes the detective would step aside so she can keep Luca in her line of sight. He's only a dozen steps away. You saw them? No, we heard them. We were hiding in the shower. One came in and took a piss while we were in there. Maybe you can get fingerprints from the faucet. He washed his hands. Can you believe that? Lydia claps her hands loudly, as if to scare off the memory. There were at least two more voices outside. Did they say or do anything that might help identify them? She shakes her head. One ate the chicken. The detective writes Poyo in his notebook. One asked if he was here. A specific target. Did they say who he was? A name. They didn't have to. It was my husband. The detective stops writing and looks at her expectantly. Your husband is. Sebastian Perez Delgado. The reporter. Lydia nods, and the detective whistles through his teeth. He's here. She nods again. On the patio. With the spatula. With the sign. I'm sorry, senora. Your husband received many threats, yes. Yes, but not recently. And what exactly was the nature of those threats? They told him to stop writing about the cartels. Or. Or they would kill his whole family. Her voice is flat. The detective takes a deep breath and looks at Lydia with what might be interpreted as sympathy. When was the last time he was threatened? Lydia shakes her head. I don't know. A long time ago. This wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen. The detective folds his lips into a thin line and remains silent. They're going to kill me, too, she says, understanding only as these words emerge that they might be true. The detective does not move to contradict her. Unlike many of his colleagues, he's not sure which ones, but it doesn't matter, he happens not to be on the cartel payroll. He trusts no one. In fact, of the more than two dozen law enforcement and medical personnel moving around Abuela's home and patio this very moment, marking the locations of shell casings, examining footprints, analyzing blood splatter, taking pictures, checking for pulses, making the sign of the cross over the corpses of Lydia's family, seven receive regular money from the local cartel. The illicit payment is three times more than what they earn from the government. In fact, one has already texted El Jefe to report Lydia's and Luca's survival. The others do nothing, because that's precisely what the cartel pays them to do, to populate uniforms and perform the appearance of governance. Some of the personnel feel morally conflicted about this, others do not. None of them have a choice anyway, so their feelings are largely immaterial. The unsolved crime rate in Mexico is well north of 90%. The costumed existence of La Policia provides the necessary counterillusion to the fact of the cartel's actual impunity. Lydia knows this. Everyone knows this. She decides presently that she must get out of here. She stands up from her position on the curb and is surprised by the strength of her legs beneath her. The detective steps back to give her space. When he realizes I've survived they will return. And then the memory comes back to her like a throb, one of the voices in the yard asking, what about the kid? Lydia's joints feel like water. He's going to murder my son. He. The detective says. You know specifically who did this? Are you kidding me? She asks. There's only one possible perpetrator for a bloodbath of this magnitude in Acapulco, and everyone knows who that man is. Javier Crespo Fuentes. Her friend. Why should she say his name out loud? The detective's question is either a stage play or a test. He writes more words in his notebook. He writes, La Lechuza. He writes, Los Jardineros. And then shows the notebook to Lydia. I can't do this right now. She pushes past him. Please, just a few more questions. No. No more questions. Zero more questions. There are 16 bodies in the backyard, almost everyone Lydia loved in the world, but she still feels on the precipice of this information, she knows it to be factual because she heard them die, she saw their bodies. She touched her mother's still warm hand and felt the absence of her husband's pulse when she lifted his wrist. 
but her mind is still trying to rewind it, to undo it. Because it can't really be true. It's too horrific to be actually true. Panic feels imminent, but it doesn't descend. Luca, come. She reaches out her hand, and Luca hops down from the medical examiner's truck. He leaves the still full refresco on the back bumper. Lydia grabs him, and together they walk down the street to where Sebastian parked their car, near the end of the block. The detective follows, still trying to speak to her. He doesn't accept that she has quit the conversation. Was she not clear enough? She stops walking so abruptly he almost stumbles into her back. He draws up on his tiptoes to avoid a collision. She spins on her foot. I need his keys, she says. Keys. My husband's car keys. The detective continues speaking as Lydia pushes past him again, pulling Luca along behind her. She goes back through the gate into Abuela's courtyard and tells Luca to wait. Then she thinks better of it and brings him into the house. She sits him on Abuela's gold velveteen couch with instructions not to move. Can you stay with him, please? The detective nods. Lydia pauses momentarily at the back door, and then squares her shoulders before pushing it open and stepping out. In the shade of the backyard, there's the sweet odor of lime and sticky charred sauce, and Lydia knows she will never eat barbecue again. Some of her family members are covered now, and there are little bright yellow placards set up around the yard with black letters and numbers on them. The placards mark the locations of evidence that will never be used to seek a conviction. The placards make everything worse. Their presence means it's real. Lydia is aware of her lungs inside her body, they feel raw and raggedy, a sensation she's never experienced before. She steps toward Sebastian, who hasn't moved, his left arm still bent awkwardly beneath him, the spatula jutting out from beneath his hip. The way he's splayed there reminds Lydia of the shapes his body makes when he's at his most vividly animated, when he wrestles with Luca in the living room after dinner. They squeal. They roar. They bang into the furniture. Lydia runs soapy water into the kitchen sink and rolls her eyes at them. But all that heat is gone now. There's a ticking stillness beneath Sebastian's skin. She wants to talk to him before all his color is gone. She wants to tell him what happened, hurriedly, desperately. Some manic part of her believes that if she tells the story well enough, she can convince him not to be dead. She can convince him of her need for him, of the greatness of their son's need for him. There's a kind of paralyzed insanity in her throat. Someone has removed the cardboard sign the gunman left weighted to his chest with a simple rock. The sign in green marker said, Tota mi familia esta muerta por mi culpa, my whole family is dead because of me. Lydia crouches at her husband's feet but she doesn't want to feel the cooling of his pallid skin. Proof. She grabs the toe of one shoe, and closes her eyes. He's still mostly intact, and she feels grateful for that. She knows the cardboard sign could have been affixed to his heart with the blade of a machete. She knows that the relative neatness of his death is a sort of deformed kindness. She's seen other crime scenes, nightmarish scenes, bodies that are no longer bodies but only parts of bodies, mutilados. When the cartel murders, it does so to set an example, for exaggerated, grotesque illustration. One morning at work, as she opened her shop for the day, Lydia saw a boy she knew down the street kneeling to unlock the grate of his father's shoe store with a key dangling by a shoelace around his neck. He was 16 years old. When the car pulled up, the kid couldn't run because the key snagged in the lock, it caught him by the neck. So Los Sicarios lifted the grate and hung the kid by the shoelace, by the neck, and then pummeled him until all he could do was twitch. Lydia had rushed inside and locked the door behind her, so she didn't see when they pulled down his pants and added the decoration, but she heard about it later. They all did. And every shop owner in the neighborhood knew that that kid's father had refused to pay the cartel's mortidas. So yes, Lydia is grateful that 16 of her loved ones were killed by the quick, clinical dispatch of bullets. The officers in the yard avert their eyes from her, and she feels grateful for that too. The crime scene photographer sets his camera down on the table beside the drink that still bears a smudge of Lydia's truffle-colored lipstick on its rim. The ice cubes have melted inside, and there's a small puddle of condensation on the napkin around her glass. 
It's still wet, and that feels impossible to Lydia, that her life could be shattered so completely in less time than it takes for a ring of condensation to evaporate into the atmosphere. She's aware that a deferential hush has fallen over the patio. She moves to Sebastian's side without standing. She crawls on hands and knees, and then hesitates, staring at his one outstretched hand, the ridges and lines of his knuckles, the perfect half-moons of his nail beds. The fingers do not move. The wedding band is inert. His eyes are closed, and Lydia wonders, absurdly, if he closed them on purpose, for her, a final act of tenderness, so that when she found him, she wouldn't have to observe the vacancy there. She claps a hand over her mouth because she has a feeling the essential part of herself might fall out. She shoves the feeling down, tucks her fingers into the fold of that unresponsive hand, and allows herself to lean gently across his chest. He is cold already. He is cold. Sebastian is gone, and what's left is only the beloved, familiar shape of him, empty of breath. She places her hand on his jaw, his chin. She closes her mouth very tightly and places her palm against the coolness of his forehead. The first time she ever saw him, he was slouched over a spiral notebook in a library in Mexico City, pen in hand. The tilt of his shoulders, the fullness of his mouth. He was wearing a purple T-shirt, some band she didn't know. She understands now that it wasn't the body but the way he animated it that had thrilled her. The flagstones press into her knees while she covers him with prayers. Her tears are spasmodic. The bent spatula sits in a puddle of congealed blood, and the flat part still bears a smudge of uncooked meat. Lydia fights a roll of nausea, slips her hand into her husband's pocket, and retrieves his keys. How many times during their life together has she slipped her hand into his pocket? Don't think it, don't think it, don't think. It's difficult to remove his wedding ring. The loose skin of his knuckle scrunches up beneath the band so she has to twist it, she has to use one hand to straighten his finger and the other to twist the ring, and in this way, at last, she has his wedding band, the one she placed on his finger at the Catedral de Nuestra Señora de la Soledad more than ten years ago. She slips it onto her thumb, places both hands on the crate of his chest, and pushes herself to her feet. She lurches away, waiting for someone to challenge her for the items she took. She almost wants someone to say she can't have them, that she can't tamper with evidence or some horseshit like that. How satisfying it might be, momentarily, to have a direct receptacle for some lashing belt of her rage. No one dares. Lydia stands with her shoulders loose to the earth. Her mother. She moves toward Abuela, whose body is one of those now loosely covered with black plastic. An officer steps to intercept her. Senora, please, he says simply. Lydia looks at him wildly. I need a last moment with my mother. He shakes his head once, the slightest movement. His voice is soft. I assure you, he says, that is not your mother. Lydia blinks, unmoving, her husband's car keys gripped in the vice of her hand. He's right. She could spend more time in this landscape of carnage, but why? They are all gone. This is not what she wants to remember of them. She turns away from the sixteen horizontal shapes in the yard and, with a squeak and a bang, passes through the doorway into the kitchen. Outside, the officials resume their activities. Lydia opens the closet in her mother's bedroom and withdraws Abuela's solitary piece of luggage, a small red overnight bag. Lydia unzips it and finds that it's full of smaller purses. It's a bag of bags. She dumps them on the bed, opens her mother's nightstand, pulls a rosary and a small prayer book from the drawer, and puts them in the overnight bag along with Sebastian's keys. Then she stoops down and sticks her arm beneath her mother's mattress. She sweeps it back and forth until her fingertips brush a fold of paper. Lydia pulls the wad out, almost 15,000 pesos. She puts them in the bag. She throws the pile of small purses back in her mother's closet, takes the bag to the bathroom, opens the medicine cabinet, and grabs what she can, a hairbrush, a toothbrush, toothpaste, moisturizer, a tube of lip balm, a pair of tweezers. They all go into the bag. She does all this without thinking, without really considering which items might be helpful or useless. She does it because she can't think of what else to do. Lydia and her mother are the same shoe size, a small blessing. Lydia takes the only pair of comfortable shoes from her mother's closet, quilted gold lame sneakers with a zipper on one side that Abuela wore for gardening. 
In the kitchen, the raid continues, a sleeve of cookies, a tin of peanuts, two bags of chips, all surreptitiously stuffed into the bag. Her mother's purse hangs on a hook behind the kitchen door, alongside two other hooks that hold Abuela's apron and her favorite teal sweater. Lydia takes the purse down and looks inside. It feels like opening her mother's mouth. It's too personal in there. Lydia takes the whole thing, folds the softened brown leather into the end pocket of the overnight bag, and zips it in. The detective is sitting beside Luca on the couch when Lydia returns, but he's not asking questions. His pad and pencil are resigned on the coffee table. We have to go, she says. Luca stands without waiting to be told. The detective stands, too. I must caution you against returning home right now, senora, he says. It may not be safe. If you wait here, perhaps one of my men can drive you. We might find a secure location for you and your son. Lydia smiles, and there's a brief astonishment that her face can still make those shapes. A small puff of laughter. I like our chances better without your assistance. The detective frowns at her but nods. You have somewhere safe to go. Please don't concern yourself with our well-being, she says. Serve justice. Worry about that. She's aware that the words are leaving her mouth like tiny, unpoisoned darts, as futile as they are angry. She makes no effort to censor herself. The detective stands with his hands in his pockets and frowns toward the floor. I'm so sorry for your loss. Truly. I know how it must look, every murder going unsolved, but there are people who still care, who are horrified by this violence. Please know I will try. He, too, understands the uselessness of his words, but he feels compelled to tender them nonetheless. He reaches into his breast pocket and pulls out a card with his name and phone number on it. We will need an official statement when you're feeling up to it. Take a few days if you need. He proffers the card, but Lydia makes no move to take it, so Luca reaches up and grabs it. He's maneuvered himself in close beside his mother, laced one arm behind her through the strap of the red overnight bag. This time, the detective doesn't follow them. Their shadows move as one lumpy beast along the sidewalk. Beneath the windshield wiper of their car, an instantly recognizable orange 1974 Volkswagen Beetle, there is a tiny slip of paper, so small that it doesn't even flit in the hot breeze that gusts up the street. Carajo, Lydia curses, automatically pushing Luca behind her. What, mommy? Stay here. No, go stand over there. She points back in the direction from which they came, and for once, Luca doesn't argue. He scuttles up the street, a dozen paces or more. Lydia drops the overnight bag at her feet on the sidewalk, takes a step back from the car, looks up and down the street. Her heart doesn't race, it feels leaden within her. Her husband's parking permit is glued to the windshield, and there's a smattering of rust across the back bumper. She steps into the street, leans over to see if she can read the paper without lifting it. A news van is parked just beyond the yellow crime scene tape at the far end of the block but its reporter and cameraman are busy with preparations and haven't noticed them. She turns her back and tugs the slip of paper free from the wiper. One word in green marker, boo. Her quick intake of breath feels like a slice through the core of her body. She looks back at Luca, crumbles the paper in her fist, and jams it into her pocket. They have to disappear. They have to get away from Acapulco, so far away that Javier Crespo Fuentes will never be able to find them. They cannot drive the car. Chapter 3 Lydia circles the orange beetle twice, glancing through the windows, inspecting the tires, the gas tank, what she can see of the undercarriage by stooping down without touching anything. Nothing appears different from how they left it, not that she was paying much attention. She stands back and crosses her arms over her chest. She won't dare to drive it but she must at least open it to retrieve some of their belongings from inside. That need feels urgent, but her mind cannot reach beyond the immediate present, so she doesn't get as far as the word keepsakes. She peers through the window and sees Sebastian's backpack on the passenger side floor, her own sunglasses glinting on the dashboard, Luca's yellow and blue sweatshirt sprawled on the backseat. It's too dangerous to go home now, to the place where they all live together. She needs to be quick, to get Luca out of here. 
For a brief moment, Lydia considers that if there's a bomb in the car, it might be kinder to take Luca with her, to call him over here now before she opens the door, but her maternal instinct defeats this macabre idea. So she approaches with the key shaking in her hand, using the other hand to steady it. She looks at Luca, who gives her a thumbs up. There won't be a bomb, she tells herself. A bomb would be overkill after all those bullets. She pushes the key into the lock. One deep breath. 2. She turns the key. Thunk. The sound of the door unlocking is almost enough to finish her. But then silence. No ticking, no beeping, no whoosh of murderous air. She closes her eyes, pivots, returns Luca's thumbs up. She swings the creaky door open and begins rummaging inside. What does she need? She stops short, her confusion momentarily paralyzing. This cannot be real, she thinks. Her mind feels stretched and warped. Lydia remembers her mother walking in circles for weeks after her poppy died, from sink to fridge, sink to fridge. She'd stand with her hand on the tap and forget to turn it on. Lydia can't do a suspended loop like that there is danger. They have to move. Sebastian's backpack is here. She must pick it up. She needs to accomplish the tasks immediately before her. There will be time later to begin the work of comprehending how this could have happened, why it happened. She opens her husband's backpack, takes out a sloshing thermos, his glasses, the keys to his office, his headphones, three small notebooks and a fistful of cheap pens, a handheld tape recorder, and his press credentials, and places everything on the passenger seat. Her husband's Samsung Galaxy Tab and charger she keeps, though she powers the tablet all the way down before returning it into the now empty backpack. She doesn't understand how GPS works in these devices, but she doesn't want to be trackable. She retrieves her sunglasses from the dashboard and shoves them onto her face, almost stabbing herself in the eye with one outstretched stem. She pushes the seat forward to see what's in back. Luca's church shoes are on the floor, where he left them when he changed into his sneakers to play football with Adrian. Oh my god, Adrian, Lydia thinks, and the cleft feeling in her chest opens deeper, as if there's an axe hacked into her sternum. She squeezes her eyes closed for just a moment and forces a cycle of breath through her body. She lifts Luca's shoes and places them into the backpack. Sebastian's red New York Yankees hat is on the backseat, too. She grabs it, climbs out of the car, and tosses it to Luca, who puts it on. In the trunk, she finds Sebastian's good brown cardigan, which she shoves into the bag. There's also a basketball, which she leaves, and a dirty t-shirt, which she keeps. She slams the trunk, walks back to the front seat to select one of his notebooks, not yet allowing herself to consider the reason she does this, to retain a personal record of his extinct handwriting. She chooses one at random, places it in the backpack, and then locks the doors behind her. Luca comes to stand beside her before she beckons him. My son is fundamentally altered, she thinks. The way he watches her and interprets her wishes without command. Where will we go, mommy? Lydia gives him a sideways glance. Eight years old. She must reach past this obliteration and find the strength to salvage what she can. She kisses the top of his head and they begin to walk, away from the reporters, away from the orange car, Abuela's house, their annihilated life. I don't know, Miho, she says. We'll see. We'll have an adventure. Like in the movies. Yes, Miho. Just like in the movies. She slings the backpack onto both shoulders and tightens the straps before hoisting the overnight bag too. They walk several blocks north, then hang a left toward the beach, then turn south again, because Lydia can't decide if they should be somewhere crowded with tourists or if they should try to stay out of sight altogether. She frequently looks over her shoulder, studies the drivers of the passing cars, tightens her grip on Luca's hand. At an open gate, a mutt barks at them, lunging and nipping. A woman in a drab floral dress comes out of the house to correct the dog, but before she can get there, Lydia kicks it savagely and feels no guilt for having done so. The woman yells after her but Lydia keeps moving, holding Luca by the hand. Luca adjusts the brim of his father's too big Yankees hat. Poppy's sweat is seeped into the hatband, so little currents of his scent puff out whenever Luca pulls it to one side or the other, which Luca does now at regular intervals so he can smell his father. Then he has the idea that perhaps the scent is finite, and he fears he might use it all up, so he stops touching it. 
At length, they spot a bus and decide to get on. It's mid-afternoon on a Saturday, and the bus isn't crowded. Luca feels glad to sit, until he realizes that the movement of his legs beneath him carrying the weight of his small frame through the streets of his city, had been the thing staving off the crush of horror that now threatens to descend. As soon as he's seated beside Mommy on the blue plastic seat, his tired legs dangling down, he begins to think. He begins to shake. Mommy puts her arm around him and squeezes tight. You cannot cry here, Majito, Mommy says. Not yet. Luca nods, and just like that, he stops trembling and the risk of tears evaporates. He leans his head against the warm glass of the bus window and looks out. He focuses on the cartoon colors of his city, the green of the palm fronds, the trunks of the trees painted white to discourage beetles, the vivid blare of signs advertising shops and hotels and shoes. At El Rolo, Luca looks at the children and teenagers in line for the ticket window. They wear flip-flops and have towels around their necks. Behind them, the red and yellow water slides swoop and soar. Luca puts one finger against the glass and squashes the children in line one by one. The bus squeaks its brakes at the curb, and three damp-haired teenage boys get on. They pass Luca and Lydia without a glance and sit in the back of the bus, elbows planted on knees, talking quietly across the aisle. Poppy's going to take me in the summertime, Luca says. What? To El Rolo. He said this summer we could go. He would take a day off work one time when I'm not in school. Lydia sucks in her cheeks and bites down. A disloyal reflex, she's angry at her husband. The driver closes the door and the bus moves off with the traffic. Lydia unzips the overnight bag at her feet, kicks off her heels, and replaces them with her mother's quilted gold sneakers. She doesn't have a plan, which is unlike her, and she finds it difficult to form one because her mind feels unfamiliar, both frenetic and swampy. She does have the wherewithal to remember that every 15 or 20 minutes, they should get off and change buses which they do. Sometimes they change direction, sometimes they don't. One bus stops directly in front of a church, so they go briefly inside, but the part of Lydia that's usually available for prayer has shut down. She's experienced this numbness a few times before in her life, when she was 17 and her father died of cancer, when she had a late-stage miscarriage two years after Luca, when the doctors told her she could never have more children, so she doesn't think of it as a crisis of faith. Instead she believes it's a divine kindness. Like a government furlough, God has deferred her non-essential agencies. Outside, Luca vomits on the pavement once more while they wait for the next bus. Around her neck, Lydia wears a thin gold chain adorned only with three interlocking loops. It's a discreet piece of jewelry, and the only one she wears apart from the filigree gold band around the fourth finger of her left hand. Sebastian gave her the necklace the first Christmas after Luca was born, and she loved it immediately, the symbolism of it. She's worn it every day since, and it's become so much a part of her that she's woven her mannerisms into it. When she's bored, she runs the delicate chain back and forth along the pad of her thumb. When she's nervous, she has a habit of looping the three interlocking circles together onto the tip of her pinky nail, where they make a faint tinkling sound. She doesn't touch those golden hoops now. Her hand moves absently toward her neck, but already she's aware of the gesture. Already she's training herself to disguise old habits. She must become entirely unrecognizable if she hopes to survive. She opens the clasp at the back of her neck and slips Sebastian's wedding ring from her thumb onto the chain. Then she refastens the clasp around her neck and drops the whole thing inside the collar of her blouse. They must avoid drawing the attention of the bus drivers, who've been known to act as Halconas, lookouts for the cartel. Lydia understands that her appearance is a moderately attractive but not beautiful woman of indeterminate age, traveling the city with an unremarkable-looking boy, can provide a kind of natural camouflage if she takes care to promote the impression that they're simply out for a day's shopping or a visit to friends across the city. Indeed, Luca and Lydia could easily change places with many of their fellow passengers, which Lydia thinks of as truly absurd, that the people around them cannot see plainly what abomination they've just endured. It feels as evident to Lydia as if she were carrying a flashing neon sign. She fights at every moment against the scream that pulses inside her like a living thing. It stretches and kicks in her gut like Luca did when he was a baby in there. 
With tremendous self-control, she strangles and suppresses it. When a plan finally does begin to emerge from the violent fog of chaos in her mind, Lydia feels uncertain whether it's a good one, but she commits herself to it because she has no other. At a quarter to four o'clock, just before closing time in Playa Calatilla, Lydia and Luca disembark from the bus, go into an unfamiliar branch of their bank, and wait in line. Lydia turns on her cell phone to check her balance, and then powers it all the way off again before filling out a withdrawal slip for almost the full amount, 219,803 pesos, or about $12,500, almost all of it an inheritance from Sebastian's godfather, who'd owned a bottling company, and who'd never had children of his own. She asks for the money in large bills. A few minutes later, Luca and Lydia are back and the bus, their life savings in cash stuffed into three envelopes at the bottom of Abuela's overnight bag. Three buses and more than an hour later, they get out at the Walmart in Diamante. They buy a backpack for Luca, two packets of underwear, two pairs of jeans, two packets of three plain white t-shirts, socks, two hooded sweatshirts, two warm jackets, two more toothbrushes, disposable wipes, band-aids, sunscreen, Blistex, a first aid kit, two canteens, two flashlights, some batteries, and a map of Mexico. Lydia takes a long time selecting a machete at the counter in the home goods department, eventually choosing a small one with a retractable blade and a tidy black holster she can strap to her leg. It's not a gun, but it's better than nothing. They pay in cash, and then walk beneath the highway overpass toward the beach hotels, Luca wearing Poppy's baseball cap and Lydia not touching her gold necklace. She watches everyone as they walk, other pedestrians, drivers in passing cars, even skinny boys on their skateboards, because she knows Halconas are everywhere. They hurry on. Lydia chooses the Hotel de Kessa Imperial because of its size. It's big enough to provide a measure of anonymity, but not new enough to attract much in the way of trendy social attention. She requests a room facing the street and pays, again, in cash. And now I just need a credit card on file for incidentals, the desk clerk says as he tucks two card keys into a paper sleeve. Lydia looks at the keys and considers snatching them, bolting for the elevator. Then she opens the overnight bag and pretends to rummage for her credit card. Shoot, I must have left it in the car, she says. How much is the hold? 4,000 pesos. He gives her a clinical smile. Fully refundable, of course. Of course, Lydia says. She props the overnight bag up on her knee and flips open one of the envelopes. She withdraws the 4,000 pesos without taking the envelope out of the bag. Cash is okay. Oh. The clerk looks mildly alarmed and darts his eyes toward his manager, who's busy with another customer. Cash is fine, the manager says without looking up from his task. The clerk nods at Lydia, who presses the four pink bills into his hand. He puts them into an envelope and seals it. And your name, please. His black pen hovers over the front of the envelope. Lydia hesitates for a moment. Fermina Daza, she says, the first name that comes to mind. He hands her the room key. Enjoy your stay, Ms. Daza. The ride in the elevator to the tenth floor feels like the longest minute and a half of Luca's life. His feet hurt, his back hurts, his neck hurts, and he still hasn't cried. A family gets on at the fourth floor and then realizes the elevator is going up, so they get off again. The parents are laughing with each other, holding hands while their kids bicker. The boy looks at Luca and sticks his tongue out as the elevator doors close. Luca knows by instinct and by Mammy's subtle cues that he must behave as if everything's normal, and he's managed that behemoth task so far. But there's an elegant older woman in the elevator, too, and she's admiring Mammy's quilted gold shoes. Abuela's shoes. Luca blinks rapidly. How beautiful, your shoes, so unusual, the woman says, touching Lydia lightly on the arm. Where did you buy them? Lydia looks down at her feet instead of turning to engage with the woman. Oh, I don't remember, she says. They're so old. And then she stabs the 10 button repeatedly with her finger, which doesn't speed up the elevator but does have the intended effect of silencing any further attempts at conversation. The woman gets off on the 6th floor, and after she does so, mommy hits numbers 14, 18, and 19 as well. They get off at 10 and walk 3 flights down to the 7th floor. 
A surprising thing happens to Luca after Mommy finally opens the door of their hotel room with her card key, after she looks both ways up and down the carpeted corridor and ushers him quickly inside, after she dead bolts and chain locks the door, dragging the desk chair across the tiled floor and wedging it beneath the doorknob. The surprising thing that happens to him is, nothing. The cloudburst of anguish he's been struggling against does not come. Neither does it go. It remains there, pent up like a held breath, hovering just on the periphery of his mind. He has the sense that, were he to turn his head, were he to poke at the globular nightmare ever so gently with his finger, it would unleash a torrent so colossal he would be swept away forever. Luca takes care to hold himself quite still. Then he kicks off his shoes and climbs up on the edge of the lone bed. A towel has been placed there, folded into the shape of a swan, which Luca takes by the long neck and thrashes to the floor. He clutches the remote control like it's a life preserver and clicks the television on. Mommy moves their Walmart bags, backpacks, and Abuela's overnight bag to the small table, and dumps everything out. She begins removing tags, organizing items into piles, and then quite suddenly she sits down hard in one of the chairs and doesn't move for at least ten minutes. Luca doesn't look at her. He glues his eyes to Nickelodeon, turns Henry Danger up loud. When at last she begins to move again, Mommy comes to him and kisses his forehead roughly. She crosses the room and slides open the door to the balcony. She doubts there's any amount of fresh air that could succeed in clearing her head, but she has to try. She leaves it open and steps outside. If there's one good thing about terror, Lydia now understands, it's that it's more immediate than grief. She knows that she will soon have to contend with what's happened, but for now, the possibility of what might still happen serves to anesthetize her from the worst of the anguish. She peers over the edge of the balcony and surveys the street below. She tells herself there's no one out there. She tells herself they're safe. Downstairs in the lobby, the front desk clerk excuses himself from his post and heads for the employee break room. In the second stall of the bathroom, he removes the burner phone from his interior suit jacket pocket and sends the following text, two special guests just checked into the Hotel de Kessa Imperial. Chapter 4. On the occasion of their first encounter, Javier Crespo Fuentes arrived alone at Lydia's shop on a Tuesday morning just as she was setting her chalkboard on the sidewalk outside. That week, she'd selected ten books from faraway places to promote with a hand chalk sign that read books, cheaper than airline tickets. She was holding the door open with one leg as she lifted the sign through, and then he appeared, approaching quickly to help with the door. The bell above them jangled like a pronouncement. Thank you, Lydia said. He nodded. But far more dangerous. She frowned and propped open the easel. I'm sorry. The sign. He gestured, and she stood back to assess her lettering. Books are cheaper than traveling, but they're also more dangerous. Lydia smiled. Well, I suppose that depends on where you travel. They went inside, and she left him to his own counsel while he browsed the stacks, but when at last he approached the counter and set his books beside the register, she was startled by his selections. Lydia had owned this store for almost ten years, and she'd stocked it with both books she loved and books she wasn't crazy about but knew would sell. She also kept a healthy inventory of note cards, pens, calendars, toys, games, reading glasses, magnets, and keychains, and it was that kind of merchandise, along with the splashy best sellers, that made her shop profitable. So it had long been a secret pleasure of Lydia's that, hidden among all the more popular goods, she was able to make a home for some of her best-loved secret treasures, gems that had blown open her mind and changed her life, books that in some cases had never even been translated into Spanish but that she stocked anyway, not because she expected she'd ever sell them, but simply because it made her happy to know they were there. There were perhaps a dozen of these books, stashed away on their ever-changing shelves, enduring among a cast of evolving neighbors. Now and again when a book moved her, when a book opened a previously undiscovered window in her mind and forever altered her perception of the world, she would add it to those secret ranks. Once in a great while, she'd even try to recommend one of those books to a customer. She did this only when the customer was someone she knew and liked, someone she trusted to appreciate the value of the treasure being offered, she was almost always disappointed. In the ten years she'd been doing this, only twice had Lydia experienced the pleasure of a customer approaching her counter with one of those books in hand, unsolicited. 
Twice in ten years there'd been a wild spark of wonder in the shop, when the bell above the door was like mistletoe, a possibility of something magical. So when Javier approached Lydia as she stood behind the register perusing catalogs, when she lifted his selections from the counter to ring them up, she was astonished to find not one, but two of her secret treasures among them, Heart, You Bully, You Punk by Leah Hager Cohen and the whereabouts of Aeneas McNulty by Sebastian Barry. Oh my God, Lydia whispered. Is something wrong? She looked up at him, realizing she hadn't actually looked at him yet despite their cheerful banter earlier. He was fancily dressed for a Tuesday morning, in dark blue trousers and a white guyabara, an outfit more suitable for Sunday mass than a regular workday, and his thick black hair was parted sharply and combed to one side in an old-fashioned style. The heavy, black plastic frames of his glasses were similarly outdated, so retro they were almost chic again. His eyes swam hugely behind the thick lenses and his mustache quivered as she considered him. These books, she said. They're two of my favorites. It was an insufficient explanation, but all she could muster. Mine, too, the man across from her said. The mustache hitched ever so slightly with his hesitant smile. You've read them before. She was holding heart, you bully, you punk with both hands. Well, only this one. He gestured to the one she was clutching. She looked down at its cover. You read in English. She asked, in English. I try, yes, he said. My English isn't fluent, but it's close. And this story is so delicate. I'm sure there were things I missed the first time around. I wanted to try again. Yes. She smiled at him, feeling slightly crazy. She ignored this feeling and plowed recklessly ahead. When you're finished you could come back, we could discuss it. Oh. He nodded eagerly. You have a book club here. Her mouth opened slightly. No. She laughed. Just me. All the better. He smiled and Lydia frowned, eager to preserve the sanctity of this moment. Was he flirting? Whenever a man's behavior was inscrutable, the answer was typically yes. She placed the book on the counter and her palm flat against its cover. He read the caution in her gesture and endeavored to correct himself. I only meant because sometimes the experience of reading can be corrupted by too many opinions. He looked at the book beneath her hand. A remarkable book. Remarkable. She conceded a smile, lifting her scanner from its cradle and pointing it toward the book. When he returned the following Monday, he went directly to the counter, even though Lydia was busy with another customer. He waited to one side, hands clasped in front of him, and when the customer left, they smiled broadly at each other. Well, she said. Even more incredible the second time. Yes. Lydia clapped her hands. One of the book's main characters had a condition where she couldn't prevent herself from jumping off high things. She didn't want to die, but she was constantly hurting herself because of this dangerous impulse. I have this same condition, Javier confessed suddenly. What? No. The condition was fictional. And yet, Lydia had it too. Anytime she stood too close to the balcony railing at home, she had to dig her fingers in. She had to press her heels to the floor. She was afraid that one day she would leap over without thinking, without purpose. She would splatter on the pavement below and the Acapulco traffic would screech and blare, swerving needlessly around her. The ambulance would be too late. Luca would be orphaned, and everyone would misinterpret the act as suicide. Lydia had run the scenario through her brain a thousand times as an attempted antidote. I must not jump. I thought I was the only one in the world, Javier confessed. I thought it was a crazy fabrication of my mind. And then there it was, in the book. Lydia didn't realize her mouth was hanging open until she closed it. She sat back onto her stool with a bump. But I thought I was the only one, she said. Javier straightened his body away from the counter. You also. Lydia nodded. Well, my God, he said in English. And then he laughed. We will start a support group. And then he stood there talking with her for so long that she eventually offered him a cup of coffee, which he accepted. She pulled a stool around to the far side of the counter so he could drink it in comfort. He was careful not to get foam on his mustache.
They talked about literature and poetry and economics and politics and the music they both adored, and he stayed for nearly two hours, until she began to worry that he'd be missed somewhere, but he waved his hand dismissively. There is nothing out there more important than this. It was just as Lydia had always hoped life in her bookstore would be one day. In between the workaday drudgery of running a business, that she might entertain customers who were as lively and engaging as the books around them. If I had three more customers like you, I'd be set for life, she said, taking her last sip of coffee. He placed a hand across his chest and bowed slightly. I shall try to be enough. And then he said casually, softly, if I had met you in a different life, I would ask you to marry me. Lydia stood abruptly from her stool and shook her head. I'm sorry, Javier said. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. She gathered the cups in silence. The treachery wasn't in receiving his confession. The treachery was in her unspoken response, in a different life, she might have said yes. I should get back to work, she said instead. I have to place an order this afternoon. I have to prepare some parcels for the mail. He took seven new books with him that day, three of which were Lydia's recommendations. On the following Friday morning a summer shower washed down the street, and two large, worrisome men crowded themselves in beneath the awning that hung above Lydia's bookshop door. Moments later, Javier appeared, and Lydia felt a strong measure of happiness. There would be new books to discuss. She tried to behave naturally, but as she watched those men in the doorway, her breath constricted in her chest. They make you nervous, Javier observed. I just don't know what they want. Lydia paced from her usual position, emerging from behind the register. She, like all the other shop owners on this street, already paid the monthly mortidas imposed by the cartel. She couldn't afford to pay more. I will send them off, Javier said. Lydia protested, grabbing his arm, growing louder even as Javier's voice dropped to a comforting hush. He stepped around her when she tried to block his path. They will hurt you, she whispered as severely as she could without raising alarm. He smiled at her in a way that made his mustache twitch and assured her, they will not. Lydia ducked behind the counter, lowering her head as Javier opened the door and stepped outside. She watched in astonishment as he spoke to the two bulky thugs beneath her awning. Both men gestured to the rain, but Javier pointed a finger, made a shooing gesture with his hand, and the men trotted off into the downpour. Lydia was reluctant to understand. Even as his visits continued and lengthened, as their conversations deepened into more personal matters, as she caught fleeting glimpses of the men on two other occasions, Lydia willfully forgot the power Javier had wielded on that rainy morning. When eventually he spoke adoringly about his wife, whom he called La Reina de Mi Corazon, the queen of my heart, Lydia felt her defenses relax. Those shields dropped further still when he revealed the existence of a young mistress, whom he called Lorena de Mis Pantalonas, the queen of my pants. Disgusting, she said, but she surprised herself by laughing, too. It was hardly unusual for a man to have an affair, but talking so openly about it with another woman was something else. For that reason, the confession served both to cure Lydia of any flattered wisp of attachment and, as Javier revealed more and more of his secret self, to turn the key in the intimate lock of their friendship. They became confidants, sharing jokes and observations and disappointments. They even spoke at times about the irritating things their spouses did. If you were married to me, I would never behave that way, Javier said when she complained about Sebastián leaving his dirty socks on the kitchen counter. Of course not. She laughed. You'd be an ideal husband. I'd wash every sock in the house. Sure. I'd burn all the socks and buy new ones each week. Imhem. I'd forego socks altogether, if it would make you happy. Lydia laughed in spite of herself. She'd learned to roll her eyes at these proclamations because, in the weather of their friendship, his flirtation was only a passing cloud. There were far more important storms between them. They discovered, for example, that both of their fathers had died young from cancer, a fact that would have bonded them all by itself. They both had good dads, and then lost them. It's like being a member of the shittiest club in the world, Javier said to her. For Lydia, it had been nearly 15 years, and though her sorrow was now irregular, when she did stumble into it, her grief was still as acute as the day her father had died. 
I know, Javier said, even though she didn't say these things out loud. So she endured his intense flattery, and he, in turn, accepted, perhaps even relished, her wholesale rejection of his flirtation. She came to think of it as part of his charm. But, Lydia, he told her reverently, placing both hands on his heart, my other loves notwithstanding, you truly are Lorena de M. I. Alma. The queen of my soul. And what would your poor wife say about that? She countered. My magnificent wife only wants me to be happy. She's a saint. He spoke frequently of his only child, a 16-year-old daughter who was at boarding school in Barcelona. Everything about him changed when he talked about her, his voice, his face, his manner. His love for her was so earnest that he handled even the subject of her with tremendous care. Her name was like a fine glass bauble he was afraid of dropping. I joke about my many loves, but in truth there is only one. He smiled at Lydia. Marta. S M I C L O M I Luna, Y Todos Mis Estrellas. Single quote. I am a mother. Lydia nodded. I know this love. He sat across from her on the stool she'd come to think of as his. That love is so vast I sometimes fear it, he said. I can never hope to earn it so I fear it will disappear, it will consume me. And at the same time, it's the only good thing I've ever done in my life. Oh, Javier, that can't be true, Lydia said. The subject made him morose. He shook his head, rubbed his eyes roughly beneath the glasses. It's just that my life hasn't turned out as I intended, he said. You know how it is. But she didn't. After weeks of learning about each other, this was where their common language faltered. With the exception of having only one child, Lydia's life had turned out precisely as she'd always wished it might. She'd given up hoping for the daughter she could no longer have, she'd accepted that absence because she'd worked at it. She was content with her choices, more than content. Lydia was happy. But Javier looked at her through the warp of his lenses, and she could see the yearning on his face, to be understood. She pressed her lips together. Tell me, she said. He removed the glasses and folded the stems. He placed them in his breast pocket and blinked, his eyes small and raw without their accustomed shield. I thought I would be a poet. He laughed. Ridiculous bright. In this day and age. She put her hand on top of his. I thought I would be a scholar. A quiet life. I'd do quite well with poverty, I think. She twisted her mouth, touching the elegant watch on his wrist. I'm dubious. He shrugged. I guess I do like shoes. And steak, she reminded him. He laughed. Yes, steak. Who doesn't like steak? Your book habit alone would bankrupt most people. Dios mio, you're right, Lydia. I'd be a terrible pauper. The worst, she agreed. After a beat she said, it's never too late, Javier. If you're truly unhappy. You're still a young man. I'm 51. Younger than she thought even. Practically a baby. And what have you got to be so unhappy about anyway? He looked down at the counter and Lydia was surprised to see genuine torment cross his features. She lowered her voice and leaned in. Then you could choose a different path, Javier. You can. You're such a gifted person, such a capable person. What's stopping you? Ah. He shook his head, replacing his glasses. She watched him pushing his face back into its customary shapes. It's all a romantic dream now. It's over. I made my choices long ago, and this is where they've led me. She squeezed his hand. It's not so bad, right? It was something she'd say to Luca, to shepherd him toward optimism. Javier blinked slowly, tipped his head to one side. An ambiguous gesture. It will have to do. She straightened up behind the counter and took a sip of her lukewarm coffee. Your choices yielded Marta. His eyes shined. Yes, Marta, he said. And you. The next time he came, he brought a box of conchas and sat in his usual place. There were several customers in the shop, so he opened the box and placed two of the sweet treats on napkins while Lydia walked the aisles helping people with their requests. When they approached the counter to pay for their goods, Javier greeted them as if he worked there. He offered them conchas. When at last Lydia and Javier were alone, he withdrew a small moleskin notebook from the interior pocket of his jacket and set it on the counter as well. What's this? Lydia asked. 
Javier swallowed nervously. My poetry. Lydia's eyes grew wide with delight. I've never shared it with anyone except Marta, he said. She's studying poetry in school. And French and mathematics. She's much more gifted than her old papa. Oh, Javier. He touched the corner of the book nervously. I've been writing poems all my life. Since I was a child. I thought you might like to hear one. Lydia pulled her stool closer to the counter and leaned toward him, her chin resting on her propped and folded hands. Between them, the conchas stained their napkins with grease. Javier opened the book, its pages soft from wear. He leafed carefully through them until he came to the page he had in mind. He cleared his throat before he began. Oh, the poem was terrible. It was both grave and frivolous, so bad that it made Lydia love him much, much more, because of how vulnerable he was in sharing it with her. When he finished reading and looked up for her reaction, his face was a twist of worry. But her eyes were bright and reassuring, and she genuinely meant the words she gave him in that moment. How beautiful. How very beautiful. The maturing friendship with Javier was surprising in its swiftness and intensity. The flirtation had mostly ceased, and in its place, she discovered an intimacy she'd seldom experienced outside of family. There was no feeling of romance on Lydia's end, but their bond was refreshing. Javier reminded her, in the middle of her mothering years, that life was exciting, that there was always the possibility of something, or someone, previously undiscovered. On her birthday, a day Lydia did not recall revealing to him, Javier arrived with a silver parcel the size of a book. The ribbon said, Jacques Genin. The principal chocolatier in Paris, Javier explained. Lydia demurred, but not convincingly. She loved chocolate. And she accidentally ate every last one of the tiny masterpieces before Sebastian and Luca arrived at her shop that evening to take her out for her birthday dinner. Because of an eruption of violence between rival cartels in Acapulco, Lydia and her family, indeed most families in the city, no longer frequented their favorite neighborhood cafes. The challenger to the establishment was a new cartel that called itself Los Jardineros, a name that failed, initially, to evoke the appropriate fear in the populace. That problem had been transitory. Shortly after their formation, everyone in the city knew that the gardeners used guns only when they didn't have time to indulge their creativity. Their preferred tools were more intimate, spade, axe, sickle, hook, machete. The simple instruments of hacking and trenching. With these, Los Jardineros moved the earth, with these, they unseated and buried their rivals. A few of the dethroned survivors managed to join the ranks of their conquerors, most fled the city. The result was a recent decrease in bloodshed as the emergent winner flung a shroud of uneasy calm across the shoulders of Acapulco. Nearly four months of relative quiet followed, and the citizens of Acapulco cautiously returned to the streets, to the restaurants and shops. They were eager to repair the damage to their economy. They were ready for a cocktail. So, in the safest district, where tourist money had always encouraged some restraint, in a restaurant selected more for its security than for its menu, and surrounded by the shining faces of her family, Lydia blew out the candle on her 32nd birthday cake. Later that night, after Luca went to bed, and Sebastian opened a bottle of wine on the couch, their conversation turned inevitably to the condition of life in Acapulco. Lydia stood at the open counter, leaning across it with a glass of wine at her elbow. It was nice to be able to go out to dinner tonight, she said. It felt almost normal, right? Sebastian was in the living room, his legs propped on the coffee table, crossed at the ankles. There were a lot of people out. It was the first time they'd taken Luca out for a meal since last summer. Next we have to get the tourists back, Sebastian said. Lydia took a deep breath. Tourism had always been the lifeblood of Acapulco, and the violence had scared most of those tourists away. She didn't know how long she'd be able to keep the shop afloat if they didn't return. It was tempting to hope the recent peace signaled a sea change. Do you think things might really get better now? She asked because Sebastian's knowledge of the cartels was exhausted which both impressed and discomfited her. He knew things. Most people were like Lydia, they didn't want to know. They tried to insulate themselves from the ugliness of the narco-violence because they couldn't handle it. But Sebastian was ravenous for it. 
A free press was the last line of defense, he said, the only thing left standing between the people of Mexico and complete annihilation. It was his vocation, and when they were young, she'd admired that idealism. She'd imagined that any child of Sebastian's would come out of her womb honorably, with a fully formed, unimpeachable morality. She wouldn't even have to teach their babies right from wrong. But now the cartels murdered a Mexican journalist every few weeks, and Lydia recoiled from her husband's integrity. It felt sanctimonious, selfish. She wanted Sebastian alive more than she wanted his strong principles. She wished he would quit, do something simpler, safer. She tried to be supportive, but sometimes it made her so angry that he chose this danger. When that anger flared up and intruded, they moved around it like a piece of furniture too big for the room it occupied. It's already better, Sebastian said thoughtfully, from behind his wine glass. I mean, it's quieter, Lydia said. But is it really better? That depends on your criteria, I guess. He looked up at her. If you like to go out to dinner, then yes, things are better. Lydia frowned. She really did like to go out to dinner. Was she that superficial? The new jefe is smart, Sebastian said. He knows stability is the key, and he wants peace. So we'll see, maybe things will get better under Los Jardineros than they were before. Better how? You think he can fix the economy? Bring back tourism? I don't know, maybe. Sebastian shrugged. If he can really staunch the violence long term. For now, at least it's limited to other narcos. They're not running around murdering innocents for fun. What about that kid on the beach last week? Collateral damage. Lydia cringed and took a gulp of wine. Her husband wasn't a callous man. She hated when he talked like this. Sebastian saw her flinch and stood up to reach across the counter. He squeezed her hands. I know it's awful, he said. But that kid on the beach was an accident. He was caught in the crossfire, that's all I meant. They weren't gunning for him. He tugged lightly on her hand. Come sit with me. Lydia rounded the counter and joined him on the couch. I know you don't like to think of it like this, but at the end of the day, these guys are businessmen, and this one is smarter than most. He put his arm around her. He's not your typical narco. In a different life, he could have been Bill Gates or something. An entrepreneur. Great, she said, threading one arm across his midsection and resting her head on his chest. Maybe he should run for mayor. I think he's more of a chamber of commerce kind of guy. Sebastian laughed, but Lydia couldn't. They were quiet for a moment, and then Sebastian said, Lilachuza. What? That's his name. The owl. Now she was able to laugh. Are you serious? She sat up to look him in the face, to determine if he was messing with her. Sometimes he fed her nonsense just to test how gullible she was. This time, his face was innocent. The owl. That's a terrible name. She laughed again. Owls aren't scary. What do you mean? Owls are terrifying, Sebastian said. She shook her head. Who, he said. Oh my god, stop it. He worked his fingers into her hair, and she felt content there, leaning against his chest. She could smell the sweet red wine on his breath. I love you, Sebastian. Who, he said again. They both laughed. They kissed. They left their wine on the table. It wasn't until much later that night, when Lydia sat trying to read in the circle of lamplight that illumined only her side of the bed, when Sebastian had long since fallen asleep, his head resting on the bare skin of his arm, his snore a soft veil of familiarity in the room, that Lydia felt a dart of something worrisome pierce her consciousness. Something Sebastian had said. In a different life, he could have been Bill Gates. She folded her book closed and set it on her nightstand. In a different life. The words echoed uncomfortably through her mind. She pulled off the covers and swung her legs over the edge of the bed. Sebastian stirred but didn't wake. Her baggy t-shirt barely covered her backside and her feet were cold against the moonlit tiles of the hallway. She padded toward the kitchen, to the table where the three of them often ate dinner together. His backpack was there, not entirely zipped shut. She pulled out his laptop and turned on the light over the stove. There were notebooks in the backpack too, and several file folders stuffed with photos and documents. 
Lydia hoped she was wrong, but she knew, somehow, what she would find before she found it. Near the bottom of a stack of pictures in the second folder, there, sitting at a table on a veranda with several other men, the face that was now dear to her. The white mustache, the recognizable glasses. There was no question who Lachuza was. Behind the wine and the cake and the dinner, she could still taste his chocolates on her tongue. Chapter 5. At home, Luca's little room has a night light in the shape of Noah's Ark. It's not a very bright one, but it makes enough light that when he has a nightmare and shoves back the covers to run into Poppy, he's able to see where his bare feet meet the tiled floor. So he's disoriented when he wakes up in the darkened room at the Hotel de Kessa Imperial. He can't make out a single shape in the blackness. He sits up in the unfamiliar bed, thrusting his legs over the edge. Poppy. It's always Poppy he calls for first. Poppy whose side of the bed he approaches, Poppy he taps on the shoulder, who tucks him into the fold of his arm, who doesn't make him go back to his own room. Poppy's pillow smells faintly of the amber liquid he drinks at bedtime. Mommy is great for the daytime things, but Poppy is better, infinitely better, at tolerating disruptions to his sleep. Poppy, Luca calls a second time, and his voice sounds strange without the close walls to contain it. Luca clutches the edge of the puffy blanket. Mommy. He tries then. There's breathing nearby, which ceases, then rearranges itself. I'm here, am I Amor? Come here. Mommy. Luca draws his legs back beneath the covers and leans against the wall of pillows behind him, and that's when it returns, all at once. The memory of what happened. The truth of where they are. The breath squeezes out of Luca's small body, and his knees curl up to his face. He covers his head with his arms and screams without intending to, the sound escapes from him. Mommy sits up quickly on her knees and reaches for the lamp, groping for the switch. Now the room is illuminated, but Luca can sense that only through the clamped shutters of his eyelids. Mommy pulls him close and folds him up, gets her legs beneath him so the knot of him is on her lap, and they stay like that for a long time. She doesn't try to stop him from screaming or crying, she just hangs on and wraps herself around him as best she can. It's as if they are riding out a hurricane. When the worst of it has passed, perhaps 15 minutes later, Luca's eyes feel like sandpaper and he still can't find a way to loosen the joints of his body, but at least he's breathing again. In and out, in and out. His face is swollen. Lydia gets out of bed, wearing one of the long t-shirts she bought at Walmart, and Luca rides. There's a physical pain to their minor separation. She grabs a bottle of water from the dresser and then darts back to him. I'm right here, she says. I'm not going anywhere. Luca lies on his side, curled up. She twists the cap off the bottle and takes a drink, then hands it to him. Her black hair is a wild tumble. He shakes his head, but she insists. Sit up. Drink. He drags his body upright, and she holds the bottle to his lips, tips it in for him like she did when he was a baby. Someone once told me that the only good advice for grief is to stay hydrated. Because everything else is just chingaderas. Mommy cursed again. That's the second time since yesterday. Luca closes his lips, forcing the bottle out but she hands it to him. Have some more, she says. Her face is splotchy but dry, and there are dark circles beneath her eyes. Her expression is one Luca has never seen before, and he fears it might be permanent. It's as if seven fishermen have cast their hooks into her from different directions and they're all pulling at once. One from the eyebrow, one from the lip, another at the nose, one from the cheek. Mommy is contorted. She turns the alarm clock face so she can see it. When she leans over the nightstand, the weight of Poppy's wedding ring drags at the gold chain she wears around her neck, dwarfing the three little loops that have always lived there. She tucks it back inside the collar of her t-shirt. 448, she says. No more sleep for us, right? Luca doesn't answer. He drinks from the water bottle. She gathers her tumultuous hair into a ponytail, stands up from the bed again, and turns on the television. She finds an English-language cartoon. Here, she says. Practice, even though he doesn't need practice. His English is excellent. She orders room service, eggs and toast and fruit. The thought of eating makes Luca's stomach churn, so he stops thinking about it. He lets his eyes hook into the television, and his body soften. 
His head feels like a cinder block, his nose stuffed. He opens his mouth to breathe gently, but when Mommy steps into the bathroom and turns the shower on, Luca gets up from the bed and pads across the room to join her. She's sitting on the toilet, so he perches on the edge of the tub until she's finished. Then he takes a turn. Not because he has to go, but because he doesn't want to be alone in the other room. He sits there with his underwear around his ankles until he hears the handle squeak and the water stop. He stands and flushes just as she pulls back the curtain. You should take a shower, too, she says, stepping out wrapping herself in a towel. It might be a few days before you have another chance. Luca looks at her in the mirror and shakes his head once. It's impossible for him to shower. To be alone there, wedged between the tiled walls with the sound of gunfire raking across Abuela's back patio. He shakes his head again, and shuts his eyes tightly, but it's no use. He's reliving it again, his body frantic, his breath a whip of panic. The sound that comes out of him this time is something between a whimper and a screech. He tries to be louder than the gunfire in his head. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, mommy says, holding him. And even though Luca knows those words are not strictly true, he clings to them regardless. She washes him instead in the sink with sudsy water and a washcloth, like she used to do when he was a baby. Neck, ears, armpits, tummy, back, bottom, undercarriage, legs, and feet. She swabs off the grime, the spots of dried blood, the clinging flecks of vomit. She makes him clean and dry. She pats him down with a white towel, fluffy and warm against his skin. Even though they're expecting the room service delivery, the knock at the door, when it comes, startles them both. They are jittery from grief, and there's a thinness in the air that amplifies every sound. He doesn't want to, but Luca waits in the bathroom with the door locked while his mother answers the delivery. He hums softly to himself as soon as he's alone, but it's not music. There's no melody in it. Lydia hesitates between the two locked doors. Behind the bathroom one, she can hear the tuneless humming. Behind the other, a man's voice repeats the announcement of their breakfast delivery. She is barefoot on the carpet, and her hands shake as she lugs the desk chair out of the way and reaches for the doorknob. She wants to stretch up on her bare toes and look out the peephole to make sure, but how can she? How can she, when all she can imagine is seeing the dark tunnel of a gun barrel on the other side and then immediately seeing nothing at all ever again? But if that's the fate that awaits her, she tells herself, then no, at least she won't unlock the door and invite it in. She holds her breath as she reaches out silently and plants her hands on either side of the peephole. The young man outside pushes a cart laden with silver trays. He wears a uniform. His face is scarred with acne. His name tag says Eagle. None of it means anything about their safety. She returns to the flats of her feet, pads over to the dresser, and removes her machete from the top drawer. Be right there, just a second. She says. She's wearing the thick bathrobe she found in the closet, and she slips the machete into its baggy pocket. She keeps her hand in there and grips the handle tightly. She says the word, okay, out loud to herself. And then she opens the door. Eagle, it is immediately obvious, is not a Sicario. He's barely even a room service delivery boy. He ducks his head and clears his throat and seems embarrassed to be in a hotel room with a woman wearing a bathrobe. He averts his eyes as he steps past her and places their tray almost apologetically on the desk. Then he returns to his waiting cart in the doorway and hands her the billfold for her signature. Lydia feels confident enough to leave the machete in her pocket momentarily while she signs it. She thanks him and hands it back and then, just as the door is about to swing closed, he says, wait, I almost forgot, and Lydia's hand darts back into her pocket. But he only hands her some cutlery wrapped in two cloth napkins. And this, he says, producing a padded envelope from a lower shelf. The front desk asked me to bring it up. Lydia takes a small step back. What is it? A delivery, he says. Arrived for you last night. Lydia shakes her head. No one knows we're here, no one knows we're here. A panic refrain. He's holding the parcel out between them but Lydia makes no move to reach for it. She stares at the brown paper. She can't see any markings on it, not even her name. Shall I put it on the desk with the food? He asks. 
He gestures inside but seems reluctant to step back into the room without an invitation. No, Lydia says. She knows she's acting crazy. She doesn't care. I don't want it. Senora. She shakes her head again. I don't want it, she repeats. Just get rid of it. Ekel attempts to suppress the confusion from his face with a firm nod. He replaces the parcel on his cart, and it's not until its muffled rattle has almost reached the elevators at the end of the corridor that Lydia changes her mind. She opens the door and chases after him. Wait. When she returns to the room, Luca has already emerged from the bathroom and is standing over the tray of food, removing the covers from the plates. Lydia holds the small parcel away from her body as she carries it into the bathroom and places it carefully on a towel in the bottom of the tub. She steps out and shuts the door, closing the parcel inside. She fixes her coffee from the tray, drinks it in one long guzzle, and then dresses quickly, hitching her scratchy new jeans up beneath the hotel robe. Luca eats standing up, wearing only his underwear. He is starving, and that hunger feels like a betrayal. How can his body want food? He jams a slice of toast into his mouth. How can the butter taste so good? Luca chews it into a paste before swallowing. He watches his mother sideways without turning his head away from the television. He sees the way mommy screws her lips up to one side, and he decides he's going to take care of her. He won't be a baby anymore. He decides this very matter-of-factly, in a single instant, and he knows it to be immediately true. We should go to El Norte, he says, because he suspects that's her plan anyway, and he wants to confirm that it's a good one, the only one, to get to a planet where no one can reach them. Yes. Mommy stands beside the bed in her jeans and robe. She seems to have lost track of what she was doing halfway through getting dressed. She seems both hurried and unable to move. We'll go to Denver, she says after a moment. She has an uncle there. Lydia slips a plain white t-shirt over her head and steps out from inside the puddle of robe around her feet. She feels so prickly and raw that even the cotton of the t-shirt brushing against her skin sends goose bumps racing down her arms. She rubs them off and tells Luca to hurry up and get dressed when he's finished eating. Back in the bathroom, she stares down at the padded brown envelope in the bottom of the tub, and can't decide whether she made the right decision by bringing it into the room. Maybe it doesn't matter. Someone knows they're here, so now they have to leave immediately, regardless of what's inside. It wasn't curiosity that made her run after that food delivery kid. She's not curious. She doesn't want to know what's inside. But she knows that disinterest is a luxury she can no longer afford to indulge. If she hopes to survive this ordeal with Luca, then she needs to pay attention to every single detail. She needs to be alert to every scrap of available information. She lifts the envelope carefully by one corner and examines the back seal. There's nothing out of the ordinary. She's going to have to open it. In here, in the bathroom. Or should she take it out on the balcony in case it explodes? Carajo, she says out loud. You talking to me, mommy? Luca says through the door. No, mijo. Get dressed. She puts the parcel to her ear but can hear nothing inside. No ticking. No beeping. She lifts the parcel to her nose and smells it but there's no discernible odor. She carefully slides one finger beneath the sealed edge, closes her eyes, and gently pulls her finger along the loosening flap. In her head, the pounding of her own fear is louder than the ripping paper, but now here it is, opened in her hands. An ordinary brown envelope. No dreadful toxic powder spills out. No poisonous cloud of doom ascends. Inside, tied with a pale blue ribbon, is an English-language copy of Love in the Time of Cholera. A book she once discussed with Javier, one of their many shared favorites. There's something tucked between its pages. She tugs on the ribbon, which gives way and falls to the floor at her bare feet. Her body feels like an arrow that's been launched from its bow but hasn't yet found its target. She's suspended, arcing, accountable to the laws of gravity. She opens to the page where an unsealed envelope is wedged into the spine. Of course she knows, she knew from the very first sound of mayhem in the yard, that Javier is responsible for the massacre of her family. It feels as impossible as it is true. But until this moment, she's protected herself from fully acknowledging that fact. 
because once she accepts that incontrovertible truth, she must also acknowledge her own guilt. She knew this man. She knew him. And yet she'd failed to appreciate the danger he presented, she'd failed to protect her family. Lydia can't think about any of this yet, she isn't ready. She must find a way to delay her despair. Luca is the only thing that matters now. Luca. He is still in danger. Get dressed. She calls again, her voice pitching out at an unfamiliar angle. She looks down at the book in her hand. A passage is highlighted there, the moment when the widowed heroine, Fermina Daza, reeling in the aftermath of her husband's death, encounters the man, Florentino Ariza, whom she rejected fifty years earlier. Fermina, he said, I have waited for this opportunity for more than half a century, to repeat to you once again my vow of eternal fidelity and everlasting love. Lydia thrusts the book away from her and it somersaults into the tub. The envelope remains in her hand. She considers dropping it too, and leaving it there, but she needs to know what it says. Her stomach plunges. She pulls the card out of its thick envelope and sees white lilies on the front. M. I. Mas Sentido Pesame. Inside, the handwriting is immediately familiar. Lydia. Hey sangre en tus manos tambien. Lo siento por tu dolor y el mío. Ahora estamos destinados a permanecer eternamente unidos por este pesar. Jamas imagine este capitulo para nosotros. Pero no te preocupes, mi reina del alma, tu sufrimiento será breve. Javier. There is blood on your hands as well. I'm sorry for your pain and mine. Now we are bound forever in this grief. I never imagined this chapter for us. But do not worry, queen of my soul, your suffering will be brief. She drops the card and it lands in the toilet, where it darkens at once. Lydia's not sure what she'd been expecting when she opened it. There's nothing he could have written there that would make any difference. No quiet slashing of ink on paper can resuscitate her dead mother, her husband. No apology or explanation can reanimate Unifer's brain, pin her soul back into her body. That girl smelled like grapefruit and sugar, and now she's gone. Lydia beats back a sob using an English word she's never liked, fuck. It works, so she says it again and again. Perhaps she'd hoped the card might illuminate something. She reads it once more, floating, the ink beginning to bleed, and she's haunted by the familiarity of the handwriting. What had she missed? How can this be real? She tries, but she can't force it to make sense, and the effort makes her dizzy. Only one thing is clear, Javier knows where they are. She doesn't have time to panic or reflect. She has to get Luca out of there. Now. They have to run. She bangs open the bathroom door and hisses at Luca once more to get dressed. He doesn't answer, and when she looks up, she sees that he's already dressed in fresh jeans and his father's red hat, that he's sitting on the chair beside the desk, wriggling his feet into his new socks. Oh, Andale, she says. Good. But then he reaches out for the tray of food, to cram in a bite before tackling the other sock, and Lydia lunges toward him. She smacks the toast from his hand and it skids to the floor. Mommy. Luca is shocked. She only shakes her head. Don't eat it. Don't eat any more food. Luca is silent. I don't know if it's safe. She thinks about dragging him into the bathroom and sticking a finger down his throat, but there's no time. She crams all their belongings into her mother's overnight bag and the two backpacks. She hasn't even put on her bra yet. No time. Her hair is wet, it's leaving a damp ring around the shoulders of her t-shirt. She jams her bare feet into her mother's quilted sneakers, straps the backpack on herself, and grabs her mother's bag. You ready? Luca nods and picks up the second backpack, the one they bought at Walmart. Super quiet, she says. No noise. Luca seals his mouth. Lydia pauses at the door to lean her ear against the wood and listen before she dares to open it. She pins Luca to the wall beside her and then cracks the door. The hallway is empty, the only sound coming from a television in the room across the hall. She takes Luca's hand and tugs him out, wedging a towel into the door so it won't even click as it closes. They run silently to the service stairs, and when Lydia hears the ding of the elevator at the other end of the hall, she shoves Luca through the door. Seven flights down, Luca flies in front of her. Lydia's feet touch every third or fourth step along the way. 
Chapter 6. They emerge from the stairwell into a small parking lot behind the kitchen and the stink of hot dumpster garbage. Lydia tells Luca they're going to be fine, but they must be both calm and quick now. They have to keep their heads. There's a wall of hedges to hide the work of tourism from the tourists, and together they shove through it, out onto a manicured path that winds among the sparkling pools before reaching the beach. Lydia listens all the time for the sounds of pursuit behind them, but so far there's nothing but the hushy voice of the ocean greeting the shore. The towel hut isn't open yet, but a man on the pool deck is pushing a cart of clean, folded towels, and he offers one to Lydia, who smiles and slings it around her neck. Thank you, she says, and takes one for Luca, too. On the sand, they take off their shoes and try to make their silhouettes appear like casual morning beachcombers. In minutes, they arrive safely at the adjacent hotel property. They put their shoes back on and walk briskly through the lobby from back to front, discarding the towels on a lounger as they go. They pass potted palms and waiters carrying trays of orange juice, and the aroma of fresh coffee, and Lydia takes two muffins from an unattended tray of food on a stand. When they arrive at the hotel's front door, there's a shuttle bus waiting. They get on. Soon they're driving past the entry of the Hotel de Kessa Imperial, and Lydia can see three black SUVs lurking in the parking lot. She clutches at Sebastian's wedding band hanging from the gold chain around her neck, and feels for the three interlocking loops. She doesn't know how Javier found them. Or why. Did he mean only to scare the shit out of her? To spike her grief with terror? Or to warn her, to soil the purity of her anguish with his weird, revolting compassion? His motives are messy, Lydia cannot begin to understand them. That highlighted passage he chose, the dead husband, the vulgar proclamation of love. Does Javier not remember what happens next? That Fermina Daza is repulsed by the declaration, that she curses his name and throws him out onto the street, that she wishes him dead and orders him never to return. Lydia understands nothing. For an instant, only an instant, she considers telling the driver to stop. She imagines walking over to those SUVs and knocking on one of the driver's windows. She thinks of going to Javier, wherever he is, meeting him outside the confines of the bookstore for the first time. She might embrace him, throw herself on his mercy, demand an explanation. She might beg him just to get it over with. She might punch and kick him, pull the machete from her pant leg, slash his face, slash his throat. And then she looks over at Luca, and it all evaporates. She's in a stuffy shuttle bus and there's something sticky on the seat. The ghost of some child's melted candy. She is here with Luca and she will protect him at all costs. This is the only thing left that matters. Ahead of them, a black SUV rolls slowly across the intersection. Can you take us to the bus depot? Lydia asks the driver. I'm not supposed to deviate from my route. But there are no other passengers, it's only a few extra blocks. Who's going to know? GPS. The driver points to a screen strapped onto his dash. There's a different shuttle that goes to the bus terminal. This one's for the shopping district. You want to go back to the hotel, you can take the other shuttle. Please, Lydia says. I can pay you. In response, the driver breaks and opens the door. Lydia shoots him a hateful look but gathers her things and prompts Luca off the bus in front of her. It's too early for shopping, and the streets of the district are deserted. The driver closes the door behind them and rolls away. The boulevard is wide and open. It's only half a mile's walk from here to the bus station, but it feels an impossible, exposed distance to cover, like walking across a battlefield without armor or weaponry. She hides her fear well, but Luca can sense it anyway, in the cold slick of his mother's hand. Getting to the bus depot feels like some deranged version of the game Crossy Road, where, instead of dodging taxis and trucks and trains, Luca and Mommy have to duck and lurch between the possibility of concealed narcos and their tinted SUVs. The ever-present threat of gunfire screams through Luca's mind like the unexpected train. Don't worry, he tells Mommy. If anyone was looking for us, they'd go to the central terminal downtown, right? They wouldn't expect us to be all the way out here in Diamante. Luca doesn't know about the parcel, but his logic is enough to make Lydia smile for a moment. That's what I thought too. Smart kid. She tugs the brim of Poppy's red baseball cap lower on Luca's face. 
He walks too fast. We have to walk like normal, she says. Slow down. Normal people are sometimes late for a bus. Luca's limbs feel twitchy. There's always another bus, she says. It's seven minutes past six in the morning when mommy purchases their one-way tickets to Mexico City, so they have 13 minutes to kill before the bus leaves. The terminal is a modern structure, mostly glass, and even though the sun isn't up yet, the sky has begun to lighten, and Luca can make out the shapes of the cars in the parking lot. There's only one SUV, and it appears to be empty, lights off. But someone could be inside waiting, seat reclined, asleep on the job. Luca studies the SUV while mommy collects her change from the lady behind the counter. It's Sunday, so the buses back to Mexico City will be crowded with families heading home from their mini vacations. Luca and mommy can look like one of those families. There's a handful of energetic children in the terminal already, chattering and skipping circles around their bleary eyed, coffee sipping parents. Mommy herds Luca into the handicapped stall in the ladies' bathroom and makes him stand on the toilet seat inside. It's the sort of thing she usually wouldn't tolerate. Luca doesn't think anyone in the terminal noticed them, and he feels pretty sure because he was studying the faces, but if there is someone looking for them here, if they do track them first to the bus terminal, then to the women's bathroom, and finally to the handicapped stall, well, then standing on a toilet with your back against a wall doesn't seem like a very effective way to survive. Luca leans his hands down on his knees and tries not to shake. He watches mommy remove her backpack and prop it in the corner before hanging the overnight bag from the hook on the back of the door. She has to dig nearly to the bottom of it to find a pair of socks. They're still attached by a plastic barb, which mommy snaps before putting them on. He doesn't know how she does that. Luca always has to cut them with scissors. Mommy doesn't look that strong, but he knows she's really powerful, because she can always snap that plastic barb like it's nothing. She digs out a bra too, and wriggles into it beneath her shirt. Then she zips up Abuela's gold sneakers and turns her back to Luca so her feet are pointing in the right direction in case anyone looks under the stall. They're alone in the bathroom, but he speaks to her very quietly anyway, so they can hear if the door opens, if anyone comes in. So we're going to Colorado. Lydia nods, and Luca wraps his arms around her neck. He leans his chin on her shoulder. Good plan. No one would ever think of Colorado. Lydia stares at the bag hanging in front of them and tries to remember if she ever mentioned Denver to Javier. Why would she have? She's never been there and hasn't seen her uncle since she was a kid. Plus, it's far, Luca says. Yes, mommy says. Very far away from here. In fact, Luca knows with some degree of precision just how far Denver is from Acapulco, almost 2,000 miles by car. He knows this because Luca has perfect direction the way some prodigies have perfect pitch. He was born with it, an intrinsic sense of his position on the globe, like a human GPS pinging his way through the universe. When he sees something on a map, it lodges in his memory forever. I'm going to miss the geography B, he says. He's been studying for months. In September, his school paid 600 pesos for him to take the international qualifying exam because his teacher was convinced he would bring home the $10,000 grand prize. I'm sorry, Miho, Lydia says, kissing his arm. Luca shrugs. It doesn't matter. Before yesterday, the geography B had seemed so important to all of them, now it feels like the most trivial thing in the world, along with everything else on the running to-do list Lydia kept beside the register in the bookshop, fill out the church paperwork for Luca's communion. Pay the water bill. Take Abuela to her cardiology appointment. Buy a gift for Unifer's quinceañera. What a waste of time it had all been. Lydia feels annoyed that her niece won't get to see the music box she purchased for her special day. How expensive it was. She realizes, even as this thought occurs to her, how bizarre and awful it is, but she can't stop it from crashing in. She doesn't rebuke herself for thinking it, she does herself the small kindness of forgiving her malfunctioning logic. Luca whispers in her ear, with a population of almost 700,000, Denver, nicknamed the Mile High City because of its elevation, is located just east of the Rocky Mountain foothills. Reciting from the memory of flash cards. It is the state capital of Colorado and one quarter of its population claims Mexican heritage. 
Lydia squeezes his arm, reaches up, and runs a hand through his black hair. The summer before last, when Luca's enduring interest in maps began to shift from fascination to obsession, Lydia kept him busy at the bookstore with guidebooks and atlases. It seems impossible that back then, just so recently, Acapulco was bright with tourists and music and the shops and the sea. Rock pigeons strutted across the sand. Vast foreign cruise ships disgorged their sneakered passengers onto the streets, their pockets fat with dollars, their skin glistening from coconut-scented sunscreen. The dollars filled the bars and restaurants. In Lydia's bookshop, they filled the register. Those tourists bought the guidebooks and atlases, along with serious novels and frivolous novels and souvenir keychains and tiny tubes of sand corked with tiny stoppers that Lydia kept in a big fishbowl beside the register. And, I, Dios mio, those tourists couldn't get enough of Luca. Lydia set him up like a puppet on a stool, and he'd tell them, in precise English, about the places where they came from. He was six years old. A wunderkind. With a population of 640,000, Portland is located at the confluence of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers and is the largest city in the state of Oregon. The city was incorporated in 1851, 65 years after its eastern namesake in coastal Maine. Henry from Portland, Oregon, stood in front of Luca with his mouth hanging open. Marge, come here, you've got to see this. Do it again. Marge joined her husband, and Luca repeated his spiel. Incredible. Kid, you are just incredible. Marge, give the kid some money. Did you make all that up? Marge asked skeptically, digging in her purse for some money regardless. Nah, he knew the rivers, Henry defended him. How could he make that up? It's real, Luca said. I just remember things. Especially about maps and places. Well, Henry's right, it's incredible. Marge gave him a dollar. And in perfect English. Where did you learn such perfect English? Acapulco, Luca said simply. In YouTube. Lydia watched in silence and felt obscenely proud. Smug, even. Her boy was perfect, so smart and accomplished, so guapo and happy. She'd been teaching him English for almost as long as he'd been speaking Spanish. It was a skill that she knew would serve him well, growing up in a tourist town. But he quickly outstripped her knowledge of the language, and then they proceeded to learn together, mostly on her phone or computer. YouTube Lessons, Rosetta Stone, Soap Operas. They often spoke English to each other when Sebastian wasn't around, or when they pretended to have a secret in front of him. Sometimes they tried out slang on each other. She called Luca dude and he called her shorty. Marge and Henry laughed at Luca's pragmatic charm and then gathered their friends from the cruise ship and returned to watch him perform. They offered him a dollar for every city he could tell them about. He made $37 that day and could have kept going, except the tourists had to get back to their ship. So, yes, this geography V has been almost two years coming. But Lydia cannot think of details right now, the annulled logistics of her life. Her brain can't hold them. Even the biggest, most fundamental facts seem impossible to comprehend. Outside the stall, the bathroom door swings open. There's no squeak, but they can tell someone has come in because suddenly the sounds beyond the door are temporarily louder, and then softer again as the door swings shut. They both hold their breath. Luca is still draped over Mammy's back, and she grips his arms where they encircle her neck. The pads of his fingers turn yellow as they dig into the bones of Mammy's wrist. She doesn't move. He squeezes his eyes shut. But soon there's the sound of the door latching on the neighboring stall. An older woman loudly clearing her throat. Luca can feel mommy let go of her breath like the air leaving a deflated balloon. He puts his lips against her neck. After the lady in the stall next door finishes her business and washes her hands and compliments herself out loud in the bathroom mirror, it's time for them to venture back out. He knows they can't stay in this bathroom forever, but his heart beats in a clamorous thud when mommy opens the door. It's time to get on the bus. When they cross the lobby, Luca registers the faces of the people who remain in the terminal, the immaculate lady behind the counter with her lips outlined a shade darker than the lips themselves, the man in his paper hat selling coffee, the couple with the fussy baby who are waiting until the last minute to board. On the television affixed to the wall, Luca sees a prim newscaster and then, starkly, Abuela's little house. 
The yellow crime scene tape flutters and sags. The camera focuses on the courtyard gate hanging open, and then the back patio, the tented shapes of Luca's family covered by plastic tarps, the grim faces of lost policias as they walk, stoop, stand, scratch, breathe, as they do the things living people do when they walk among corpses. Luca squeezes his mother's hand, not to get her attention, but to prevent himself from crying out. She doesn't look up. She pulls him along the shiny, tiled floor, but he feels as if he's walking in a sucking sand at high tide. Luca waits for the crack of a bullet to strike the front wall of the terminal. He waits for the shower of raining glass. But now his feet are on the pavement outside, and the pavement is a shadowy purple in the growing cast of daylight. His sneakers are blue there. Only two people wait in front of them to board the bus. Only one. Mommy pushes him on ahead of her, and then she's there, too, glued to his backpack, propelling him down the aisle past extruding knees and elbows. And when he collapses into the seat, against the soft fabric of the cushions, and Mommy plops down next to him, he feels more grateful and relieved than he ever has in his entire life. We made it, he says quietly. Mommy opens her lips without moving her teeth. She doesn't look relieved. Okay, mijo, she says. She pulls his head onto her lap and strokes his hair until, as their bus rambles north onto the Viaducto Diamante and gathers speed, he falls asleep. Chapter 7. It's a victory to get out of Acapulco alive, Lydia knows this. Yes, they've cleared the first significant hurdle. She'd like to feel her son's surge of relieved optimism, but she knows too much about the reach and determination of Los Jardineros and their jefe to experience any real respite from her fear. She stares out the window and keeps her head low. In the early days of their marriage, Lydia and Sebastián took frequent weekend trips to Mexico City, trading cities with the tourists. They'd both gone to college there. It was where they met, and though neither of them had any desire to live in the capital, they enjoyed being close enough to visit. In those days, the state of Guerrero felt safe, insulated. Their country had its share of narcotraficants back then, but they felt as distant as Hollywood or Al-Qaeda. The violence would erupt in concentrated, faraway bursts, first Ciudad Juarez, then Sinaloa, then Michoacán. Acapulco, ringed by mountains and sea, retained its sunny bubble of protective tourism. The salty ocean air, the wheeling calls of the seagulls, the big sunglasses, the wind whipping down the boulevard to toss the latest hair around their sun-browned faces, it all intensified that swollen illusion of immunity. It typically took Lydia and Sebastián just over four hours to drive from Acapulco to Mexico City in their orange beetle because Sebastián sped like a lunatic around the gentle mountain curves, up and down the scenic slopes of the highway. Even though his driving was questionable, the road was broad and smooth. Lydia looked out over the landscape, at the sunshine leaning between the distant peaks, the terraces of clouds stepping down toward the irregular earth, the rooftops and steeples of the fleeting villages, and she felt safe with her new husband in their little orange car. At Chilpancinga they often stopped for a coffee or a sandwich. Sometimes they met with friends, Sebastian's college roommate lived there with his wife and the baby who became Sebastian's godson. And then a couple hours later, in Mexico City, they'd find a cheap hotel and walk the city for hours. Museums, shows, restaurants, dancing, window shopping, the Bosque de Chapultepec. Or sometimes they wouldn't leave their hotel room at all, and Sebastián, sweaty, laughing, tangled in the sheets, would whisper into his wife's hair that they could have stayed in Acapulco and saved some money. Lydia tips her head back against the bus seat behind her. It's inconceivable that those memories are from ten years ago, inconceivable that Sebastian is really gone. She feels a monstrous lurch inside her, so she reaches out to touch the soft curve of Luca's sleeping ear. Everything devolved so rapidly in recent years. Acapulco always had a heart for extravagance, so when at last she made her fall from grace, she did so with all the spectacular pageantry the world had come to expect of her. The cartels painted the town red. As their bus passes the crooked shoulders of trees and a scar of blasted rock face where the road cuts through the countryside, Lydia notes that they've already reached Ocotito. She prays there will be no roadblock between here and Mexico City, but she knows that's impossible. Even before Acapulco fell, the roadblocks around Guerrero, as in much of the country, had become a menace. 
They are manned by gangs or narcotraficants or police, who may also be narcotraficants, or soldiers, who may also be narcotraficants, or, in recent years, by auto defenses, armed militias formed by the inhabitants of certain towns to protect their communities from cartels. And these auto defenses may also, of course, be narcotraficants. In character, the roadblocks range from inconvenient to life threatening. It's because of the existence of the more serious ones that Lydia and Sebastian stopped traveling regularly to the capital shortly after Luca was born. The reason Luca has been to Mexico City only once before, when he was too young to remember it, and the reason Lydia allowed her driver's license to expire almost two years ago. They seldom left Acapulco now, and Lydia, like most women in Mexico's more precarious states, never travels alone by car anymore. This truth has felt like a growing, but theoretical, irritation to Lydia over the last couple of years, an affront to her contemporary feminine autonomy. But today it feels like a very real noose around her neck. She may have managed their escape from Acapulco for now, but she knows they're still trapped in Guerrero State, and she can feel the roadblocks all around the periphery of her mind, closing in on them. Without waking Luca, Lydia spreads out the map and pins it with one hand to the seat in front of her. She studies the spreading veins of the roadways and feels the ticking futility of that action. If only their bodies could pass unimpeded along these highways as quickly and safely as her finger traces the route along the map. If the roadblocks were represented on the map key, their icon might be a tiny AK-47. But they're not on the map, because they're always moving, to maintain the element of surprise. Lydia knows that every road between here and Mexico City will have at least one roadblock occupied by Los Jardineros. She knows that the boys manning those roadblocks will be looking specifically for her and for Luca. She imagines that some of those boys are both ambitious and violent, that they'll be eager to recognize her. She wonders what reward they might receive for delivering her, either whole or in pieces, to her friend. Lydia tries to refold the map along its previous creases, but her patience is flimsy, and she shoves it into the pocket of the seat in front of her. She tries to think clearly, to review their options. Most people she would ordinarily turn to for help are dead, and even if they weren't, asking for help is akin to walking into a friend's kitchen wearing a suicide vest. The risk of her very presence seems too selfish to consider. Although she's aware that Chilpancinga is crawling with jardineros, she also knows that if they hope to avoid a roadblock they will have to get off there. Boarding this bus felt like a tremendous victory only a few minutes ago, but maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they're speeding into a trap. She watches Luca, the rise and fall of his chest as he sleeps, and she attempts to match the rhythm of his breath. When she was a kid, Lydia loved the Choose Your Own Adventure books. At the end of each chapter, you'd have to decide what to do next. Ride your bike to the park, flip to page 23. Follow the mysterious stranger, flip to page 42. Whenever Lydia didn't like the outcome of her plot, or sometimes even when she did, she would backtrack and make a different choice. She liked being able to revise her own decisions, liked knowing that nothing was permanent, that she could always start over and try again. But it was also true that sometimes it didn't matter, the maze of the book seemed to funnel her back to the same result, no matter what she decided. This morning she and Luca had selected the 6.20 a.m. bus from Diamante, and now it's traveling north without delay. She closes her eyes and prays it was the right choice. Luca wakes up as the bus approaches Chilpancinga. Lydia can't see much from their seats halfway back but she tries. She leans into the aisle and looks for a roadblock ahead. Luca leans his forehead against the window, and presses his finger against the smudgy glass. Mommy, look. He yawns. What are they? On a ridge above them, rows of colorful houses snake up the hillside, all in matching clusters, red, blue, green, purple. Oh, they're just houses, Amorcito. Only houses. It's turned into a bright young morning. They've been on the road almost two hours. Why are they so colorful like that? Just for decoration, I think. They look like Legos. Lydia's breath hitches in her chest every time the bus jerks or turns or changes its speed, but there's no stopping. No armed men standing in the road. And soon, buildings line both sides of the narrow street and they've made it. They're in Chilpancinga. She makes the sign of the cross over herself and traces a smaller version on Luca's forehead. 
They pull up in front of a familiar building, a miniature of the station they embarked from in Acapulco this morning. The driver stops the bus and there's the loud hiccuping noise as he engages the brakes. He stands and announces past his mustache five minute stop. A couple passengers stand up from their seats to stretch. At the front, someone gets off for a cigarette, but Lydia and Luca are the only ones who begin gathering their things to disembark. Everyone on board is heading to the capital. Are we getting out, mommy? Yes, am I Amor? But then she stands next to her seat in the narrow aisle with her backpack strapped to her shoulders and looks down at her sleepy son, at the top of his tousled black head, and she wishes they could make a run for it. She wishes they could hunker down in here, camouflaged among the travelers on this bus, and hold their breath all the way to Mexico City. Maybe they'd make it. Maybe the roadblock between here and there would be innocuous. A brief stop, a fistful of bills, a languorous waving through. Thump thump, two slaps on the side of the bus as it rolls on its merry way. Lydia imagines it all with a quiver of hope. The bus driver emerges from the terminal now and gets back in the bus. New passengers begin to board, and the driver takes their tickets one by one. Mommy. Come on. As the shadow of the bus pulls away from the sidewalk, Lydia and Luca emerge into the blinking daylight of Chilpancinga. She feels both relieved and disheartened to be off the bus. But she takes a moment to remind herself that she's managed to get them this far, 19 hours and 68 miles away from the epicenter of calamity. With each minute and mile that passes, Lydia knows she's increased their chances of survival. She needs to take encouragement where she can find it. She mustn't despair at the enormity of the task yet ahead. She should focus only on the immediate next steps. Find Sebastian's college roommate. On the sidewalk, she tightens the straps on Luca's backpack, which are drooping too far from his small shoulders. He looks like a turtle with an inadequate shell, yet somehow he's managed to draw his most vulnerable parts tightly within himself. She wonders about the lasting effects of that retraction. What's next, mommy? Luca asks her, in the flat tone of voice that seems to be his only inflection now. Let's find an internet cafe, she says. But you have Poppy's tablet, right? It's powered off in her backpack, and she's not going to turn it back on. She also left the SIM card of her own cell phone in a garbage can outside the bank in Playa Calatilla. She felt marginally crazy, paranoid, as she pried the thing out with her fingernail, but she didn't want to be a blue dot flashing on some remote, hostile screen. She adjusts the brim of Sebastian's Yankees cap slightly lower on her son's forehead. She should buy one for herself, too, she thinks. Let's go, she says. El Cascabolito Internet Café is just opening for the day when Lydia purchases a coffee and 15 minutes to look more closely at maps online. She buys Luca a bag of platanitos, too, but the green foil package sits unopened on the desk. Lydia chooses a computer in the back corner, one that has two chairs and a privacy partition so they're hidden from view of the door. Luca draws his heels up to the seat of the chair and rests his chin on his knees, but his eyes remain unfocused on the platanitos while Lydia studies the screen. From Chilpancinga there are only two viable routes to Mexico City, and both are virtually guaranteed to have roadblocks. Lydia chews the inside of her mouth, and her knee undertakes a jittery hop beneath the desk. They can't exactly walk to Mexico City from here. Lydia's never been claustrophobic, but today she feels so trapped. She can feel it in her limbs, a panicky longing to stretch. She can't see any way out. Dismay will not help. She opens Facebook and finds Sebastian's friend. He's an attorney, and his profile shows the name of his law firm, but it's Sunday and it won't be open. She checks his About tab, and scrolls down to his likes, a local newspaper, a couple non-profits, his alma mater, a fan page for Adidas sneakers, so much football. But then, there. Bingo, a Pentecostal church here in Chilpancinga. A worship service at 9 o'clock. She looks it up and finds it's about two miles away. There's a bus down the main thoroughfare, and 20 minutes later, Luca and Lydia are on it. Lydia worries she wrote the address down wrong, because when they get off the bus, the street is lined with shops, all closed on a Sunday morning. They find the number they're looking for sandwiched between an electronics store and a jeweler. 
But just as she's double-checking the address on the scrap of paper in her hand, a young man pushing a baby carriage approaches and opens the door for his pregnant wife. Lydia peeks inside before the door swings closed, and she sees rows of folding chairs facing a stage. Luca tugs on her sleeve and directs her attention to a sign she hadn't noticed, propped in the window, Iglesia Pentecostal Tabernaculo de la Victoria. There's no steeple or stained glass, but this is the place. Inside, it's bigger than she imagined, with low ceilings, and fans attached to the walls. There's a full drum kit, an amplifier, and some huge speakers set up behind the pulpit. There's no cross, no font of holy water at the entrance, but Lydia blesses herself out of habit, and Luca follows her example. She waits for some bubble of feeling to follow, a whisper from her legion of newborn angels, or perhaps a low-down rage at God instead. But nothing comes, it's spiritual tumbleweed. Undesierta del alma because she has room only for fear. They sit in the last row, near the wall, and Lydia stows their backpacks under their folding chairs. She covers her face with her hands and instructs Luca to do the same, but it's not veneration. It's only for concealment, in case any of Los Jardineros are Pentecostal Christians, in case they traffic drugs on a Monday, stab people on a Thursday, and then come here seeking forgiveness on a Sunday. It doesn't seem more outlandish than anything else that's happened. Through the screen of her interlaced fingers, Lydia watches the square of stark sunlight on the tiled floor grow brighter every time someone opens the glass door to come in. A few of the congregants notice them in the back row, and give them a welcoming nod or a smile, but most walk right past and find their usual seats. The church is almost half full by the time Carlos appears behind his wife and children. The wife greets everyone with hugs, and has the sharp voice of a gabacha above the hum of reverent conversation in the room. Lydia half stands from her seat and lifts a hand in greeting, but Carlos doesn't see her. The youngest son alerts him, points to Lydia in the corner, and Carlos turns. Lydia, oh my goodness, what are you doing here? His voice arrives before he does, but soon he maneuvers himself between the rows of chairs to where she's standing. He embraces her. It's so lovely to see you, Gua, what a surprise. Luca watches while this man, Carlos, kisses Mommy on both cheeks and holds both her hands in his. This must be Luca, the man says, bending toward him where he's still seated on the folding chair. You look so much like your poppy. He straightens up. Where's Sebastian, did he come with you? You haven't heard the news. Mammy's voice sounds far away. Luca can tell without having to look that Carlos's face has suddenly shifted, that it's drained to a sickly gray, that he's already building the internal fortifications he'll need in order to hold the horrific story Mammy's about to tell him. Come, Carlos says, we can talk upstairs. There's an office there, and it's not quite accurate to say that Luca zones out while his mother and Carlos talk because that description would indicate some active participation of abstention on his part. Instead, his consciousness, like a helium balloon fastened to his person by some taut and fragile string, momentarily floats away. His body sits at a table with his backpack at his feet, his legs swivel the chair beneath his weight, his hands play with a nearby dish of paper clips, hooking them together into long strands, but his internal mappings are on vacation. The grown-ups glance at him now and again, past the barricades of their warbled voices and ashen faces, and his body responds to their questions with the appropriate nods or shrugs. A paper cup of water is set on the table before him, and he takes a dutiful sip. Downstairs, someone is playing the drums. An electric guitar. Luca can feel the bass vibrating through the floor. Then they're in Carlos's car, and they're driving through the streets of the city to Carlos's house. Mommy sits in the backseat and tries to hold Luca's hand. He sees this, sees Mammy's hand covering his own, and it's the warmth and press of her fingers that bring him back. Once they pass out of La Zona Centro, Luca sees that Chilpancinga isn't so different from Acapulco. There are no seagulls here, no tourists, and the streets aren't as broad. But there are many colorful shops and taxis, people wearing their church clothes in the sunshine. There are ladies with handbags slung over their shoulders, boys with slipshod tattoos. Plenty of bright, foamy graffiti. The houses are all painted in vivid colors. Luca watches them flip by like cards in a deck. After three and a half songs have played on the radio, Carlos turns onto a street that's slightly wider than the others. 
There's an arching canopy of shade trees that creates the sense of entering a secret place, a hushy hideout. In the middle of the block stands a handsome white church with modest twin bell towers at the front. It's the kind they're used to. Catolica. The other buildings on the crowded street stand back from the little church, giving it room. Carlos pulls into a parking spot. Carlos's house is turquoise, the exact color of the middle stripe of ocean in Acapulco, in between the light sandy stripe near the shore and the darker blue at the horizon when you stand on the steps at Plaza España and look out on a sunny day. The house feels big and modern even though it's attached to an identical purple one on the right and an identical peach-colored one on the left. Carlos carries their bags inside. Carlos's wife is named Meredith, and she's white. She's from Estados Unidos, and that's a fact Luca could have gathered without being told, just from the quick glimpse he got of her in church before Carlos took them upstairs. Her voice, her clothes. Her way of holding people by the shoulders and shaking them slightly while she speaks to them. Luca investigates the empty house, the family photographs, a closer look at the three boys, who all have Meredith's pink complexion and Carlos's dimples. The middle one looks about the same age as Luca. Meredith eventually arrives home without those boys, who stayed behind for even more church, and with her comes Luca's first experience of proprietary grief. Proprietary is a word Luca knows, in Spanish, but not in English, because he knows lots of words other eight-year-olds don't, like viscous and bombastic and serendipity. But he's never truly understood the meaning of the word proprietario until now. He's never felt the feeling before. It rumbles through him like a steamroller with a broad, flattening crush. Because who is this woman, crying for Poppy? Who is this lady with her quivering features and her leaking eyes and her trembling hands and her need to be consoled? It surprises Luca, his ungenerous interpretation of such raw emotion. After all, she'd been Poppy's friend at one time. Or at least she'd married Poppy's friend. And she'd liked Poppy well enough to make him the godfather to her eldest son. So why shouldn't she be saddened, even traumatized, by the news of his unexpected and violent death? Why shouldn't she weep and lament and exhibit her devastation? Luca cannot, therefore, explain why the display of it irritates him so. When she tries to hug him, he can't endure it, and mommy doesn't make him. She intercepts him and takes him to the bathroom and splashes water on his face, and when they return, Meredith has composed herself. She urges mommy to sit while she makes tea for everyone. The tea doesn't move from the cups, but the conversation goes on for a long time regardless, and Luca lets most of it pass him without landing. Meredith met Carlos when she was a college-aged missionary from Indiana, and she's still involved with that faraway cornfield church. That summer she first came here, she fell in love with Carlos and with his country. She liked the way Mexicans were easy in their faith. She liked the sense of being in a country where it wasn't controversial or weird to talk openly about God. In Mexico, prayer was normal then, public. Expected. To Meredith, those cultural conventions felt miraculous. So she and Carlos married young, and then she made it her life's work to preserve the link between Chilpancinga and that Indiana church community, to share the experience of this place with others. In fact, right now there are 14 Indiana missionaries visiting here for spring break. Those missionaries are being hosted in Chilpancinga by the church Carlos and Meredith attend. Meredith is the chief coordinator of this annual visit, and two additional ones each summer. It's a non-stop wheel of blonde Indiana missionaries, cogging their way through Guerrero. The current group will fly home to Estados Unidos Wednesday afternoon, so the church's three passenger vans are scheduled to depart for Mexico City at 7 o'clock Wednesday morning. This is where the conversation takes on amplified urgency. Luca sits up in his chair and fiddles with the handle of Mammy's teacup. Carlos says, they can go in the shuttle, of course. It's perfect. Meredith says nothing with her mouth, but conveys plenty with her eyes, and none of it is very accommodating. And then Mommy says, we'd be safe getting through the roadblocks, if we were on the church shuttle. They'd never expect you to be with the missionaries, Carlos says. Mommy shakes her head. They wouldn't even look. And then Meredith uses her mouth. Safe for who? Maybe safer for you, but I'm sorry, I can't put all those kids at risk. She shakes her head, and Luca has the notion that she looks nothing like the woman who was crying for Poppy just a few minutes ago. 
She's different colors entirely, and her spongy features have hardened into new shapes. Mommy opens her mouth but manages to close it again without speaking. She fidgets with the loops of gold at her neck. Carlos taps his pointer finger on the table between them. They all look at that finger. Meredith, there's no other option for them. I understand your concern, but this is the only way to get them safely out of Guerrero. If we don't help them, they could die. Could is an understatement, Mommy says. But Meredith crosses her arms and shakes her head some more. Her hair is some color between brown and gold, and it's pushed back from her face with a black headband. Her nose is red, cheeks red, eyes hard blue. Mommy lifts her teacup and tries a sip, but when she sets it back down, Luca can tell she didn't swallow any. I'm sorry, it's too risky, Meredith says. It's not fair to do that to the kids, to their parents in Indiana. This is exactly the kind of thing those families fear, sending their kids down here to Mexico. Do you have any idea what it takes to placate those fears? We give them our word their kids will be safe. I personally guarantee their safety. I tell them this kind of thing will never happen. Mommy clears her throat and her face looks like a bomba about to go off but she breathes through it. This kind of thing. Meredith presses her eyes closed. I'm sorry. I don't mean. I don't even know what to say. Sebastian is dead, Meredith, Carlos says. My friend, your friend. He's gone. And fifteen more besides. This is not the kind of thing that happens, ever. Not even here. Do you know anyone else who's lost sixteen family members in one day? Meredith glares at him, but he plows ahead. We have to help them. If the suffering of our friends means nothing, if those kids can't be allowed to see us, to see Mexico as it really is, then what are they even doing here? Are they just drive-by Samaritans? Carlos, don't, Meredith says, and Luca has the feeling this is a very old conversation between them. They just want to make pancakes and take selfies with skinny brown children. Carlos asks. Meredith slaps her hand against the table, and the tea ripples in the cups. But Mommy intercepts the rising anger between them. She speaks like a void, like she's left the conversation entirely, and only her voice remains behind. She chants without any expression. Sebastian, Yemi, Alex, Unifer, Adrian, Paula, Arturo, Estefani, Nico, Joaquin, Diana, Vicente, Rafael, Lucia, and Rafaelito. Mama. They are gone. All gone. A lump rises in Luca's throat and grows one size with each name that leaves Mammy's mouth. He looks at Meredith to see how she'll respond, but her face is an unreadable smear of pink and blue. Instead it's Carlos who replies placing his hands flat on the table. We will help you, he whispers. Of course we will. Meredith stands to pace behind her chair, her arms crossed in front of her. Lydia, I can't pretend to know what you're going through. It's unimaginable. And yes, of course we'll do everything in our power to help. But please try to understand, I also have to weigh my moral responsibility here. Sometimes there are no easy answers. Mommy tense her hands over her forehead. I don't want to cause trouble for anyone. I just want to get Luca out of here. I have to. For the first time since all this started, Luca thinks she might unravel. He watches intensely, and her voice cracks. Please. We're desperate. Carlos looks up at his wife. Honey, listen. I understand your resistance, I do. But sometimes there are easy answers. This is an easy answer, if we don't help them, if they get on a bus alone, if they get stopped at a roadblock and killed because we didn't have the courage to save them, can you live with that? Can we? Meredith sighs and leans over the back of her chair. I don't know, I don't know. Just pray on it, he says. Give it up to God. She turns and clicks on the electric kettle, even though no one has yet managed to choke down the first cup of tea. With her back to the table she says, are you sure they're even looking for you now? She faces the table again and leans against the counter. Wasn't Sebastian the example they wanted? They got him, so maybe it's over now. Luca looks from Meredith back to Mommy, and she meets his gaze, and pauses, as if weighing how much to say in front of him. Perhaps she remembers that fear is good for him now. He should be afraid. No, Mommy says quietly. He won't stop until he finds us. Chapter 8
In bed, on the night she discovered that Javier and La Lechuza were the same person, Lydia turned off the lamp but did not close her eyes. She and Sebastián had always agreed that married people were entitled to a certain measure of privacy, that they needn't tell each other everything. It was one of the reasons she'd fallen in love with him, he didn't press her on personal matters, he was seldom jealous, and he had no interest in annexing or directing her friendships with other men. You're a person, an adult, he said to her before they were engaged. And I am your lover. If we get married, you choose me. I hope you'll continue to choose me every day. Lydia had laughed at his unfashionable use of the word lover, but the sentiment thrilled her. Before Sebastian, she'd always presumed that marriage would entail a sacrifice of her liberty. That it had not delighted her. They were both trustworthy, and they fancied themselves quite modern. They kept nothing of import from each other, but Lydia liked having a sacred cupboard within herself, to which only she was allowed access. So there'd been nothing untoward in her failure to mention the name Javier to her husband before, but, of course, that night, everything changed. When Sebastian got up in the morning and kissed her forehead on his way to the bathroom, she was still awake. She sat up in bed, her stomach lurching with the movement. Sebastian, she said. She thought about not telling him, about asking questions instead. She knew that once the words were out of her mouth, her friendship with Javier would come to an end, and beneath everything else, there was a foundation of grief to that impending loss. She wanted her discovery to be untrue, a misunderstanding. Her husband turned toward her in the gray light of the bedroom. What's wrong? He knew instantly, from the pitch of her voice. He crossed the space between them and sat beside her on the bed. He's my friend, she confessed. Sebastian didn't go to work that morning. He called his editor and left a message that he was following a lead and wouldn't be in until later. He and Lydia sat together on the unmade bed and talked for hours, while outside the light shifted from gray to pink to broad, sunny yellow. When it was time to wake Luca and take him to school, they managed the routine in a distracted haze. I'll take him today, Sebastian insisted. You wait here. Lydia cried in the shower. When Sebastian returned they continued their discussion at the kitchen table. Lydia's wet hair was knotted on top of her head and her face felt blotchy. Is there any chance you're mistaken? She asked, her arms folded in front of her. She already knew the answer, but it made no sense. She was floundering. Sebastian locked his eyes on her and answered in the most deliberate possible tone. No. She nodded. The piece you're working on about Los Jardineros, does it specifically mention him? Yes, it's all about him, his big debut. The whole hello, world, I'm a major kingpin expose. Lydia tilted her head to one side, placed her hand against her forehead. I don't know what to do, she whispered. It seems impossible. There's nothing to do, Lydia. But I just can't understand it. I know him. I know, Lydia, I know. How charming he can be, how erudite. But he's also incredibly dangerous. She pictured Javier's eyes, how exposed they looked whenever he removed his glasses. That word dangerous seemed so incompatible. I know it's difficult to get your head around it, Sebastian said. I can see you're struggling, and I'm sorry. He paused before he shifted gears. But he's a murderer, Lydia. Many times over. This guy is made of blood. This guy. She shook her head again. Sebastian stood up and placed his hands on the back of his chair. He pushed it under the table. He's not who you thought he was. But you said yourself, just last night that he, that lost Jardineros, they aren't as violent as the other cartels. He had said that, damn it. Lydia opened the kitchen window to the noise of traffic below. Lydia, I love you. I love your loyalty and your goodness. But we are talking degrees of murderers here. Less violent or not, he's still a major narco. And when you've killed that many people, killing becomes conventional. Does it matter that he's killed fewer children than other murderers have? It's not a moderation born of virtue. It's a pinche business decision. That guy would kill anyone if he thought it was the smart thing to do. Not anyone. Her voice was a weakening plea. He has a daughter. Sebastian dropped his head between his outstretched arms. Sebastian, listen, she said. I know it all sounds absurd but I'm not naive. I'm not an idiot, right? 
You're the smartest woman I know. So I'm just, I'm trying to take it all in, to reconcile everything you're telling me, and to make it match up with the person I know Javier to be. I know, I know. It's difficult. I can't imagine. Because I do, Sebastian, I know him. And like you say, he is smart. In a different life he could have been someone good. But it's not a different life, Lydia. He's not someone good. But maybe he still could be. That's what I'm telling you. Because people are complex and whatever you say he is, he's also this other person. This tortured, poetic soul, full of remorse. He's funny. He's kind. Maybe things could still be different. Wait. Sebastian surveyed his wife, who was now leaning against the kitchen windowsill. Outside a horn blared, and a breeze moved past a drying tendril of her hair. Wait a second, Lydia. Are you in love with him? What? Are you? Sebastian, don't be ridiculous. This is no time for histrionics. He shook his head. But do you have feelings for him? No, not like that. I do love him. You love him. He's my friend. A real friend, someone who's become very important to me. She leaned her hands on her knees and looked up at him. The coffee maker gurgled and sighed. His father died of cancer, too. Her husband pulled the chair back out and sat down again. Oh, Lydia. Sebastian had never met Lydia's father, but his death was such a defining loss in Lydia's life, and indeed in Sebastian and Lydia's early courtship, that he felt a strong kinship to his deceased father-in-law, nonetheless. He knew all the stories. How, when Lydia was twelve years old, slightly too old for teddy bears, her lifelong favorite developed a gash in its nose. Lydia was heartbroken and embarrassed. The bear hemorrhaged his stuffing all over the house. Lydia's father went quietly to the pharmacy and returned with a bag that he placed on their kitchen table beneath a swing arm lamp. He instructed her to bring the bear from her room. She transported the bear with great care, and when she returned to the kitchen, it had been transformed into an operating room. There was a sheet of plastic spread out across the table. Her father wore a mask and rubber gloves. His surgical tools were spread out beneath the lamp, needle, thread, a gleaming swatch of new leather. Lydia's father crafted an entirely new leather nose for her bear. Sebastian knew, too, that the only green vegetable his father-in-law ate was lima beans, that he had a three-inch scar on his leg from a childhood boating accident, that he sang loudly at concerts and sometimes in mortifying harmony with whatever act was on stage. Sebastian knew that the only time Lydia had ever seen her father cry was when Oscar de la Hoya won the gold medal round at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. Sebastian felt such a fondness for his father-in-law that he wondered if he knew the man better in death than he would have in life. They'd been dating only eight weeks, and were at the Estadio Azul in Mexico City attending a football match when Lydia got that terrible phone call. Though the cancer had been slow, the end had been fast, unexpected. It was October 24, 2003, exactly one week before El Día de los Muertos. Reportedly his last words had been, there's a party. I have to prepare. Lydia and Sebastian left the stadium immediately, and he drove her first to her apartment and then, through the night, back to Acapulco. Her clothes were in heaps in the backseat. She couldn't think what she was supposed to bring, so she brought everything. She packed in a laundry basket. Sebastian held her hand in the dark and stopped on the side of the road near Cuernavaca when she thought she might throw up. He drove back and forth to Mexico City three more times that week, the next day, to retrieve his own clothes, two days later, to inform Lydia's professors and his own about their absences, and finally to bring some of her friends down for the funeral, and to join Lydia's mother in convincing Lydia to return to college. In some way, Sebastian always credited that tragedy with being the thing that cemented their relationship. They had already known they were falling in love, and then the gravity of that heartbreak acted like a measuring stick for Lydia. It calculated the depth of Sebastian's character. The death aroused an unfamiliar stability in Sebastian. He found himself expanding in an effort to plug the holes in Lydia's life. So he understood, when she said this simple thing about Javier, that his father died of cancer, too, Sebastian understood the scope of what that shared experience really meant to his wife. How old was he, Sebastian asked, when his father died. Eleven, she said. 
Sebastian grimaced. Terrible. Lydia went to the cupboard and took down two mugs, which she filled with coffee. She set one in front of her husband and sat down beside him once again. She drew her knees up and wrapped her arms around her legs. Sebastian, I think he's in love with me. Sebastian filled his cheeks with air before letting it all loose into the room. Maldita C, he said. Of course he is. In the short term, the only real change was that Sebastian began calling and coming to the shop more frequently than he had before. Four or five times a day he texted, and even if she was busy, she made sure to respond, to reassure him. All was well. Lydia was intensely nervous when Javier came the following week. She texted Sebastian beneath the counter. He's here. I'll call you after. Javier carried a small parcel and his eyes were brighter than usual. He seemed eager for the other customers to withdraw, but Lydia took her time, reluctant to be alone with him. When the last couple wandered toward the exit without any purchases, she called after them, did you find everything okay? They didn't answer her. The man only nodded, and the bell above the door startled as they left. Lydia's hands trembled as she spooned sugar into Javier's cup. He smiled broadly at her from his stool. I brought a gift. He prodded the paper-wrapped bundle across the counter to her. It was plain brown paper taped and devoid of ribbons, but the austerity of the wrapping didn't diminish the intimacy of an unwarranted gift on a Wednesday morning. Lydia opened it anyway. Inside was a wooden nesting doll, peanut-shaped and about the length of Lydia's forearm, with a barely visible seam running around her middle. She was painted in festive colors, black hair, pink cheeks, yellow apron, red roses. Lydia pulled her apart at the seam and, inside, found her identical, smaller sister. She pulled her apart again, and again, and each time she discovered in miniature the shell of the doll before her. They're Russian nesting dolls, she said. Yes. Javier watched her face. But really they're me. Keep going. She pulled apart the last severed doll, no taller than her thumb, and inside she found the tiniest sister. This one was bright turquoise, and more beautiful, more exquisite and detailed than all the sisters before her. Lydia pinched her between finger and thumb. She held her up and studied the intricate silver filigree of her paintwork. And that's you. Javier tapped his chest with his fist. Muy dentro de mi. Single quote. Lydia blinked rapidly, but it was too late to conceal the tears that came to the corners of her eyes. Javier mistook them, and his smile broadened. You like them. She sniffed. Very much, thank you. She hastened to pack the dolls back into one another while he watched. He noticed the way she didn't take care to line up their tops with their bottoms. This was his first indication that something was truly askew. What's the matter, am I Reina? When the dolls were reassembled, Lydia rolled them back into their brown paper and placed them beneath the counter with her phone. There was no easy way to say it. She might as well be direct. I received some bad news last week, she said. He leaned forward, frowning. About you. He leaned back, frowning deeper. A very long silence grew between them, and then a customer came in, jangling the bell above the door. The woman bought three notebooks, three fancy pens, and a birthday card, and Lydia found herself unable to smile while she rang the woman up. She felt Javier's anxiety like a malediction in the room. It rattled into her chest. His shoulders were curled in, and he squeezed his flattened hands between his thighs. When the customer left, Lydia went to the door and locked it. She flipped the sign to Cerrado. They studied each other across the counter. She stared into his eyes, and neither of them shifted their gaze. At length, he spoke. I presumed you knew. His voice was strained, raspy. She shook her head without removing her eyes from his. How would I know? Why would I know? His eyes swam even larger than usual behind the glasses. His mouth trembled as he spoke. It feels as though almost everyone knows. I thought. Somehow, I hoped it didn't matter to you. I thought it didn't matter because you knew me, you could see the person I really am. I can, I still can, she said. But, Javier, that other part of you, the part one don't know. It's irreconcilable. That person is real, too, yes. Finally, he dropped his gaze from hers. He blinked his eyes repeatedly, removed his glasses, and cleaned them on the tail of his shirt. 
I love you, he said. I know. No, you don't. Lydia pressed her lips together. I'm in love with you. I am in love with you. She shook her head. Lydia, you're the only real friend I have. The only person in my life who wants nothing from me except the joy between us. That's not true. It is true. And when I'm not with you, I'm lonely for you. You have no idea the light you provide. You and Marta, you're all I really have. Nothing else matters. I would leave it all if I could. Then do. She slapped her hand against the counter. Leave it. He smiled sadly at her. It doesn't work that way. It works whatever way you say it works. You're the jefe, right? Yes, and if I leave, what then? What will become of Acapulco if I leave? How many people will die while they fight over who takes my place? His elbows were up on the counter. He tugged at his hair in distress. You know I never wanted this. It was an accident of fate that I ended up here. Quite near the surface of her consciousness, Lydia knew that couldn't really be true. If it was a lottery ticket, it was one he had selected and purchased with his own money. She knew this, that he must have committed specific evils to have attained this rank. How many? Of what nature? Some combination of fear and sadness prevented her from asking. She didn't dare to contradict his justifications. But here we are, here I am. His eyes were pleading. There's no getting out of it, Lydia, not for me. But it doesn't define who I am. She could feel the dissonance throbbing through her brain like an erratic pulse. Of course it defines who you are, she did not say. She squeezed her eyes shut and felt him take her hand. Please understand, he said. Try. When Lydia had found Javier's picture in Sebastian's folder the previous week, she'd been riven with real anguish. Seldom had she experienced such profound and authentic friendship in her life. The prospect of losing that attachment grieved her. But now that Javier sat before her, clasping her hand in his, now that the thing had been spoken between them and confirmed to be true, all that was left for Lydia was autopsy. What love had been there was already slipping away. She could still sense it like a ghost in the room, vague and inanimate, but she could no longer feel it. Her affection had gone, leached out, like blood from a cadaver. When he squeezed her fingers, she caught the scent of formaldehyde. When he hooked his sad gaze into hers, she saw the glass of his lenses, spattered with blood. Chapter 9. In Carlos and Meredith's house in Chilpancinga, there are new ghosts to contend with. Trauma waits for stillness. Lydia feels like a cracked egg, and she doesn't know if she's the shell or the yolk or the white. She is scrambled. During the three days that follow, she and Luca are often alone in the house while the boys are at school, Carlos is at work, and Meredith prepares the Indiana missionaries for their return home. There is no temporary suspension of living as there usually is with death because a public pause would arouse suspicion. Lydia and Luca have to stay hidden. The family has to carry on in their typical fashion. The sons have well-stocked bookshelves in their rooms, gracias a Dios, so while they're out living their regular lives, Luca reads two or three books a day. Lydia tries to read as well, but her mind can't hold the words. She doesn't have the reservoir of space to take anything else into her brain. So instead she tries to keep her body occupied. She cooks food that neither she nor Luca feels like eating. She cleans sinks and laundry and rugs that aren't dirty. She watches as Luca grows silent. The afternoons feel a thousand hours long. Luca barely even changes positions on the couch as he reads. He moves when he finishes a book, he gets up to retrieve another from the shelf. Whenever he rises to use the bathroom, Lydia tries to coax him into eating. The rest of her time she spends at the old IBM desktop computer that sits on a small cart in one corner of the living room. She checks the headlines coming out of Acapulco. There have been beautiful tributes to Sebastian by his colleagues, but Lydia can't read the reflective pieces. The word Eroy makes her angry, as if he chose his death courageously, as if it means something. For God's sake, he died with a spatula in his hand. Instead she skims the news for emerging facts about the investigation, and it's as she expected, nothing. Because fear and corruption work in tandem to censor the people who might otherwise discover the clues that would point to justice. There will be no evidence, no due process, no vindication. 
So Lydia checks for other stories, new violence, any hint of what's happening among Los Jardineros. A tourist was accidentally killed in a shootout near the beach huts at Playa Hornos yesterday afternoon. A burned-out car with two bodies inside, one large, one small, was found outside Colonia Loma Larga this morning. The mouse pointer trembles on the screen, but she manages to click out of the news and shift gears. Carlos will get them as far as Mexico City, but what then? She must try to make plans. She researches the buses, and yes, there are reports of increased roadblocks across the area, and uptick in disappearances. Travel within cities is relatively safe, but between cities it is strongly discouraged. Authorities advise deferring non-essential trips on regional highways in Guerrero, Colima, and Michoacán. Lydia feels a new wave of despair threatening to descend, but she doesn't have time for it. The roads are not an option. Even if her driver's license were current, she wouldn't risk driving with Luca right now, and the buses are no better. The roadblocks are too dangerous. So what's left? She checks airline tickets, although she doesn't love the idea of her name being on a flight manifest. Everything is digital now, and what good will it do to run a thousand miles away if her name raises a red flag in some online database? Tijuana is about as far as you can get without a passport, and that flight is 3 hours and 40 minutes. Plenty of time for Javier to send a Sicario to greet them when they deplaned. Lydia imagines carnage at the baggage claim. She can see the headlines. There are no long-distance passenger trains in Mexico, so as a last resort, Lydia studies the freight trains the Central American migrants ride across the length of the country. All the way from Chiapas to Chihuahua, they cling to the tops of the cars. The train has earned the name La Bastilla because that journey is a mission of terror in every way imaginable. Violence and kidnapping are endemic along the tracks, and apart from the criminal dangers, migrants are also maimed or killed every day when they fall from the tops of the trains. Only the poorest and most destitute of people attempt to travel this way. Lydia shudders at the YouTube stories, the photographs, the grim warnings delivered by recent amputees. She starts over, researches everything again from the beginning. Buses, planes, trains. There has to be something she hasn't considered. There has to be a way out. She clicks and scrolls and hours pass like sludge, while Luca turns page after page. At the dinner table with Carlos and Meredith's three boys, Luca wears his father's hat, and Lydia doesn't demand that he take it off, even when Meredith tells her youngest, no hats at the table. The older boy wipes his milk mustache and grins at Luca, still wearing the Yankees cap. You like baseball? The boy asks. Luca only shrugs. He was always a quiet child. As a toddler, Luca never babbled. In fact, he didn't speak at all until he was four years old, and by then Lydia had been panicking for two years. She began the practice of reading to him well before she suspected any problem, only because she was a book lover who enjoyed reading aloud to her baby. She liked the idea that, even before he understood them, he might begin with the most beautiful words, that he'd build language from a foundation of literature and poetry. So she started with Marquez and Tolstoy and the Brontes, and eventually, as a result of her growing alarm, she read to him not in the typical way that parents read fairy tales and bedtime stories to their children, but in a frenetic and urgent manner intended to save him. When her fears bloomed and the habit became more concerted, she called upon Paz and Fuentes, Twain and Castellanos. She was fluent in English, too, it had been her minor in college, so sometimes she read Yates, rendering the lush green of Ireland in her Mexican accent. When Luca was an infant, she brought him to work tucked into a sling across her chest, and they read together between orders and customers and cleaning and stocking the shelves. Sometimes it was a long while between customers, so the two of them could submerge vividly into their stories. As he grew, he'd sit in a bouncy rocker or on a little play mat she set up for him in the corner behind the register. Eventually he was free to toddle around the shop, but when it was time to read, he always sat without prompting, cross-legged and silent, head angled to one side, as if creating a funnel of his ear for the words she'd give to him. She tried books with and without pictures. Colorful books, tactile books, poetry, photography, art. Children's books, cookbooks, the Bible. Her son ran his hands carefully along the glossy or filmy pages, but still he did not speak. 
Sometimes she read until her voice gave out, and other days she quickly grew depressed by the solitary sound of herself in the shop, but whenever she wanted to quit, Luca would push the day's book toward her insistently. He'd open it and press it back into her lap. The week before his fourth birthday, as they sat eating pozole at the kitchen table, Lydia lamented their boy's silence for the hundredth time. Sebastian balanced his spoon on the edge of his bowl and studied Luca's face. Luca studied him back. Maybe you don't speak Spanish, Sebastian said in Spanish. Luca, mimicking his father, balanced his spoon on his bowl, too. That's it, isn't it, Sebastian said. Qual idioma hablas, mijo? English. Are you a gabajo? Wait. Sebastian snapped his fingers. You're Haitian. No, Arabic. Tagalog. Lydia blinked slowly at her husband, but Luca smiled and tried to snap his fingers, too. Sebastian showed him how. Click click click. Lydia was alone in her desperation. She reasoned that Sebastian must be concerned, also, but his dogged optimism prevented him from revealing it. The doctors could find nothing wrong. Lydia felt like screaming. Instead, she patiently continued her efforts. Allende, Borges, Cervantes. She read so that the words she treasured might penetrate her son's solitude. And then one day, as she turned the last, unsatisfying page of a short novel by some pretentious young writer, Luca sat up and shook his head. He brushed his hands across his knees. Lydia closed the book and set it on the table beside the rocker where they were seated together. Luca picked it up and opened it to the first page. Let's read that one again, please, mommy, except this time let's make it a more agreeable ending. Perfectly. As if simply continuing a conversation they'd been having his whole life. Lydia was so startled she nearly hurled him across the room. She pushed him off her lap onto his feet. She turned him around and stared at him. What? Luca pressed his lips together. What did you say? She gripped his arms at his sides, too roughly perhaps, in her fear that she was coming unhinged. You spoke. Luca. You spoke. After a brief and petrifying pause, he nodded. What did you say? She whispered. I would like to read it again. She clapped both hands onto his cheeks, laughing and crying at once. I, oh my god. Luca. With a better ending. She crushed him into her chest and squeezed him there, and then she jumped up and took his hands and spun him in a circle. Say it again. Say something else. What shall I say? Exactly that, she'd said. My boy. He speaks. Lydia closed the shop early that day and took Luca home to perform for his father. She remembers it so clearly, but she doesn't trust that memory now, because the further she gets away from it, the more fanciful it seems. How could he have been so silent for all those years? And then, how could he have started talking like that, like a news anchor, like a college professor, in those beautiful, complex sentences all at once? It's impossible. A miracle of syntax. But now, in Carlos's turquoise house, after more than four years of talking beautifully in two languages, Luca's voice retreats, and the erstwhile silence returns. Lydia sees it happening, and there's nothing either of them can do to prevent it. It settles over him lightly at first, but soon, like a shellac, it hardens. By Wednesday morning, his muteness is pronounced. He responds to direct questions only with his face, his body. He perfects, once again, the art of the blank stare, and Lydia feels inside her some last, clinging boulder of sanity slipping. During these days of calcifying quiet, the dreadful wheel of Lydia's mind never slows, no matter how she tries to arrest it. She keeps herself steady in front of Luca, but there are times when she has to excuse herself quickly. She slips into the bathroom and opens the tap so the running water will disguise the muffled, wrenching noises of her grief. Her body is a cramp of misery, and the physical sensation is so elemental that it makes her feel like a wild animal, a mammal bereft of her pack. At night, as she lies next to Luca in Sebastian's godson's narrow bed, she directs her thoughts toward blankness. She does this exercise with authority, and her mind obeys. She repeats this over and over, don't think, don't think, don't think. And because of this self-control, she moves mercifully toward sleep. The flashbacks dump adrenaline into her bloodstream a hundred times a day, so her body is helpfully exhausted. Her eyelids drop. 
But then there's the moment after letting go, the momentary drift after casting off from the shore and before being caught by the current, and in that lapse, she plummets. Her limbs jerk, her heart clobbers, and her brain provides the memory once again of clacking gunfire, the odor of burning meat, the sixteen beautiful faces, scrubbed blank of their animation and turned vacant toward the sky. She sits up in bed, steadies her pitching breath, and tries not to wake Luca beside her. Every night this hurdle between wake and sleep. This one patch she can't cross. What kind of person does not bury her family? How could she leave them there in the backyard with their eyes and their mouths open, the blood cooling in their veins? Lydia has seen outspoken widows before, widows made brave by their anguish. She's watched them talk into the cameras, refusing to be silenced, placing blame where it belongs, scorning the violence of cowardly men. Naming names. Those women get gunned down at funerals. Don't think, don't think, don't think. On Wednesday, Carlos takes the day off work to drive the third church van to Mexico City. Lydia leaves Abuela's red overnight bag on the end of the bed where they've spent the last three nights. Inside are her heels and Luca's dress shoes. She's crammed everything else into the two backpacks, and that's all they will carry now. They will fly north from Mexico City, she's decided. It's their only option. They will go with only these two backpacks so they'll be nimble, so they won't have to stand gazing at the baggage carousel waiting for what they don't need anyway. Lydia doesn't know what, if anything, Carlos and Meredith have told the Indiana missionaries about their two extra passengers, but no one asks her any questions when they get in. The teenagers flash their gooey smiles and try to talk to her about their savior, but Lydia pretends not to speak English. She keeps one arm around Luca in the backseat and tries to act the way a normal person would act. She has difficulty remembering. The missionaries have duffel bags and fancy backpacks, and every single one of the girls wears her hair, curly or straight, coarse or silky, in two French braids. It's a missionary code, Lydia realizes, and she reaches up to touch her ponytail. The girl on the bench seat beside her notices. You want me to do yours. She smiles at Lydia. We all do each other's. Lydia hesitates, because the most impeccable French braids in the world wouldn't cause anyone to mistake her for a teenage missionary from Indiana. But even ludicrous armor is better than nothing. The girl mistakes Lydia's reticence for a language barrier, so she points to her own braids, the braids of the two girls in the row ahead, and then to Lydia's hair. You like. French braids. Lydia nods, pulling the ponytail holder out of her thick, black hair, and turning her back to the girl, who begins crawling her fingers along Lydia's scalp. It's hot in the van. When the girl is finished, she asks if anybody has a mirror. There are five teenage girls in this van, and not one of them is vain enough to carry a pocket mirror. Finally, one of the girls opens the camera app on her iPhone, switches it to selfie mode, and hands it to Lydia. They're so pretty on you. She says loudly, pointing to the braids. Me gusta. Single quote. Lydia looks at herself on the screen, twisting her head slightly to inspect the braids. She looks younger, she thinks, a little. She smiles and hands the phone back. Relief washes over Lydia when the singing starts, because the clamor of it fills the van and leaves no room for thinking. All the missionaries sing, and Carlos, too, loudly and cheerfully. You should nap, she says quietly into Luca's ear as they approach Axizacualco. He looks at her without blinking. I see traffic ahead. You should nap on the floor, here. Cozy. Lydia reaches beneath the bench seat and makes a space between two of the larger duffel bags. Luca slips into it and makes himself small. A stuffed backpack makes a pillow. He closes his eyes as the traffic begins to snag, and with it, the breath in Lydia's chest. The girls sing, Jesus, take the wheel, louder. Carlos catches Lydia's eye in the rearview mirror. He blinks once, because it's all the reassurance he can offer her. The line of cars in front of them has come to a stop. Theirs is the second of the three vans. Meredith is driving the one in front. In the road ahead, two young men, two teenage boys, really, towed R-15s. Perhaps it's precisely because that make of gun isn't quite as prolific or as sexy as the ubiquitous AK-47 here that Lydia finds it all the more terrifying. Ridiculous, she knows. One gun will make you as dead as another.
But there's something so utilitarian about the sleek, black R15, like it can't be bothered to put on a show. Sometimes the muzzle of one of those guns makes it inside the rolled down window of a waiting car, but generally they remain outside pointing skyward. The boys hold their weapons with both hands. Mostly the drivers don't flinch. Mostly the drivers defer to the boys' exaggerated egos, go along with their pretend swagger, because although no one expects the boys to open fire, they all know that the only road to genuine bravado runs through faking it first. It's only a matter of time, and no one wants to find out if today is the day these boys finally mean it. One by one, the drivers reach carefully into their wallets or purses or glove compartments to extract the mordidas. They hand over the money without complaint, and with genuine bendiciones, because these boys could be anyone, they could be the driver's brothers or children or grandchildren. Certainly, they are someone's. Carlos rolls and breaks, rolls and breaks. Luca keeps his eyes closed, and the missionaries sing. Lydia prays for the unlikely possibility that the boys on the road ahead are uncorrupted auto defenses. The singing missionaries are conducting their own brand of bravado, too, because even though the roadblock is exciting to them, even though their pastor, who's in the van behind, explained that roadblocks are quite common here and nothing to be alarmed by, that they're almost like passing through a toll gate, the girls know that toll booth operators in Indiana don't carry automatic weapons. Secretly, in the sinful hidden chambers of their hearts, most of these girls had looked forward to experiencing a roadblock, the exotic thrill of it, the wash of adrenaline, the stories they'd get to tell when they returned home to Indiana. But on the way down from Mexico City, they'd been waved right through without stopping. A guilty disappointment. Still, now that the moment is actually upon them, now that they can see the boys in the road ahead, close in age to themselves and brandishing unthinkable weapons, now that their inexperienced missionary nervous systems are flooding their bloodstreams with chaotic hormones, every one of those braided girls feels sick with fright. Some of them wish for the courage to witness to the boys, to save them by reminding them of Jesus. But mostly they just want to go home. One of the girls in the front seat, the one with the iPhone, tries to start another round of singing, but no one joins her and the effort falters after a couple of bars. Carlos rolls down his window. The boys stand on either side of the van ahead. Lydia can make out Meredith's silhouette in the driver's seat talking to the boy at her window. He must be the one in charge. Meredith gestures with a finger to the other two vans behind, and both boys look back. Lydia freezes in her seat. There's no way they can notice her here, in the backseat of the van's darkened interior. The boy Hefe on the driver's side of the van wears a plain blue ball cap with no insignia. He directs his colleague to investigate the other vans. The boy passes between the bumpers of the idling vehicles and approaches Carlos's window, the business end of his R15 tracing the dotted white lines of the road. Lydia glances down at Luca on the floor and sees that his eyes are wide open, as round as soup spoons. She shifts mildly in her seat so her legs mostly cover him. Where are you heading today? The boy asks Carlos, to make sure he tells the same story as Meredith. Only to the airport in Mexico City. Our visitors are flying home today. De donde eres? He says to the girl directly behind Carlos. They don't speak much Spanish, Carlos says in Spanish. They're from Indiana. The boy tips his head slightly inside the rolled-down window and surveys the silent, smiling girls. If he's susceptible to their pheromones, he's getting bombarded. His eyes land on Lydia, and he scrunches up his mouth. Who's the woman? One of our counselors. Estadunidense Tambien. The boy has a handsome, skeptical face. No, she's from here. She's one of ours. Why is she sitting in back? Lydia knows not to glance at Luca, but he's her only anchor left in the world, and her eyes want to go to him. She glues her gaze to the back of Carlos's seat. One of the girls was carsick, Carlos says. She went back there to help. Lydia lifts her hand and places it maternally, mechanically, between the shoulder blades of the girl beside her, the girl who braided her hair. Lydia rubs a circle on the girl's upper back, and the girl wonders how Lydia can tell she's scared. The girl is grateful for the small demonstration of comfort, and gives Lydia a watery smile. The boy at the window wraps the fingers of one hand over the edge of the door and speaks directly to Lydia. 
Como se llama Doña? Single quote. Mariana, Lydia lies. She's still sick, Mariana. He points to the girl beside her with his chin. She's feeling a little better, I think, Lydia says, still rubbing the girl's back. Not great. The unwitting girl supports the story by going quite pale in the face. She leans slightly forward and Lydia thinks perhaps she really is about to vomit. The boy lingers, his R15 hovering just outside the window, his eyes scrutinizing the lines of her face. He leans his head slightly inside the window again. Only girls in this van. No boys. He asks. On the floor beneath Mammy's feet, Luca's eyes gape and his mouth stays clamped shut. He doesn't even breathe. He's become an expert at hiding, perfectly still inside his body. All the boys are in the van behind, Carlos says. The boy taps on the open window with the flat of his hand. Carlos hands him a thin fold of bills. Ten cuidado, y que Dios te bendiga, Carlos says. The boy nods, folds the bills into the back pocket of his jeans, and trots past Lydia's window to the van behind. As he passes her window, Lydia sees the small, uncomplicated tattoo of a machete high on his neck behind his left ear. Confirmation, these are Javier's boys, Los Jardineros. There's the collective sound of breath being released into the van, but not Lydia's. She allows her eyes to travel briefly to Luca's little upturned face. The eyes are closed now, and she presses hers closed as well, for a moment of suspended relief. She can feel her pulse in her eyelids. Everybody good? Carlos asks in English, turning in his seat to look each of the girls in the face. They giggle their replies. Lydia nods, dropping her hand back to her lap. It feels like a very long time before the boy completes his interview at the window of the third van. He waves when he passes again to rejoin his compatriot at the front of the queue. Both boys let go of their guns long enough to sling them onto their backs so they can lug the large log of their makeshift gate off the roadway. They open just enough space to allow the cavalcade of missionary vans to pass through. A half hour later as they cross over El Puente Mezcala Solidaridad above El Rio Balsas, the girls gasp and point their cameras out the windows and into the lush green canyons below. When Luca climbs out from his nest to snuggle in beneath her arm, Lydia finally begins to breathe. Chapter 10. They've survived long enough to see the sun-clogged streets and throttling colors of Mexico City. That is no small thing. They are now four days and 236 miles removed from their doom. But it's more than that, Lydia knows. Because the anonymity of the capital represents the fragile passage to their future. From here, she can feel a measure of hope, it may be possible to disappear. Lydia has determined that the least harrowing of their options is to fly. Something like superstition caused her to delay selecting a destination, but she did research all the northern border cities and compile a short list of the leading possibilities. From west to east, Tijuana, Mexicali, Nogales, Ciudad Juarez, Nuevo Laredo. Any one of those airports will do, like a back porch screen door, hidden and intimate. From any one of those cities you can smell the fresh baked pies on the windowsills of El Norte. When Carlos rolls open the back door of that church passenger van and the braided girls and their crammed backpacks spill out onto the bright tarmac, Luca and Lydia follow. Beside the open back door of the van, Carlos grips Lydia's hands and whispers intensely into her ear. He's still with you, he says. I can feel it. He'll watch over you and your son. You will be okay. Lydia envies his certainty. They embrace without tears while the braided girls and their adolescent male counterparts from the other vans avert their scandalized faces. Meredith stands beside Luca, awkwardly trying to adjust his backpack for him while he subtly dodges her efforts. When Carlos lets go of Lydia, Meredith steps forward to hug her, too, but whatever warmth once existed between the two women, mostly because of their husband's bond, has been extinguished. Still, Lydia's gratitude is authentic. She looks Meredith in the eye. I know how problematic this was for you, she says. To undertake this risk for us. Meredith shakes her head, but as a gesture of repudiation it's feeble. I'm very grateful, Meredith. You probably saved our lives. Thank you.
God be with you, Meredith says, and then the swell of noisy jabber from the gathered teenagers comparing roadblock stories consumes all other conversation, and both women are relieved to part ways. The automatic terminal doors yawn open with a rumble as the first few teenage missionaries amble through. While Carlos and Meredith say their goodbyes to the Indiana pastor and wife team, Lydia and Luca duck beneath the shade of an awning and make their way toward the tram that will deliver them to the terminal for domestic flights. Luca has never been on a tram before. He tries not to feel interested in it but it's amazing the way the slick, glassy thing arrives soundlessly and disgorges its people onto the platform. Luca grips his mother's hand, and steps out of the way while the people and their luggage jostle past them. He watches his feet as he and his mother navigate the tiny gap between fixed and movable. Mommy pulls him onto the tram without resistance, and they're in the front car, so how can Luca help but press his hands and forehead against the angled glass? Any kid would feel a little thrill in his tummy, watching the increasing speed of the track slip beneath his feet and vanish. It's like a roller coaster, gliding silently above the crisscrossing cars and buses, the taxis and lampposts, the aprons of runway dotted with waiting aircrafts, and trucks with crazy staircases on their backs. A plane swoops down in front of them, huge in the window, and Luca springs back from the glass with a gasp. Mommy. He says. It's the first word he's spoken in three days, and he immediately regrets the sound of it, the plain, disloyal happiness of it. Mommy smiles at him, but it's not a regular smile, and there's no mistaking the endeavor of it for actual joy. So why isn't he broken like that? What's wrong with him, that he can behave so normally? Mommy runs her fingers across the top of his head and he pushes his face back toward the glass. He watches the tram swallow the track beneath them. Inside the terminal, the mechanical hum of air conditioning is like a sheen behind all the other noises, a little girl holds her mother's hand and rolls her dog-shaped suitcase behind her by the leash, a man shouts into his cell phone in a throaty, unfamiliar language, a woman clacks hurriedly along on her angry heels. There is the smell of lemon and freon. Luca follows mommy to a little kiosk with a screen on it, and he watches while she clicks around on there for a few minutes. Then he thinks he shouldn't be watching her, but he should be watching other people, to make sure nobody's noticing them, so he turns and looks, and no one is watching them except that little girl with the dog-shaped suitcase. She's standing in line with her mother, or rather sitting on the back of her suitcase. When her mother moves forward, she pushes with her feet to keep up. Luca would like a suitcase like that. We can't book from here. Mommy interrupts his thoughts. It won't let you buy a same-day ticket. We have to get in line. Mommy picks up her backpack, which she'd set down on top of her feet, and Luca follows her over to get in line. He's happy to have a closer look at the dog suitcase, which, he can now see, also has a furry tail and ears. The girl sees him admiring it and she smiles. She's about the same age as Luca, maybe a year younger. You can pet him if you want to, she says. He doesn't bite. Luca takes a step back and hides his face behind Mommy. But then a moment later, he reaches out and brushes the tip of the dog's tail with his fingers. The girl laughs and then her mother says, let's go, Naya, and the girl waves, pushing with her sneakers, all the way up to the ticket counter. Luca and Mommy are next, and soon they're standing in front of a lady wearing a blue suit and a red silk scarf. Her round face is repeated in miniature on the plastic name tag hanging from her neck. She smiles at Luca. Hello, little jet setter. She says to him. First time flying. He looks up at mommy, and she nods, so he nods, too. Flying. He can't believe they're going to fly. He's not sure he wants to fly, but it's possible he really wants to fly. It's hard to tell. We're taking a little spontaneous vacation, mommy says to the ticket agent. The woman's hands are poised over her keyboard. Okay. Where to? I was thinking of Nuevo Laredo. The woman clacks around on her keyboard at a comical speed. She can't really be typing that fast, Luca thinks. She's pretending. She frowns. No flights until Friday. Are you hoping to leave today? Yes. Mommy leans her elbows up on the ticket counter. What about Ciudad Juarez? Clack clack clack. Yes, that would work, there's a 3 o'clock flight, stopping over in Guadalajara. Arrives in Juarez at 7.04 p.m. Mommy bites her lip. 
Nothing direct. Clack clack. There's a non-stop at 11.10 tomorrow morning. Mommy shakes her head. Okay, let's try Tijuana. This time the woman covers up the sound of her typing with chatter. She doesn't even look at the screen or at her hands. They move in front of her as if they're two animals, independent of her body. She turns her round face toward Mommy. Fun town. Ever been there? Mommy shakes her head. I used to fly. I was a flight attendant before I had the babies. Did the Tijuana route, so once in a while we got to stay overnight. She winks at Luca. Hope you like to party. Luca digs his fingernails into the palms of his hands to stop himself from thinking about parties, and the woman returns her round face and her round eyes to the screen in front of her. There's a direct flight to Tijuana at 3.27 p.m. Gets in at 5.13 p.m. They're two hours behind us. Perfect, mommy says. Two seats. Sure. And when do you want to return? Mommy looks down at her gold sneakers against the terrazzo floor. Luca doesn't understand her hesitation, that she's attempting to perform an algorithm of calamity in her mind. Lydia knows they have exactly 226,243 pesos left because she counted it on the floor in Carlos's bathroom in Chilpancinga. They've already spent more than 8,000 pesos on the hotel and supplies and bus tickets. She also has her mother's purse with a bank card she's afraid to use. Abuela had a savings account, and however much there is, they're going to need it. They'll have to pay a coyote when they get to the border, and if they're lucky, there will be a small sum left over to sustain them until she figures out what's next. They can scarcely afford to throw money away on a return airplane ticket they're not going to use. But neither can they afford to tell this friendly woman, this stranger, this potential halkin, that they're traveling only one way. Luca squeezes Mammy's hand. Returning next week, same day, she says. Very good, the woman says brightly, but Luca worries that her smile has turned a little stale. We can get you on a return flight, let's see, how about 12.55 p.m. Gets in here at 6.28 p.m., non-stop. Mommy nods. Good, yes, good. What's the price? The woman adjusts her red scarf as she scrolls down. Her fingernails are square and they're painted the color of concrete. They click when she taps on the screen. 3,610 pesos each. Mommy nods again, and swings her backpack around to balance it on her knee. She takes out her wallet from the side pocket while the woman continues clacking on the keyboard. I can pay in cash. Yes, of course, the woman says. I just need photo ID. Mommy has separated their money into various places, keeping around 10,000 pesos in the wallet. Luca watches while she counts out the bills for the tickets, seven pink, two orange, one blue. She stacks the notes on the counter, and the woman picks them up to begin counting. Mommy digs into the sleeve of the wallet then and retrieves her voter ID card, which makes a little snap when she places it on the counter. The ticket agent sets the money across her keyboard and picks up Mammy's ID. She holds it in one hand and types with the other. Thank you. She hands the card back to Mommy and looks at Luca. And what about you? She smiles. Did you bring your voter registration card? Luca wags his head. He obviously can't vote. She returns her attention to Mommy. So I just need a birth certificate or some documentation to verify legal custody. Of my son? Mommy asks. Yes. Mommy shakes her head, and the skin around her eyes flushes pink. Luca thinks she might cry. I don't have, she says. I don't have that. Oh. The woman clasps her hands together and leans back from her keyboard. I'm afraid he can't fly without it. Surely you can make an exception. He's obviously my son. Luca nods. I'm sorry, the ticket agent says. It's not our policy, it's the law. Every airline is the same. She's needing the colorful money back into its stack. She's handing the stack back to mommy, but mommy won't take it so she sets it on the counter between them. Please, mommy says, dropping her voice low and leaning in. Please, we are desperate. We have to get out of the city. This is the only way, please. Senora, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. 
You'll have to visit the Oficina Central del Registro Civil and request a copy of the birth certificate or you won't be able to fly. There's nothing I can do. Even if I could give you a ticket, you wouldn't make it past security. Mommy snatches the money and jams it into the back pocket of her jeans along with her ID. Her face is still changing colors, and now it looks whitened, washed out. I'm sorry, the woman says again, but Mommy has already turned to go. Luca follows and he doesn't ask where they're going, and soon they're on the metro. When they emerge at Isabel La Catolica station, Luca's conflicted feelings only intensify, because being in Mexico City is a bona fide adventure. Everything is different here from Acapulco, and Luca struggles to take in all the color, the whipping flags, the fruit vendors, the Baroque colonial buildings sitting shoulder to shoulder with their blocky modern neighbors. Music spills from wrought iron balconies, vendors hawk rows of luminous refrescos, and everywhere there is art, art, art. Murals, paintings, sculptures, graffiti. On one street corner, a colorful statue of tall Jesus, that's how Luca thinks of it because it's small for a statue but very tall for an adult human, stands with one fold of his bright green robe slung jauntily over his arm. Beneath this genuine onslaught of sensory stimulation, Luca manages to temporarily bury his guilt. His mouth hangs slightly open as he walks beside Mommy, gulping in the scenery. At a stall, Mommy buys tamales and a bag of cut cucumbers. It's almost two o'clock, and Luke is hungry, so they sit beneath an umbrella to eat. He considers how strange it is that certain things haven't changed. The salted cucumbers taste just as they did before everyone died. His knuckles haven't changed. His fingernails. The width of Mammy's shoulders. He chews without speaking. When their lunch is finished, Mommy takes him to a square, concrete building with a statue of naked dancers in front, where the man behind the counter tells them that in order to get a copy of Luca's birth certificate, they have to go to the registration office in the state where he was born. Was he born in Mexico City? No. In the state of Mexico? No, Guerrero. Can't help you, he says. There's a sandwich sitting on his side of the counter, and he seems eager to get back to it. On the sidewalk outside, Luca and Mommy take a little break from moving so she can think. They squat down together in the shade of that square building. They lean against the wall, and after a few moments, Mommy stands up. Okay, she says, and her face has returned to its normal hue, and her hands are firm at her sides. She holds them in fists. Okay. She says it again. Next they walk a few blocks to a huge brick building with once white stonework that's been discolored by time and weather and pollution. It has a gargantuan, arched wooden door, studded with massive golden buttons. Luca stares up and feels almost frightened by the scale of it ten times taller than he is. But Mommy is holding his hand, and together they pass beneath the bright purple flowers of the jacaranda trees. They walk through a smaller door cut into the gigantic door and enter the cool hush of the interior. It's the Biblioteca Miguel Lerdo de Tejada, and even though this library specializes in economics, it's so absurdly beautiful that it was Lydia's favorite place to study when she was a literature and English student in college. It's also the place where she and Sebastian first met, mistaking each other for economics majors. As their romance evolved, they developed a mutual joke that they'd both been in the market for a more economically reliable mate than the one they accidentally ended up with. With the exception of the new computers on the tables along the back wall, the library's solid principle looks exactly as Lydia remembers it. The ceilings are cathedral high, the cavernous space is saturated with natural light from above, and the walls are completely wrapped by the color-drenched murals of Lottie. Sebastian had once warned Lydia that she'd fail her exams if she persisted in doing her studying here, she squandered most of her time staring at those walls. She's long dreamed of bringing Luca to see this astonishing place, but she never imagined it would happen like this. She always thought she'd tell him the stories, but now that they're here, with the brutal weight of their departure from real life, she finds herself unable to call forth the memories onto her lips, Sebastian sneaking her contraband snacks while she studied for her finals. Sebastian once making her laugh so hard the librarian asked them to leave. Sebastian slumped in that study Carl right over there, struggling through El Laberinto de la Soledad only because he knew it was her father's favorite, and he wanted to know some of the same things her father knew, to get to know him.
How monumental Lydia's grief had been when her father died. It terrifies her now, to think of it, how deeply formative that single loss was in her earlier life. Now there are sixteen more. When she thinks of this, she feels as tatty as a scrap of lace, defined not so much by what she's made of but more by the shapes of what's missing. She can't even imagine how this loss will shape the person Luca becomes. They need to do a funeral ceremony as soon as they're safe. Luca will need a ritual, a method of fashioning his grief into a thing he can exert some small control over. The sweep of it bows over her, but she returns to her mantra, don't think, don't think, don't think. She watches her son assess the magnitude of this place, the way his head tips back and his eyes swoop over every surface, the way he tries to chase the accidental smile from his face. It's okay, Miho, go look, she says. But Luca clings only more tightly to her hand. Okay, then let's sit. She steers him to an empty computer table and they sit. When the idea first occurred to her as she squatted in the shade of the Oficina Central del Registro Civil, it occurred as camouflage, they could disguise themselves as migrants. But now that she's sitting in this quiet library with her son and their stuffed backpacks, like a thunderclap, Lydia understands that it's not a disguise at all. She and Luca are actual migrants. That is what they are. And that simple fact, among all the other severe new realities of her life, knocks the breath clean out of her lungs. All her life she's pitied those poor people. She's donated money. She's wondered with the sort of detached fascination of the comfortable elite how dire the conditions of their lives must be wherever they come from, that this is the better option. That these people would leave their homes, their cultures, their families, even their languages, and venture into tremendous peril, risking their very lives, all for the chance to get to the dream of some faraway country that doesn't even want them. Lydia sits back in her chair and looks at her boy, who's staring at a reclining fuchsia figure hovering on the wall above his head. My grant. She can't make the word fit him. But that's what they are now. This is how it happens. They're not the first to go, Acapulco is emptying of its people. How many of her neighbors have fled in the last year? How many have disappeared? After all those years of watching it happen elsewhere, of indulging their remote pity, of shaking their heads as the stream of migrants flowed past them at a distance, from south to north. Acapulco has joined the procession, she realizes. No one can stay in a brutal, blood-stained place. Lydia pulls her eyes away from Luca and focuses on the screen in front of her. Her search now is born not only of panic, but of true desperation. There are no other options left for them. She opens a browser and finds the route that brings La Bastilla closest to Mexico City. She lifts the headphones from their hook beside the computer and plugs them in. She checks YouTube first, and it's all horrible. So much more horrible than she even imagined. But it's better to know, to be prepared. She makes herself watch, and she pays no mind to the quickening of her breath or the racing of her pulse while she absorbs the stories. The possible manners of death available on La Bastilla are all gruesome, you can be crushed between two moving cars when the train rounds a bend. You can fall asleep, roll off the edge, get sucked beneath the wheels, have your legs sliced off. When that happens, if the migrant isn't killed instantly, he usually bleeds to death in a remote corner of some farmer's field before anyone finds him. And finally, there's the ubiquity of ordinary human violence, you can die by beating or stabbing or shooting. Robbery is a foregone conclusion. Mass abductions for ransom are commonplace. Often, kidnappers torture their victims to help persuade their families to pay. On the trains, a uniform seldom represents what it purports to represent. Half the people pretending to be migrants are coyotes or train engineers or police or la migra are working for the cartel. Everybody's on the take. Here's a Guatemalan man, 22 years old, who lost both legs three days before his interview. He's missing a front tooth as well. Somebody told me, before we got on the train, he says, if you fall, if you see your arm or your leg getting sucked under there, you have a split second to decide whether or not to put your head in there too. The young man blinks into the camera. I made the wrong choice, he says. When she's seen enough of the horror stories, Lydia bows her head for a moment to assess her state of mind. Because despite everything she's just seen, she also knows that, like all criminal enterprises in Mexico, La Bastilla is controlled by the cartels. 
or rather, by a specific cartel, the mother of all cartels, an organization so nightmarish that people won't utter its name, and in this moment that's the key factor for Lydia. Because that cartel is not Los Jardineros. She knows from Sebastian's research that Javier's influence now extends well beyond the borders of Guerrero, that he has established alliances with cartels that stretch the length of Mexico. That he controls plazas as far away as Coahuila along the Texas border. But if that reach extends to La Bastilla, she knows it must be limited there. Javier is not the jefe on the trains. So her choice, then, is whether to escape one monster by running into the den of another. Half a million people survive this journey every year, she tells herself. This will provide anonymity. No one will be looking for them on La Bastilla. Javier would never imagine her traveling this way, she can scarcely imagine it herself. So perhaps she and Luca will have the same chance as anybody else at surviving the beast. Perhaps their chances will be better, in fact, because they have the means to prepare for the journey, and they've already proven themselves to be survivors. So it comes down to this, her fears of La Bastilla, the prevalence of violence, kidnapping, death, those fears feel theoretical. They don't measure up against her new blood-cold fear of Javier, the memory of her mother's green-tiled shower, that Sicario eating Sebastian's chicken drumsticks as he stepped among the corpses of her family. Lydia decides that her plan, though shocking, is sound. She opens a clean browser to carefully research the route. In Mexico City, it looks like migrants gather at Lec area, within the limits of the city's northern sprawl. From there, the line travels a hundred miles north before diverging in three separate directions. There's a commuter train to Lec area not far from here, in Buena Vista. Lydia's stomach does an acrobatic tumble. This is madness, she says out loud. Lucas snaps his eyes at her but utters nothing. She replaces the headphones on their hook beside the computer and stands up to gather their things. No. She heaves her backpack onto her shoulders, and gestures for Luca to follow. No, she says again. Because she, the sensible, bookstore-owning, devoted mother and wife Lydia, the one from last week, is fighting with this new Lydia, the deranged Lydia, the one who thinks dragging her eight-year-old son onto the top of a moving freight train is a good idea. Neither Lydia has a better plan. No, she says one last time. And then they're back outside in the riotous sunshine with nothing left to do. In the market at La Chutadela, Lydia buys a blanket and four canvas belts. They set out to find the commuter train to Lec area. Chapter 11. The commuter rail station is located at one end of a vast shopping mall with a Sephora and a Panda Express and even an ice rink. The street in front is crowded with pink taxis and red buses. The shoppers and vendors wear fancier clothes than you usually see in Acapulco. Everyone has clean sneakers. At the bookstore window, Lydia pauses briefly to gaze at the tiered rainbow of gleaming books on display, the season's new releases, some of which are featured in her own window at home. She thinks of the driver who makes her deliveries stopping outside her shop, tenting his hands above his eyes while he peers through the grate and darkened glass. She thinks of her two part-time employees, the spectacled Kiki, who can never be trusted to stock shelves because she stops to read every book that passes through her hands, and Gloria, who's never read a grown-up book in her life but has great taste in children's literature, and is a diligent worker. She wonders how they'll manage now, without the bookshop income both their families rely on. Lydia thinks of her stockroom gathering dust, her undelivered parcels. When she steps back from the bookstore window, her hand leaves a ghost print on the glass. Lydia and Luca have to wait in line at the Banamex on the third floor, and a girl nearby is hawking postcards from a large canvas bag. The Zocalo at sunset, the Palacio de Bellas Arts lit up like Christmas. Lydia thinks about buying one and addressing it to Javier. What would she write there in the blank space? Would she appeal to his abandoned humanity, acknowledge his weird condolences, plead for their lives? Would she make some futile attempt to articulate her hatred and grief? For all her love of words, at times they're entirely insufficient. In the bottom of her backpack, folded carefully into a compartment she hasn't unzipped since they left Acapulco, is her mother's purse. Inside that purse, tucked into a slit in her wallet, is her mother's bank card. Lydia knows her mother's pin because she's the one who helped set it up, who taught her how to use it. 
The small, brown handbag is the same one her mother has carried for literally as long as Lydia can remember. The leather is thick and was stiff when Lydia was younger, but it's grown soft from years of use. The clasp broke long ago, so it's only the flap folded over the opening that keeps whatever's inside from falling out. Lydia does not pause to reminisce. She leans her backpack against the glass wall beside her and opens her mother's purse. Luca doesn't watch. He stands beside her picking at the corner of a large sticker affixed to the glass, advertising low-interest loans. Not long ago Lydia would have corrected this behavior, would have told her son that someone paid good money for that sticker and it's not his to pick from the window. Not now. She stares into her mother's purse. There's a particular smell, or rather a conglomeration of smells. It assails her, even here, between McDonald's and the crepe factory. The aroma evokes immediate memories that Lydia refuses to indulge. It's old leather and Kleenex, both used and unused, and the cinnamon gum her mother always buys, and the black licorice drops she likes, wrapped in a small white paper bag, and a miniature tube of hand lotion with apricot extract, and the clean, baby-like smell of her pressed powder compact, all combined into the intimate, unmistakable scent of Lydia's childhood. Mama. Luca smells it too. He mouths her name without turning his face away from the glass, abuela, and renews his attack on the sticker. Lydia breathes through her mouth. When it's their turn she stands at the ATM with the detritus of her life spilling out of the backpack around her feet. A young woman using the adjacent ATM is careful not to look at them. Lydia is embarrassed by the woman's caution. In addition to fending off her memories, Lydia is also frightened. She worries that this single electronic transaction will be like shooting up a flare to mark her location. Her hand trembles as she jams her mother's ATM card into the machine and punches in the code. The machine beeps loudly and spits the card back out. Me level a chingada. She says. Luca turns to look at her. It's fine, she lies. And inserts the card into the machine a second time. She takes greater care now, watches the way her fingers shake as she punches in the code. She knows it. It's Luca's birthday. It has to work. It works. Gracias a Dios. It's unusual in a culture where adult children take care of their aging parents that Lydia's mother even had a savings account. Indeed, owning an ATM card made of whale is something of an anomaly among her peers, even in a robust urban economy like Acapulco's, even among Mexico's solid and growing middle class. But then, Lydia's mother had always been something of an anomaly. She'd always done things a little out of step with her generation. She refused the first two boys who asked to marry her, for example. And much to her mother's consternation, when she finally did deign to get married, well past her prime at the age of 24, she did not immediately quit her job as a bookkeeper at a local hospital but instead returned to school to further her education. She was already three years a missus when she was certified as a public accountant and got a job working for the city. Her parents and peers sometimes raised their eyebrows at Abuela's choices, but Lydia's father loved being married to a trailblazer, even after their two daughters were born and he had to do more diaper changing than he meant to sign up for. So Lydia grew up with a mother who emphasized the importance of being independent and saving for the future. A mother who had loaned her the money to open her bookstore. Though Lydia had been grateful, she'd never imagined that her mother's eccentricity might one day save her life. The number pops up on the screen in front of her, and it's more money than Lydia had dared to hope for, 212,871 pesos, more than $10,000. Lydia breathes a fragment that might just be relief, but feels like joy. This is a lot of money. The women in Abuela's gardening club would be scandalized by the amount. Lydia retracts the card and replaces it reverently in her mother's purse without making a withdrawal. It's safer to leave it in the bank until they need it. If money could solve all their problems, she and Luca would be saved. And yet there's still no way for them to buy their way out of Mexico City, and now, with this single electronic transaction, she knows she may have dropped a pin on Javier's map. She'd known that the vastness of Mexico City would be her only chance to make this transaction without immediately revealing themselves, and now that she's done it they have to move. They order tacos at the food court, and Luca asks for extra sour cream, which Lydia finds remarkably comforting. 
They eat them on the 6.32 p.m. commuter train to Lek area. It's still light out, with long shadows reclining across the pavements, by the time Luca and Mommy arrive at the address she found at the library, but the doors of the Casa del Migrant are locked and the windows are darkened. Mommy shields her eyes against the glass, and Luca follows suit. He can see nothing inside. A woman walks past them on the sidewalk pulling a rolling metal cart full of groceries. Esta cerrado, she says. Closed. Mommy turns to look at her. For the night. No, closed for good. A few months ago. The neighbors complained. It was too many problems for the community. Look here. The lady lets go of her cart and opens the metal mailbox hanging beside the door. She draws out a pamphlet and hands it to Lydia. Amigo migrant, Lydia reads aloud. The neighbors of Lecaria invite you to continue your journey to the Casa del Migrant in its new location at Huehuetoca. Lydia snorts. How hospitable of them. The lady throws her hands up in the air. It's not the fault of the migrants, you poor people, but where you go, the problems follow. She returns to her cart, tips it onto its wheels. But wait, Lydia says, where is Huehuetoca? The woman starts walking. North, she says, waving back over her shoulder. Lydia looks at Luca, who only shrugs. He could tell her that Huehuetoca is about 17 miles away, because he saw it on the map when Mommy was looking up Lecaria on the computer in the library, but his tongue lacks the capacity to formulate the words Mommy, it's too far to walk tonight, so he follows his mother the wrong way down the street for three blocks, back toward the train station and the setting sun, before she spots a group of men wearing backpacks and baseball caps. Luca can tell her anxiety is growing with the length of their shadows. Soon it will be dark. The men turn to look at them as they approach, and they greet Mommy immediately. Saludos, Senora. Como va? Good, thank you. Can you tell us how to get to Huehuetoca? She asks. We just found this message, the migrant shelter is closed. Yes, it's closed. It's a hike up there to that other place, Senora, the youngest man says. There's something sour on his breath. How far? A distance. It has to be 10, 15 miles from here. Wow. The men all nod. One has a toothpick in his mouth. He's leaning on a low wall. Is there a bus? No bus, but you can take the train from here to the end of the line at Quautit Lawn. That gets you a little closer. You can walk from there, maybe four or five hours. Only the youngest man talks. The other two watch the conversation like it's a tennis match. Luca watches them watch the tennis. That's too far tonight, Mommy says. You can camp with us. The man grins. Go in the morning, Senora. His body moves like a noodle, and the offer feels abrupt and dubious. Luca steps in between the men and his mother, not from any real sense of martyrdom, but because he's observed that, on occasion, the presence of children serves to inhibit people's bad behavior. He tugs on Mammy's hand, and together they get moving. At Lecaria Station once again, they take the next northern bound train to the end of the line at Quautit Lawn, where Mommy splurges on a cheap motel room. She tells Luca it's their last stay in a hotel for a very long time. In the morning, she wakes him at first light, and they set out north toward Huehuetoca, not necessarily because they need to find the migrant shelter, but because they need to find the migrants. Quautit Lawn is the last stop on the commuter railway line, but the tracks continue north. A new million-dollar fence separates the street from the tracks, it's part of the Mexican government's Programa Frontera Sur, which is funded largely by the United States, and aims to clear migrants from the trains. Migrants can't jump onto the trains here because the fence keeps them out, but about a mile north of the station that fence ends abruptly, so Luca and Lydia walk up the grassy little berm and stay beside the tracks. Luca doesn't understand why they have to walk. He knows they have enough money to buy a ticket. He'd like to ask mommy about it but his voice stays sealed inside. He hops from tie to tie on the outside of the track, and Lydia watches their backs to make sure there's no train coming. He still has the ticket card from yesterday in his pocket, the one they bought from Lecaria to Quautit Lawn. Mommy trusted him to be in charge of his own ticket, even though they had to swipe it twice, once getting on the train and then again getting off. He digs into his pocket now and pulls out the card. He tugs on Mammy's sleeve, and she turns to look at him. 
He waves the card at her, and she understands what he wants to know, because she understands everything. You can't buy tickets for these trains, she explains. That was the last stop. Luca frowns, and a small groove appears in his forehead. He tilts his head up and squints. He can see the tracks. He crawls his fingers upward through the air, tracing the railway lines he can see on the map in his memory. Those tracks beneath your feet keep going and going, Mommy confirms. All the way to El Norte. Single quote. Luca's gaze expands and he can nearly feel the tracks beneath him, trundling through the miles ahead, stretching beneath the daytime and nighttime skies, all the way to Texas. So then why can't they buy a ticket? The trains that run north from here are only for cargo, Mommy says. Not for people. With effort, Luca manages a single word. Why? She shakes her head. I don't know, Amorcito. It seems so simple when he asks it. Why? Didn't there used to be passenger trains in Mexico, along with the freights? Lydia has a vague childhood memory of trains ferrying more than just cargo across the landscape. She remembers people standing on platforms holding luggage, the cheerful peal of a steam whistle. But the railways stopped carrying passengers a lifetime ago, and Lydia searches her gauzy memories, but it's no use. She can't remember why, and it doesn't matter anyway. Beside her, Luca continues stepping from tie to tie. He watches the toe of his blue sneakers press against the wood. Sometimes he asks why only because he's programmed to ask it, she realizes. He doesn't really care that she doesn't have an answer, as long as she gives him something. Some people ride the trains anyway, she says, glancing sideways at him. Even without a ticket, even without seats. Luca looks up from his feet and studies her face. He says nothing, but his eyes are round. They climb on top, she says. Can you imagine that? Luca cannot. Lydia feels encouraged by their progress. It feels good to grow the distance between Javier and them, but it's also frightening to venture out from the vastness of Mexico City and back into the modest districts, where Lydia can feel the urban fog of invisibility begin to dissipate. It's hard to feel inconspicuous when you're a stranger in a small place. So Lydia keeps her head down and stays vigilant. They walk quickly, and Luca doesn't complain even when they pass a little bike repair shop and he longs to grab the handlebars of a bike leaning against the wall outside. It's green with a golden bell, and Luca thinks it's small enough for him. But they keep walking, and less than an hour later they happen upon a group of young migrants beside the tracks. They are all men, perhaps two dozen of them, gathered in a clearing behind a warehouse, just where the urban sprawl begins to diminish and the landscape begins to prickle and pop. A place between places. Most of the migrants have backpacks and grim faces. They're a thousand miles into their journeys already, weeks from Tegucigalpa or San Salvador or the mountains of Guatemala. They're from cities or villages or El Campo. Some speak the languages of Cayache or Ixal or Mam or Nahuatl. Luca likes to listen to the foreign sounds, the peaks and rolls of the words he doesn't understand. He likes the way voices sound the same in every language, the way, if you train your ear to listen just outside the words, to only the shifting inflections, you can attach your own meaning to the sounds. Many of the men speak English, too. But here, as they wait for the northbound train outside Mexico City, they all speak Spanish. Most are Catholic and have placed their lives in God's hands, they call on him with frequency and conviction. They invoke the blessings of his son and all the saints. It's been two days since the last train, and the men have grown weary of waiting. Nearby, a woman sells food from a cart. She takes tortillas from one pail and fills them with beans from a second pail. She serves them without smiling or speaking. Luca and Mommy buy breakfast and find a shady place in a bald spot beneath a tree. Mommy flings out the brightly colored blanket she bought at La Chutadela after they left the library, and they sit. Nearby, two young men are reclining with their heads on their backpacks. One leans up on his elbow facing them. Buen dia, hermana, y que Dios la bendiga en su camino, he greets them. Thank you, Lydia says. And may God bless you on your travels as well. He leans back with his head on his pack while Luca and Mommy eat. Then he says, you seem fresh on your journey. You have strong energy. My brother and I have already been traveling for 14 days. 
Where did you begin? She asks. Honduras. My name is Nando. Hello, Nando, she says, without offering a name in return. He doesn't ask. Nando, can I ask you something? He props up again on his elbow. Where is everyone? She asks. Ha. Huh. Where are all the migrants? I expected there would be so many people here, waiting for the trains. Well, with the migrant shelter gone from Lek area and now the new fences, I guess a lot of migrants don't stop here anymore. That's why it's only young men here now, Hermana, he says. The athletes. Los Olimpicos. His brother says without raising his head or opening his eyes. The brother is skinny except for his little pot belly, and Luca doesn't think he looks much like an Olympian at all. His hat covers his face from the sun. Really? The fence keeps people from stopping. Lydia asks. It seems such an unlikely deterrent. Not only this fence, he says. All the fences at all the train stations. They're everywhere. The man shrugs. Most places now, at least in the south. And all those expensive fences, they're just to stop people from riding the trains. Yeah, they're supposed to be for safety, he says. But, see, they put the fence only where the train stops. He gestures back down the tracks, the way they came, and Lydia remembers the spot where the metal caging fell away and the track opened up. La Migra had trucks there, watching the parade of foot traffic passing by. By the time the train arrives here, it's already picking up speed. So you have to jump on while it's moving. Luca gasps, causing Lydia and Nando both to look over at him, so he returns his attention to his stuffed tortilla. Haven't you seen the government signs attached to the fences? Safety first. Nando laughs. You going to jump onto a moving train, Hermana? Maybe not. Lydia frowns. Or maybe. The man draws his legs in and crosses them, looking at Luca. What about you, Chiquito? You going to jump onto La Bastilla? Like a cowboy riding a bull at the rodeo. Luca's never seen a rodeo, and he's not even sure if he's seen a real-life cowboy. He shrugs. So that's it. They put up some fences, and just like that people stop coming. Who said they stopped coming? From my country, there are more people than ever, more and more all the time. So then if they're not on the train, where are they? Nando shrugs. Most go with coyotes now, all the way from my country. One safe house to the next, to the next. A whole network all the way to El Norte. But it's expensive, and sometimes those coyotes are no better than lost criminals. So it's the people who can't afford that passage or who don't trust the coyotes, they come to La Bastilla. And when they get here, and find the fence. What do they do if they can't get on the train? Nando plucks a blade of dry grass and hangs it from the corner of his mouth. I, Hermanita Mia, I hate to tell you, he says. They are walking. Lydia is dubious. They walk all the way to Estados Unidos from Honduras. Luca makes some calculations in his head. Even if these Hondureños go only to the southernmost point on the northern border, their total journey must be close to 1600 miles. He wonders if it's really possible for a human being to walk that far. Unless La Migra gets to them first and sends them back, Nando says. Then they get some rest. An air-conditioned bus in the wrong direction. Then they start all over from scratch. Lydia takes the last bite of her food. But you're not worried about La Migra. She wipes crumbs from the corners of her mouth. Nah. He smiles. You don't have to outrun La Migra. You only have to be faster than your brother. I got it covered. In your dreams, Gordo, the brother says. What about you, Hermana? And your son? What will you do if La Migra comes? Now it's Lydia's turn to lie back on her pack. Technically, La Migra can't send them anywhere, because they're Mexican, and unlike Nando and many of the other migrants, they're traveling in their own country, they can't be deported. But Lydia knows that technicality won't help them at all if La Migra here happens to work for Los Jardineros. She shudders. We'll manage, she says. Nando nods and smiles encouragingly at Luca. Of course you will, he says. At length the migrants sitting or lying on the rails stand up and make the announcement to the others, they can feel reverberations in the track. The train is coming. Luca goes and puts his hand on the rail, but feels nothing. 
It stopped down the line somewhere, Chiquito, Nando says. It'll be along shortly. When a few minutes have passed, another man calls Luca over. Feel now, he says, and Luca obeys, placing his hand on the hot metal. He can feel the energy of the train percussing through the waiting steel. He draws his hand instinctively in, and backs away from the rails to return to Mammy's side. In the clearing, there's a flurry of activity among the migrants, who will now attempt to board. Everyone gathers their belongings and scatters across the area. They lay claim to their own patches of ground, spreading out giving one another space to run alongside the train. They watch also for La Migra, which tends to time its raids to coincide with the train's arrival. After two days of undercover waiting, more migrants are suddenly visible, emerging from their hiding places to attempt the perilous flying start. Lydia quickly rolls up the blanket and straps it to the bottom of her pack. Then she turns to make the straps on Luca's shoulders as tight as possible. The tails hang down his legs. She ties them in a knot and tucks the loose ends into his waistband. She shifts her weight nervously from foot to foot. You want to do this, Miho? She asks him. She hopes he'll say no. She hopes he says, Mommy, this is crazy, I don't want to die, I'm scared. But Luca just looks at her. He doesn't respond at all. Maybe we'll try, she says. Let's just watch first. We'll see what happens. She feels sick with dread. When the train rounds the distant bend and comes into view, when Lydia can look down the track at its approaching nose, it appears to advance in slow motion. We can do this, she says to herself. It's not going that fast. It's loud as it pulls into the clearing, she can feel the chug in her bones, in her sternum, and many of the men step into a trot alongside. It's a challenge of competing details, all equally important, and Lydia finds herself wrapped as she watches, trying to learn the techniques. You must match your speed to the train's speed, she sees, adjusting as you go. You must find the ideal point of access, a protrusion, a ladder, a spot with plenty of grip and some way to quickly get to the roof of the car. You must fully commit to your position once you've chosen it. You must defend it from other migrants whose urgency matches your own. Under no circumstances can you attempt to change course once you're underway. But you must also be mindful of tree limbs and other fixed hazards that threaten your track. You must pay close attention to what's ahead of you on the ground. You must take care not to step in a hole or trip over a rock while you run, not to stumble beneath the grinding wheels of the beast. You must never, ever forget the power of those churning, groaning, clattering, rumbling wheels. They shriek as a reminder. K. Dios los bendiga. Their new friend calls out as he leaves them and begins to run alongside the train. His brother trots along behind him, their pace more than a jog, less than a sprint. Nando runs, oscillating his head to both watch where he's going and assess the train cars behind for a good spot to climb on. He sees a ladder coming, two cars away. He slows down. One car away, he picks up his pace, glances in front of him, ducks beneath the slapping limb of a leafy shrub. He reaches for the ladder, wraps his fingers around the third rung. He takes two strides, three, four, with only his right hand on the ribs of La Bastilla, and then all at once he swings his full weight from that arm. He reaches his left arm up now as well, his hand in a brief panic until his fingers find their target and seize. Now his body is caught, suspended. This. This is the moment of paramount risk. The arms attached, clinging, hauling. The body draped like a flag. The legs hanging low, not yet clear of the wheels. Get up, the pot-bellied brother shouts. Get your feet up. He runs. And the instinct is to reach with those feet, to feel for what's beneath, to scrabble for purchase, to find some way to boost your weight from below. But no. You must curl. Bring the feet up. 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 Nando's feet find the bottom rung. His arms stretch up to the next and now he's climbing. Strong. Solid. A few more seconds, slap. A passing tree branch threatens his grasp, scratches his side, but now he's safe, he's over the lip, and he lies down on top, offering a hand over the edge toward his brother, who is running now, below. Lydia's eyes are wide and now the brothers are gone, the other migrants around them dwindling in numbers as they board, one by one, two by two. She crushes Luca's hand in her vise-like grip, but doesn't notice how hard she's squeezing it and he doesn't protest. 
They are rooted in place, unmoving, until all at once, every echo of the train is gone. They walk. There's a new reverence to having seen it with their own eyes, the unfeeling crush of the wheels along their rails, the men clinging to the exoskeleton like beetles on a window screen. In the backseat of Poppy's orange Volkswagen Beetle in Acapulco, Luca had his own little safety harness system. A bright blue cushion with monkeys on it that Poppy had unfolded and somehow permanently affixed to the seat. When he was little, Luca liked the monkeys, the cushioned straps that went over his head and then around his waist. He felt snug in there. But last summer he started begging to be rid of the thing. It was babyish, he insisted. He was big enough to wear a regular seat belt now, he said. Luca watches the last hip of the now silent train disappear around a distant bend, and cannot make sense of anything. Chapter 12. Even if they knew how long it might be before the next train, they cannot conceive of boarding La Bastia now that they've seen how it's done. Lydia thinks it over while they walk the seven miles to Huehuetoca. Would she put Luca on the ladder first? She would have to, there's no way she could jump on and leave him standing beneath the train without her. Could she run and climb on if he held onto her neck, his legs wrapped tightly around her waist? It seems physically impossible. Each time she tries to picture it, the fantasy ends the same way. Butchery. Luca distracts himself from how tired his legs are becoming by looking at the unusual sights. They pass a place that's full of every kind of statue, bears, lions, cowboys, dolphins, angels, crocodiles. They pass some men who are laying bricks to build a wall. They pass a woman who's vacuuming instead of sweeping her front step, which makes Luca squeeze Mammy's hand so she'll see it too. When they pass a school and Luca sees some kids playing football in the yard, he realizes it's Thursday, and that he should be in school in Acapulco, and Poppy should be picking him up this afternoon because Thursday is Poppy's day to pick him up, and sometimes Poppy buys him galettas and they eat them on the way home if he promises not to tell Mommy. After that, Luca doesn't look at the sights anymore. He watches his feet even though the sun feels hot on the back of his neck, and it takes them almost three hours to walk to Huehuetoca. When they arrive, they easily find the place they're looking for, as it sits neatly beside the railroad tracks behind a wind-whipped green fence. The Casa del Migrant is a gathering of tents and simple structures on a large, flat parcel of land that's saved from being beautiful only by the utilitarian character of its buildings. The wide road that separates the casa from the railroad tracks is of dirt and rubble, and it's empty as far as Luca can see. It's flat here for a long stretch, but in the distance, when he allows his eyes to follow the tracks to the horizon, Luca can see the landscape erupt upward on both sides. The clouds, puffy and brilliant, come down to meet it. There are bald fields all around and behind the casa, and on the far side of the tracks as well, but Luca can see that the soil has been tended, turned, striped with darker bands of earth where the farmers will sow their crops at the right season. There's a rich mineral scent on the wind. Luca and Lydia cross the parched road hand in hand and approach the chain-link fence that's been woven through with strips of green plastic so it's no longer transparent. Three strings of barbed wire cut through the air atop the fence, and two signs hang beneath it. The first is a cloudy, sunstruck blue, and has a painting of Jesus and Mary, so Luca expects it to be a blessing, but it says, Brother Migrant, we will watch over you and protect you from polaros, guides, and coyotes so that you may enjoy a happy stay here with our hospitality. Anyone found to be in transgression of these specifications will be handed over to the appropriate authorities. May God protect you on your journey. The second sign is much less flowery, a list of rules written in a plain black font, so long that its only decoration, a red banner at the very bottom, sits in direct contact with the dirt below, welcome, brother and sister travelers. Luca reads some of the rules at random. Persons requesting admission to the casa must be migrants. From this country or other countries, or deportees from the United States. Drugs and alcohol are prohibited. Anyone presenting symptoms of their use will be denied entry. Please remember that this is a place of sanctuary. Here you may rest while God restores your strength for the journey yet ahead of you. Your stay here must, therefore, be transitory, and limited to a maximum of three nights. Before he can finish reading the list, two men greet them from the far side of the fence. Only their heads are visible above the green plastic stripping. 
One is an older man with dark glasses and gray hair, and he does the talking. Bienvenida, hermana. He says. He steps closer to the fence so now Luca can see his shoulders as well, between the strings of barbed wire. He's wearing a dark blue cardigan and he smiles at them. You're in need of shelter. Luca nods. You are migrants. Lydia nods, reluctantly claiming the word. Here, the man says kindly, gesturing to his stocky younger companion to open a gate a few feet away. Please come in. Inside the fence sits an unpainted cinder block building with open air windows covered in sheets of black tarpaulin. It's ugly, and its bleak shadow steals into Luca and thieves the relief right out of him. The older man folds his hands and speaks softly. Are you in any immediate danger? Lydia thinks before she answers. No, I don't think so. Not right now. Do you have any immediate medical needs? No, we are healthy. Gracias a Dios, the man says. Thank God, Lydia agrees. Are you thirsty? He turns to walk, indicating that they should follow. Yes, a little. They round the corner of the ugly gray building, and suddenly the space opens around them. Luca's lungs fill up with the rush he'd been waiting for. The chain-link fence that surrounds the entire compound is opaque only at the front, so he can see now, beyond its boundaries in the back, across the bare cornfields to the town of Huehuetoca nearby, its houses clustering merrily up the hillside. Large prickly pear plants gather in clumps just outside the fence, their wide paddles cartoonishly green in the golden afternoon. The compound is much bigger than it looked from the road. There's one white van, a small house, a chapel, a string of porta potties, and two gigantic warehouses. Welcome to the Casa del Migrante, San Marco di Aviano. I am Padre Ray. This is one of my helpers, Nestor. Nestor raises one hand in salute but doesn't look at them. He keeps his eyes on Padre Ray's black sandals. We will get you something to drink right away, and you can freshen up for a few minutes. Luca tucks his thumbs nervously beneath the straps of his backpack. Hermana Cecilia will get you registered after you've had a little rest. Thank you, Padre, Lydia says. God bless you for your kindness. They step inside the first of the two warehouse buildings, and even though it's well lit, it takes Luca's eyes a few minutes to adjust. It's the first time he's been out of the stark sunshine all day. At a table, a boy and a girl, both younger than Luca, are coloring. The girl turns her head this way and that, admiring her artwork. A group of men and women sit at another table, some cleaning and sorting beans, others peeling carrots. Bright orange shreds collect in piles on the table. In the farthest corner of the large room, more men are watching football. Luca and Lydia choose an empty table and sit on lime green plastic chairs. A lady with a red coverall apron brings them two glasses of cold lemonade. It has an umber tint, but Luca gulps it gratefully anyway. Dinner is at seven, the woman explains apologetically. We can't make any exceptions unless it's a medical emergency. It's after three o'clock in the afternoon, and they haven't eaten since the tortillas beside the tracks early this morning. But no, it's okay, we're fine, Lydia says. Thank you. As the woman returns to the kitchen, Lydia is swamped with emotion. She swallows it with the lemonade. She examines the faces of the people at the other tables, but no one looks at her. Hermana Cecilia soon appears and brings them to her small office. She's a tidy little woman, and her office is papered with children's artwork. A pot on her desk holds a pink plastic flower. There are green chairs just like the ones in the big room. Hermana Cecilia's voice is the most soothing sound Luca has ever heard, a peaceful, uninflected hum of determined protection, so that no matter what words she says, the words Luca hears are you are safe here, you are safe here, you are safe. From a shelf behind her desk, she produces a tub of crayons and a small stack of clean, white paper. Would you like to stay here and draw? She asks Luca with her hum voice. Or sit in the big room with the other children. Luca's hand shoots out and grabs Mammy's. It's okay, Hermana Cecilia says. You can stay with your mommy. Lydia stands to pluck the backpack from his shoulders. She encourages Luca to sit at the other desk, beside the door. This way you can color, she says. You won't have to hold the paper on your lap. 
Lucas sits, and Lydia returns to sit across from the nun, who has some paperwork in a file folder in front of her. Before we begin, I want you to know that you don't have to answer anything that makes you uncomfortable. I ask that you try, because the answers you give will help us assist more people in the future, to prepare for new patterns of arrivals. But all the information we gather here is anonymous. You needn't give your real name unless you want to. Lydia nods her consent, the nun lifts the cap off her pen, and they begin. Names and ages. Lydia gives a little twist of her neck before she responds. I'm 32 and my son is 8. Hermana Cecilia writes down, Maria, 32, Y Jose, 8. Where are you traveling from? She hesitates, then asks a question of her own. No one has access to these files. Hermana Cecilia folds her hands and leans slightly forward. I assure you, Hermana, whatever, whoever you're worried about will never see these files. The only copy is kept locked in that filing cabinet, in this office, also locked, whenever I'm not here. Her eyes are blue, and they twinkle when she smiles. I'm always here. Lydia nods. We come from Acapulco. The nun returns to her writing. What is your intended destination? We're going to Estados Unidos. What city? Denver. A friendly city, the nun says. Pretty there. Are you traveling for reasons of being reunited with a member of your immediate family? No. Do you have family members currently living in the United States? Yes, an uncle and two cousins. She hasn't seen that uncle, Abuela's younger brother, since she was a young girl. She's never met his children. They're in Denver. Hermana Cecilia asks. Yes. They are expecting you. No. Was your decision to migrate planned or spontaneous? Spontaneous. Lydia squeezes her clasped hands together between her thighs. Was the primary reason for your journey financial? No. Was the primary reason for your journey medical? No. Was the primary reason for your journey domestic violence? No. Was the primary reason for your journey related to gang violence or recruitment? No. Lydia shakes her head. Was the primary reason for your journey related to violence by a cartel or drug traffickers in your place of origin? Lydia clears her throat. Yes, she says quietly. She can hear Lucas Crayon moving rapidly across the paper in silky strokes. Are you currently in fear for your life from a specific individual or individuals? Yes. Have you received direct threats to your safety? Lydia nods. Yes. Were the threats violent in nature? Yes. Can you describe the threats? Lydia scoots her chair closer and places her elbows on the edge of the desk. She folds her fingers together and lowers her head in her voice. The cartel killed 16 members of our family, she says, staring at the pen. The nun does not look up from her paper. They came to a family party and they shot everyone. My husband, my mother, my sister, and her children. Everyone. We escaped. Hermana Cecilia's pen is at a momentary loss. It hangs suspended over the page for a few seconds before the nun can make it move again. She scribbles everything down and then makes her voice go again, too. Has your spontaneous migration resolved the immediate threat to your safety and well-being? Lydia hesitates, because everything she's ever thought about protecting Luca has changed now. She doesn't want him to be afraid. But she needs him to be very afraid. And in any case, how can anything she does or does not say make any impact on him after what's already happened? She shakes her head. No, she admits. We are still in danger. You feel the threat has followed you. Lydia nods very slightly. Yes. I mean, he doesn't know where we are right now. But it was a very powerful man who did this. His influence extends all the way to El Norte. And he won't stop looking until he finds us. Do you know which plazas belong to him, or who his allies are in other organizations? The nun asks. Do you know which routes are safe for you to travel without his halconas? Lydia feels that this room has the sanctity of a confessional. No, she whispers. I don't know. I don't know. You are a long way from home, the nun says. He cannot find you here. You are safe here. 
Luca's crayon makes no sound behind her. The nun puts her pen in the cup beside her phone and tucks the paperwork into the folder. Then she stretches her hands across the desk toward Lydia, who takes them in hers, and bows her head. When Lydia closes her eyes, she realizes her hands are trembling. Hermana Cecilia's fingers are cool to the touch. Padre Nuestro, bless these children with your love and grace. Protect them from any further harm, God, and provide them with comfort in their time of unspeakable grief. May Jesus walk the road with them and repair their broken hearts. May Mother Mary sweep all dangers from their road ahead and lead them safely where they're going. Padre Nuestro, these two faithful servants have shouldered more than their share of life's burdens already. Please, God, may you see fit to relieve them of any further torment, yet not as we will it but as thy will be done. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen, Lydia says. Behind her at the little desk, with closed eyes and clutched crayon, Luca is moving his lips. Hermana Cecilia leans forward one last time. Be careful who you talk to, she says. That night Lydia wakes to the sound of raised voices in the corridor. She sits up in the half-light of the bunk room and notices several other women popping up from their beds as well. They move silently to check on their children, who sleep through the ruckus. Luca is above her in the top bunk, so Lydia has to disentangle her leg from the backpack strap she wrapped around it before she fell asleep. She stands, her bare feet cool against the tile floor, and reaches for his rumpled covers. Luca is not there. Panic rises in her throat. Luca. She checks her own bed again without meaning to, and then the surrounding beds as well. As if her child is an item she's unthinkingly misplaced. A cell phone, a book. A pair of glasses. There's a window on the door that leads to the corridor, and a rectangle of light shining through it. Lydia, without shoes or a bra, bolts toward that patch of light. This is Luca's third trip to the bathroom since they got into bed a few hours ago. The murky lemonade returns. Being on the top bunk has made his frequent sprints to the toilet extra challenging, but Mammy's so exhausted that she never wakes, not even when he nearly steps on her shoulder as he clambers down, not even when he lands with an indelicate thump just inches from her head, not even as he runs, the prickly, imbalanced gait of the diuretically infirm, from bunk to bathroom and back again. He's just washed his hands and returned to the fluorescent light of the hallway when he sees Padre Ray and Nestor talking to a young man in the doorway of the men's bunk room. Luca recognizes the young man as a migrant who arrived late that afternoon, before dinner. He's wearing long, red shorts and a white t-shirt, socks but no shoes, and he's carrying his backpack in front of him, unzipped. There's a pair of clean, expensive white sneakers on the floor beside him. At least let me get dressed first, he says. Man, this is bullshit. You're supposed to help people. Nestor steps behind him into the darkened interior of the dorm room, between the man and the sleeping migrants beyond. We can talk further, but not here. You are disturbing the whole facility, Padre Ray says calmly. Please, just come with us to the main room, where we can talk without waking everyone. This is bullshit, Padre, that puta is lying, the man says, raising his voice to a shout. Bullshit. Inside the dorm room, several men get out of their bunks and stand alongside Nestor, creating a kind of wall. They cross their arms, plant their legs wide. Luca stays frozen in his spot beside the bathroom door. He should turn and go the other way. He should scoot down the hall and back to the women and children's room, he should climb back up past Mammy's head and settle himself into the covers, where he should allow his body, temporarily relieved of stomach cramps, to rest. But he's paralyzed, transfixed. He's unaware of his own racing pulse, his shallow breath, his fingers scrabbling into the smooth seams between the painted cinder blocks of the wall behind him. Chinga tu madre. The young man yells. Let's go, hermano. It's the first time Luca has heard Nestor use his voice. It's as solidly built as his body. Don't make it harder than it has to be. The young man stoops and grabs his sneakers with one hand as Nestor and the other men close the distance behind him, encouraging him into the hallway without touching him. When he straightens to follow Padre Ray down the corridor, Luca notes the shape of a sickle tattoo with three blood-red droplets on the blade jutting out from the man's sock. It's carved into the calf muscle of his right leg. 
Luca doesn't know what the tattoo means, exactly, but he doesn't need to understand it for it to amplify his sense of dread. That bloody sickle unsticks Luca from the wall and sends him dashing down the hallway back to the women's dorm. He runs bang into mommy as he barrels through the door. Luca, she says. Oh my god, Luca, where were you? She doesn't wait for an answer. Her hands are on his shoulders, and she places him farther inside the room before sticking her head out into the hallway to see what all the noise is about but all she can see is Nestor and a few other men following Padre Ray toward the front of the building. She goes back inside and allows the door to click shut behind her. Luca is trembling. What happened? She whispers. He shakes his head. But what was all the shouting about? He shakes again, and his face looks all carved up with worry. It's okay, she says. It's okay, it's okay. She pulls him into her arms and crushes his head against her chest. His little arms reach around behind her and cling. They stay like that until she lifts him under the armpits. He's too big for it, and his weight is enough that she struggles beneath it. But he wraps his legs around her waist, and she carries him back to their bunk. He doesn't go up to the top bed this time. She makes her body into a shield behind and around him. She wraps one arm and leg over the top of his small figure, makes her breath deep and slow for him, so that his breath will line up with hers, so that he'll rest and sleep. But Lydia stays vigilant until morning. Chapter 13. The first time a head turned up by itself on the street in Acapulco, it was a big deal. It was a 22-year-old head, with curly black hair shaved close on the sides and left long on top. It had a small gold hoop earring in its right ear. Its eyelids swelled and its tongue protruded from its mouth. It was left on top of a public phone booth outside Pizza Hut right next to the Diana Cazadora fountain. Rolled up and stuck into the corner of its mouth like a cigarette was a note that read, Me gusta hablar. I like to talk. The woman who found the head as she walked home from her shift as a night nurse at the Hospital del Pacifico was not a woman ordinarily horror-struck by the sight of blood. But that day, just as dawn tipped its westerly light across the pavements of Acapulco, causing the head to throw its queer, bodiless shadow from atop the phone booth and toward the feet of that weary nurse, she screamed, dropped her purse, and ran three blocks before retrieving her phone from her pocket and calling the police. The officers descended, the media swarmed. People passing through the area on their way to work or school were aghast. They took the time to get down on their knees and bless themselves, to offer up some thorough prayers on behalf of the anonymous soul who had once belonged to that head. It was famous. Until the second one. By the time the head count reached a dozen, a shameful, self-protective apathy began to spread in the gut of the city so that, in the mornings, when a call would come in that a head had been found, on the beach or at El Zocalo or on the green of the ninth hole at El Club de Gaulle, the dispatcher answering the phone would sometimes make a joke. Go for the putter. That hole is an easy par 3. Back then, Sebastian had been the first one to recognize it for what it was, the city's steep, wholesale descent into the maw of the warring cartels. While other journalists were reluctant to acquiesce to the truth of their collapsing reality, Sebastian shouted it from his headlines. Cartels exhibit brutal surge in violence. Terror and impunity, cartels get away with murder. And most dramatically, after a particularly bad weekend, which saw the murders of two journalists, a city councilwoman, three shopkeepers, two bus drivers, a priest, an accountant, and a child holding a cob of buttered corn on the beach, his sandy feet still damp from the ocean, a simple pronouncement in two-inch letters. Acapulco Falls. That Monday morning Lydia sat behind her register in the bookshop reading her husband's unflinching account of the weekend's murders while her tea turned cold and bitter in its cup. She'd found it particularly difficult to leave Luca at the school gate that morning. She gripped his tiny hand with ferocity and rubbed the bumps of his knuckles with her thumb while they walked. Luca had pretended not to notice but he'd swung his lunch box more vigorously than usual. When she kissed him goodbye at the gate, she spotted a powdering of dried toothpaste along his bottom lip. She licked her thumb and smeared it away, while he protested the gesture as Ascarosa. Gross. Perhaps he had a point. But he'd kissed her back anyway, his lips all gloppy and wet, and for once, Lydia didn't discreetly wipe away the trail he left on her cheek. 
For once, she didn't turn and hurry off the moment he darted past the principal and into the courtyard. She waited there instead, one hand flat against the cinder block wall, and gazed after him. She didn't turn away until his little green and white uniform became invisible amid a sea of others. To Lydia, the change had felt sudden, lurching. She'd gone to bed the night before in the same city where she'd been born and raised, where she'd lived her entire life except for the brief spin of years through college in Mexico City. Her dreams had been populated by the same whipped current of ocean air, the same bright, liquid colors, the same thrumming beats and aromas of her childhood, the same languorous swaying of hips that had always defined the pace of life here in this place she knew so well. Sure, there had been new violence, an unfamiliar hitch of anxiety. Sure, crime was on the rise. But until that morning, the truth had felt insulated beneath the illusory film of Acapulco's previous immunity. And then Sebastian's headline had ripped that protective skin away. All at once, the people had to look and to see. They could pretend no longer, Acapulco falls. Briefly, Lydia hated her husband for that headline. She hated his editor. I mean, it's a little melodramatic, don't you think? She challenged him when he stopped by the shop to pick her up for lunch. She flipped the sign to read Cerrado and then locked the door behind them. Sebastian frowned at her. Actually, I don't think it can be melodramatic enough. I don't think words exist that can sufficiently capture the atrocity of what's happening here. He slung his hands into his pockets and watched her face as they walked. He spoke carefully, endeavoring to suppress the accusatory note in his voice, but it was there. She could hear it. You don't agree. That it's unspeakably horrific. A kind of mild, repressed superiority. I mean, of course I do, Sebastian. It's insane. She dropped her keys into her bag and wouldn't meet his eye. But Acapulco falls. Like Rome is burning. I mean, look around. It's a regular day, the sun is shining. Look, there are tourists. She nodded toward a cafe on the corner where a group of rowdy estadounidenses sat at an outdoor table in the shade of an awning. There were several nearly empty carafes of wine on their table. We should get one of those, Sebastian said. And though it was not yet noon, Lydia agreed, and they mostly drank their lunch that day instead of eating it. She cut her eyes at him across the table and did not say the things she wanted to say, that it was asinine of him to write this stuff, that he was turning himself into a target, that she wanted no part of his righteous campaign of truth that she hoped he was satisfied with his byline and that it was worth the danger. She did not say, you are a father. You are a husband. But he felt all of it there, in the angle of her gaze across the table. And he didn't respond by condemning her lack of courage. He didn't bristle against her resentment or pick at the waiting scab. He knew her vigilance was not a shortcoming. He held her hand across the table and studied his menu in silence. I think I'll have the soup, he said. That was more than a year and a half before she'd met Javier. But thinking back on it now, from the bottom bunk of the women's room at the Casa del Migrant in Huehuetoca with Lucas sleeping heavily on her arm, she wonders if Javier had anything to do with those first heads, if he saw them or sanctioned them, if he swung the weapon responsible for severing one of them from its body. Of course he did, she thinks. He must have. What was once inconceivable now seems foolishly plain. Poor Dios, how would her life be different at this very moment if she'd accepted that truth sooner? There was a time once, perhaps a year ago, when a customer came into her shop on a windy day, his hair tossed up in a mess, and his cheeks reddened by the wind. A shiver of animation skated in on his shoulders. He was agitated and spoke quickly to Lydia. There'd been a shooting a few blocks away. Some men had pulled up on a motorcycle and shot a local journalist twelve times in the head. The man was still lying there dead in the street. Who was it, who was it? The customer shook his head. I don't know. Some reporter. Lydia bolted. She grabbed her cell phone and ran outside. She left the man standing at her counter unattended. She left without ringing up his purchases. She hit Sebastian's number while she ran down the street. Straight to voicemail. She panicked and cried out. When she got to the corner, she realized she didn't know which way she was running. Where was this shooting? Which street? She turned in circles. Hit redial. Straight to voicemail. The shopkeepers were standing in their doorways. 
Where was it? She asked the shoe store owner and she hit Sebastian's number for a third time. Voicemail. The shoe salesman pointed, and Lydia ran. She turned another corner and another, hitting redial all the time. She called out for directions as she ran, and people pointed, and she kept going, and she kept hitting redial and she kept running, and then she stopped when she got to the street where La Policia were just pulling up, where a crowd of onlookers had gathered in a clump around the body. She stopped because she didn't want to go any closer. She didn't want to see. Her husband lying there in the puddle of his spent life. Her thumb was cold as she redialed Sebastian's number three more times. Voicemail. She was crying before she approached, her hair stringing across her face in the wind, collecting her tears. She clasped the cell phone with both hands in front of her. She walked the double yellow line like it was the plank of a ship, her legs wilty beneath her. And then it was not him. There was so much blood that it was at first difficult to ascertain, but within a few moments she could see clearly, no, those were not his shoes. No, Sebastian's hair was not that length, his legs were not that thick. Oh my god, the relief. It was not him. She cried harder and harder. It was not him. A stranger scooped Lydia into her big, doughy arms then and held her while she cried. The woman was enormous and smelled of powder, and Lydia did not resist her emphatic embrace, nor did she correct the woman's assumption that her breakdown was caused by some familiarity with the deceased reporter. After all, that notion did feel approximately true. So Lydia allowed the stranger to comfort her, to murmur over her tears, to offer her the kindness of a tissue from the pocket of her sweater, and in a few minutes it was all over. For Lydia. It was some other widow's turn that day. And when she finally extracted herself from the stranger's arms, Lydia's body felt jerky and clattery with adrenaline as she walked the several blocks back to her shop to find that her customer had left his money, plus a little extra, on the counter beside the register. She's still afraid that, one day, it will be Sebastian. She's been afraid for so long that now she can't catch up to the facts, it was already him, and the rest of her family. It really did happen, all those years of worry did not prevent it. And not only Sebastian, but Mama, too, and Yemi and her beautiful children, and none of them had chosen to marry Sebastian, or to take on the risks of his profession as their own. Only she had done that, and now her family had paid for her choice. The fears of her past and the horrors of her present are so mixed up they feel like the unmatching pieces of a rompacabezes, like she's trying to piece together things that were never meant to fit. Perhaps she's just not ready. Lydia knows the stages of grief, and this is denial. Instead of acceptance she wants to recall Sebastian's face, lunch that day in the cafe, the boyish tilt of his posture at the small table after their first glass of wine. They laughed together, and Sebastian had made a show of looking discreetly down her top, of rubbing her thigh beneath the table, of asking if she wanted to head back to the shop early so he could help her check inventory. But in the slick heat of the memory that follows, she cannot conjure Sebastian's face. The absolute absence of him feels like unmitigated terror. Lydia is startled by the lateness of the daylight when she opens her eyes, and for a moment, she doesn't know where she is. Luca is already awake beside her, watching her, his black eyes clear through the curtain of his sleep sticky lashes. She can smell something cooking, and there's the distant clinking of forks against dishes. Come on, let's get some food. She sits up but then leans back and presses her lips against the warm expanse of Luca's cheek. There's such comfort there that she stays for a minute, her hands against the softness of his skin. Luca sits bolt upright in bed, his hands flying up to his head to confirm what he already knows, that Poppy's hat is not there. He wears it even when he sleeps now, and when he has to remove it to shower, he makes Lydia hold it in her hands until he comes out. She's not allowed even to set it down. Neither is she allowed to put it on her own head, because it must maintain the precise smell of Poppy mingled with Luca, a mix that Luca is very pleased to note has not diminished but only intensified in the time he's been wearing it. Perhaps Poppy's smell is also his smell, and he can keep enhancing it by its continued use. They mustn't accidentally introduce any new ingredients, therefore, to corrupt the purity of the hat. It must have fallen off last night, when he was sleeping, or during one of his many trips up and down from the top bunk to the bathroom. 
Don't worry, Miho, Lydia says, sitting up after him, because it's immediately evident what he's looking for, and he's already left the warm nest of the bottom bunk and clambered up to riffle through the top bunk. The bed frame squeaks as he digs through the covers. There's an audible sigh of relief from above, and then the hat appears, perched triumphantly on the end of Luca's outstretched arm, over the edge of the bed. There are plenty of Hovenas, teenagers, at the shelter, but only a few younger children, and at breakfast they all sit together at a round table in the center of the room. A little girl pops up from this table when Luca enters, and draws him by the elbow to an empty seat. Lydia makes him a plate, and one for herself, and then sits at a table nearby with two other women, Nellie and Julia, both in their early twenties, both from Guatemala. Nellie is pudgy with curly hair. Julia is slender, with dark skin and almond-shaped eyes. Lydia nods and smiles politely as they introduce themselves, but she keeps quiet, afraid of her own voice, afraid she'll betray herself in some way she hasn't considered. Her accent, a turn of phrase, some unconscious custom that might identify her. She does not reach for the loops at her neck. Nellie and Julia recognize caution, and they understand. They don't press her. Lydia turns her face toward her plate, briefly closes her eyes, and blesses herself. Nellie and Julia resume their conversation. She wasn't even going to tell anyone. Nellie asks. God bless her. Said she didn't want to make a fuss. It's only because I happened to step into the hallway just at that moment, Julia says. And I saw it with my own eyes. I saw what he did to her. I chased him away from her and then got the padre right away. And what did the padre do? Nellie wants a play-by-play. -play. She's taking her time with her food, shredding a tortilla into host-sized pieces which she places on her tongue one at a time. The padre was great, he went in and fished that cholo right out of his cot. Sent him packing. And I slept through the whole thing. Nellie seems disappointed. I heard he put up a bit of a fight too. Across the room, the girl at the center of last night's scandal, a 16-year-old from San Salvador keeps her face tipped down toward her own plate. Her shoulders are rolled in so far toward each other that her body seems to be trying to swallow itself. Lydia chews even though the eggs are scrambled and the chewing is unnecessary. Her mouth needs something to do. Another woman approaches their table and points to the empty chair beside Lydia. Nellie waves her hand to indicate that it's free. The woman sets her plate down and pulls out the chair. She's wearing a pink skirt and flip-flops, and has a multicolored ribbon woven into the two long braids down her back. If her clothing didn't mark her as an indigenous woman, then her heavily accented Spanish would. Nellie and Julia steal glances at each other as the woman takes her seat. She smiles at them and offers her name as Ishal, but Nellie and Julia continue their conversation without pause, turning their bodies almost imperceptibly away from her. It's a rudeness that Lydia would have endeavored to counteract in her old life, with a smile and a kind word. Perhaps even a rebuke to the offending party. Because Lydia perceives that the Guatemalan women are snubbing the newcomer due to bigotry, because she's in India. And Lydia is suitably offended on Ixchul's behalf, but performing an act of decorum would mean putting herself at risk, so instead she keeps her eyes on her plate, scoops some eggs into a tortilla. I saw them together last night after dinner, Julia says. I saw the way he looked at her, and I just presumed they were together. But what I saw then after, there was no question it was one-sided. She tried to fight him off. Nellie asks, placing a speckled white square in her mouth. Worse than that, she struggled but then seemed resigned to it. Julia shakes her head sadly but there's a spiky anger in her voice. Like she knew there was nothing she could do if he'd made up his mind. Kate Chingadera. They should be castrated, every one of them, Nellie says, shaking her head full of black curls. Julia looks across at the young girl. She's so pretty, too. She's going to have a rough journey. A lot of return trips to the cure Pomatico, Nellie agrees. The what? Ishal asks. The cure Pomatico. Nellie repeats. Ishal shakes her head. She may have an accent, but her Spanish is excellent, and yet she hasn't heard this word before. Perhaps it's slang. Perhaps it's made up. Lydia doesn't know it either. You don't know this word? Julia asks. Ishal shakes her head a second time. Lydia watches Luca at the round table while she listens to the women talk. 
I thought all the Guatemaltecas knew it. Nelly allows the remainder of her tortilla to wilt back onto her plate. Las Guanacas Tambien, why Las Catraches? Julia leans forward on her elbows and pushes her plate aside. It means your body is an ATM machine. Lydia tries to swallow, but the eggs and tortilla have formed a paste in her mouth. Her fork is full of rice, a crispy disc of platano frito speared onto its tines. The fork hovers. This is the price of getting to El Norte, Nelly says. After some excruciating measure of seconds, Ishal finds her voice, the Spanish words that are familiar. La violation. Rape. Is the price. Both women look at her blankly. They cannot believe this is news to her. Has she been living under a rock before now? How did you end up here, Mamita? Nelly asks, returning her attention to the food. Ishal does not answer. Julia leans in and drops her voice low. I have paid twice already. This disclosure, shared with a woman she seemed to shun only moments ago, is such an unexpected intimacy that Lydia makes a noise in her throat without meaning to. A wound of a sound. All three women look at her as she takes a sip of fruit punch and sets her still full fork on the edge of her plate. How about you? Julia returns her attention to Nellie. Have you paid? Not yet, Nelly says grimly. You. They all look expectantly at Lydia. She shakes her head. A smiling young woman approaches the table where Luca is sitting with the other children. Who's ready for a puppet show? She asks. The little girl beside Luca shoots out of her chair, arms raised. Me, me. She says. Good, I need lots of helpers. I heard he was a Sicario. This information snaps Lydia's focus back to her own table. What? She says, accidentally. That's the rumor. Julia shrugs. Seems like they should know better than to let those narcos in. But he told the padre he was getting out, Nelly intercedes. Told him he got recruited by the cartel when he was just a kid and he never had any choice, you know the story. Had enough of that life and wanted to go to El Norte. Which cartel? Ishal asks because like most people, because of her personal experience, she's more afraid of one particular cartel than others. What does it matter? Nelly says. They're all the same. Animales. They're not, Julia insists. Some of them are way worse than others. Nelly makes a face like she's skeptical, but doesn't argue. Like Los Jardineros, Julia says. I heard they donated money to build a new cancer hospital in Acapulco. Lydia takes a sharp breath, but Nelly waves a hand dismissively. That's just trying to buy people's loyalty, she says. Propaganda. But maybe the reason is less important than the fact, Julia says. Then she drops her voice to a whisper and leans in again, closing the space across the table to a tight circle. She names the unnameable cartel. Los Zetas feed people their own body parts. Los Zetas hang babies from bridges. Lydia covers her mouth with her hand. Her fingers are cold and stiff, and beside her, Ishal is crossing herself. Lydia will ask a question now, but she'll make her voice light. Neutral. So last night, the guy who got kicked out, which cartel was he? Julia shrugs. I don't know, she says. But if he really wants out, he'd better run. Far and fast, right. They don't let those guys go. Lydia pushes her plate away. Far and fast, she thinks. Some things are so simple. Chapter 14. Six days and 282 miles from absolute calamity, Lydia and Luca take their leave from Huehuetoca and head north once again, following the trail of La Bastilla. When Lydia considers how they've managed to survive the last week, to get this far from Acapulco and remain alive, her mind seizes. Because she knows she's made both good and bad decisions in those six days, and that ultimately, it's only by the grace of God that none of those choices have met with bad luck and resulted in catastrophe. That awareness incapacitates her. She can't conceive of a plan to board the train, which is what they must do. They must get on the train. Meanwhile, walking will give her time to think. They filled their canteens before they left the shelter, but they stop at a small shop down the road and Lydia jams her bag with snacks. Because it's a shop that's used to migrants, they stock the kinds of things that migrants can carry and eat, nuts, apples, candy, granola, chips, carne seca. 
Lydia buys as much as she can fit in her pack. She buys a floppy hat too, pink with white flowers, to protect her neck from the sun. It reminds her of the ugly thing Mama used to put on when she gardened, and any time Lydia and Yemi caught their mother wearing it they would titter and tease. You laugh but this hat is the reason I have the skin of a 24-year-old. Their mother would chide them. Back outside, the freight tracks stretch out across the Mexican landscape like a beanstalk migrants must climb, and Luca and Mommy go step by step, tie by tie, leaf by leaf. The sun is bright but not too hot this early in the day. They hold hands briefly, and then sweat and separate, and then the cycle repeats. They take the westernmost route because Luca's mind map was convinced that, though that way was longer than the others, the relative topography would be kinder if they end up making much of the journey by foot, as it appears they might. He's glad mommy didn't press him to explain his instinct, she simply yielded to the gentle pressure of his hand as they'd set off. Lydia knows that her plan to go to Denver is inadequate, that it might be difficult to track down her tío Gustavo. Abuela used to complain that her baby brother had turned into a gringo when he left for El Norte all those years ago, when he was still a young man, and never looked back. Lydia knows only that her tío married a white lady, changed his name to Gus, and started his own company, something in construction. Was it plumbing or electric? And what if he changed his last name, too? She's never met his children, her primos Yanquis. She doesn't even know their names. When she dwells too long on these facts, she begins to panic, so she strips it all back to manageable, step-by-step -step pieces, move north. Reach the border. Find a coyote. Get across. Take a bus to Denver. There will be churches there. Libraries, internet access, immigrant communities. People willing to help. For now just move north, move north. Get Luca out of danger. A couple hours walk northwest of the migrant shelter, Luca and Mommy encounter two teenage sisters wearing matching rainbow wristbands on their slender left arms, sitting on an overpass above the train tracks, and dangling their feet below. Both girls are very beautiful, but the slightly older one is dangerously so. She wears baggy clothing and an intense scowl in a failing effort to suppress that calamitous beauty. The younger one leans back on her stuffed backpack, but they both sit up when they see Luca. The studied hardness of their expressions melts. Together they make the O oh, of cuteness that teenage girls often emit for smaller children. Mira, K guapo. The younger sister sings out in an unfamiliar accent. So cute, the older one agrees. They both have abundant black hair, stark, expressive eyebrows, dark, penetrating eyes, perfectly aligned teeth, full lips, and apple-shaped cheeks. The older one has something extra, something undefinable that makes her entirely arresting. Luca fixes his eyes on her accidentally and cannot seem to remove his gaze once it's alighted upon her. Mommy does, too. The girl is so beautiful she seems almost to glow, more colorful than the landscape in which she sits. The dingy gray of the concrete overpass, the pebble brown of the tracks and the earth, the faded blue of her baggy jeans, the dirty white of her oversized t-shirt, the bleached arc of the sky, it all recedes behind her. Her presence is a vivid throb of color that deflates everything else around her. An accident of biology. A living miracle of splendor. It's a real problem. Oye, adonde van, amigos. The less beautiful one calls out to them when they're directly beneath her feet. Where everyone goes, Lydia says, shielding her eyes so she can look up at the girls above them. To El Norte. She removes the ugly pink hat from her head and uses it to fan herself. Beneath it, her sweaty hair sticks to her forehead. Us, too. She says, swinging her feet. Your son is so cute. Lydia looks over at Luca, who's smiling up at the girls, the most genuine smile that's escaped his face since the morning of Unifer's quinceañera. My name is Rebecca, and this is my sister, Soledad. The girl speaks to Luca directly. Como te llamas, chiquito? Lydia, who's fallen into the habit of answering for her silent son, opens her mouth to reply but. Luca, he says. His voice clear like a bell, no hint of rust from all those days without use. Lydia snaps her mouth shut in surprise. How old are you, Luca? Rebecca asks. I am eight years old. The sisters look at each other with animation, and the younger one claps her hands together. I knew it. 
Just exactly the same age as our little cousin at home. His name is Juanito. He looks like you. Doesn't he look like Juanito, Sol? Soledad the beauty smiles reluctantly. He does, she admits. Like twins. You want to see his picture? Rebecca asks. Luca looks at mommy, who's been very cautious about stopping to talk with people. But these girls have returned her boy's voice to him. She nods. Come up. Rebecca says. She removes a fragile plastic bag of wrapped photographs from the front pocket of her sister's backpack and flips through them. Luca scrambles up to join the girls on the overpass while mommy watches from below. She tries to survey their location, but the seam of land cut by the tracks here makes a poor vantage point for visibility, so she follows Luca up the steep, sandy little hill. The girls aren't actually sitting on the overpass at all, but on a metal grate that sticks off the roadway on one side of the overpass like a hazardous catwalk. Lydia tests it with her foot before stepping over. Luca squats on the roadway side, leaning his elbows on the low guardrail. Rebecca leans back against this, and together they stare at the pictures. See, si, she says. Guapo como tu. Luca grins again, and nods. He does look like me, mommy, look, he says. Except no teeth. Rebecca holds the photograph so Lydia can see. He lost those two both on the same day, and then he was like a vampire, the girl says to Luca. Did you lose yours yet? A potent memory. It looms up unbidden, Poppy pulling his first tooth, a bottom one, from the middle. The tooth had been loose for weeks and then one night during dinner, Luca took a bite of his tampicania and a point of pain shot through his gums. He dropped his fork, moved the food to the back of his mouth, swallowed it in an unchewed lump, and then examined the damage. The tooth, he found, had been pushed askew. It leaned like an ancient grave in soft ground. He touched it softly with one finger, and was horrified by its slackness. Mommy and Poppy both put down their forks to watch. But Luca was so afraid of the pain that he found himself unable to do anything. And then Mommy had tried, for perhaps twenty minutes, to coax him to open his mouth just a little so she could have a look. But Luca was steadfast and mute, his lips clamped shut. When Mommy finally lost her patience, Poppy eased into place beside Luca. He made funny faces intended to illustrate what happened to children who didn't allow for the timely removal of ejected teeth. And Luca laughed despite his fear, and in the gap of that laughter, he finally submitted to opening his little mouth while mommy watched from across the table. Poppy reached in there so gently Luca didn't even feel the presence of his fingers against the tooth. But he does remember Poppy's hands along his face, one securely cupping his chin, the other reaching inside. Luca remembers the salty tang of Poppy's fingers and the triumphant smile when those fingers emerged with the prize of that tiny tooth. Luca's eyes popped so wide when he saw it, and he gasped. He couldn't believe there was no pain, no feeling at all. Poppy had simply reached in there and lifted the little thing out. And then they all laughed and squealed at the table together, and Luca jumped out of his chair, disbelieving, and his parents both hugged and kissed him. He ate the rest of his tampicania while the new hole in his mouth gathered small pieces of food he had to sluice out with milk. That night they left the tooth beneath his pillow and El Radoncito Perez came to retrieve it, leaving Luca a poem and a new toothbrush in its place. Luca lifts one hand to his mouth now and sucks on his knuckle, but it's not the same, and he has to bat at that memory like a pesky bug. A horsefly. The gone taste of his father's hands. Mommy sees this, reaches out, and squeezes his toe through his sneaker, just a gentle pressure that brings him back to this dusty overpass. He breathes into his body. Couldn't get on the train, huh? Among other things, Soledad has a gift for changing the subject at exactly the right moment. She's more tentative than her sister, but it's hard to remain standoffish with Luca there, all eyelashes and coy dimples. Lydia wriggles out of her backpack and retrieves a canteen. Not yet. They've made it a lot harder. Safety first. Rebecca discharges a puff of air that, in another setting, might pass for laughter. Yeah. Mommy shakes her head. Safety. You've been on the trains. Luca asks. Soledad twists to look at him, resting her chin on her shoulder. All the way from Tapachula, more or less. 
Luca thinks of the men running alongside the train in the clearing outside Lek area, the way they ascended, one by one, and disappeared, while he and Mommy watched, unable to move. He thinks of the deafening roar and clatter of La Bastilla, shouting its warnings into their hearts and bones while they watched, and he feels awed by these two powerful sisters. How? He asks. Soledad shrugs. We've learned some tricks. Mommy hands Luca a canteen, and he drinks. Like what? Mommy asks. We need some tricks. Soledad retracts her dangling legs and folds them beneath her, shifting her spine and shoulders into a stretched posture, and Lydia sees, even in this minor animation of the girl's body, how the danger rattles off her relentlessly. These sisters haven't befriended anyone since they left home, they, too, have kept to themselves as much as possible. But they haven't yet met anyone so young as Luca on their journey. Neither have they met anyone so watchfully maternal as Lydia. So it's a great pleasure to feel normal for a minute, to inhabit the softness of a friendly conversation. There can't be any harm in sharing some advice with their fellow travelers. Like this, Soledad says, gesturing at the tracks beneath them. One thing we noticed is they spend all that money on fences around the train stations, but nobody has thought yet to fence the overpasses. Luca watches Mammy's face as she surveys their position now from the angle of this new information. Mommy leans ever so slightly forward and gauges the distance to the ground beneath them. It's not that far. But then she tries to imagine how this space would change with the noise and weight and presence of La Bastia charging through it. You bored from here? She asks incredulously. Not here, Soledad corrects her. Because you'd hit your head as soon as you dropped. The overpass would knock you right off before you got your balance. We sit on this side to watch for it coming. But then you jump on over there. She points. Luca follows the direction of her gesture across the roadway, and he sees there, affixed to the guardrail, a bleached white cross with a burst of faded orange flowers at its center. Likely a memorial, he realizes, for someone else who attempted to board the train at this place, and didn't manage it. He bites his lip. You just jump on top. Well, not always, Soledad says. But, yes, if the conditions are right, you just jump on top. And what makes the conditions right? Lydia asks. Or wrong? Well, the first thing is, you have to choose carefully where to do it. So this place is good because you see, she says, standing and pointing across the roadway to the tracks beyond, you see the curve there, just ahead. Lydia stands, too, so she can see where the girl is pointing. The train always slows down for a curve. When it's a big curve, it slows way down. So we know it'll be going slow when it passes. And then the next thing is to make sure there are no other hazards ahead. That's why we chose this overpass instead of the first one. Lydia looks south, back along the path they just walked. She hadn't even noticed that first overpass when they'd walked beneath it. She'd only been grateful for its momentary shade, a shallow respite from the sun. Because if you jumped on over there, on that one, Rebecca adds, taking up the explanation for her sister, you'd only have a moment to get your balance before you'd have to hit the deck to pass beneath this one. Tricky. Lydia blinks and shakes her head. She can't envision it. So we sit here, Soledad continues. We watch. We wait for the train. And when we see one we like, we cross the road, we gauge the speed, we make the decision to board, and then we drop. Like going off a diving board. Luca asks, thinking of the water park at El Rolo. Not exactly, Soledad says. First you lower your backpack, because it makes you top heavy, wobbly. So you toss that first. And then you squat down really low. You don't dangle, because if you do that your feet will get going with the train and then your top half won't catch up. You get stretched like a slingshot. So you roll your body up small and hop on like a frog. Low and tight. And just make sure your fingers grab something right away. Luca's heart is hammering in his chest just thinking about it. He reminds himself to breathe. Then he looks at mommy, taking it in, considering their likelihood of survival. He feels a sudden surge of manic energy coursing through his body, so he has to stand and spring and kick and let it loose into the world. If you get really lucky, sometimes the train might even stop, Rebecca says. And then you just climb down. Simple. But there's plenty of times we let a train go by too, Soledad says. 
If it's moving fast, we don't even try. We've already seen two people who tried to board and didn't make it. Lydia looks at Luca to see how this information will affect him, but he gives nothing away. Were those people boarding the same as you? From the top like this? No. Rebecca seems almost proud. We're the only ones who board like this. I haven't seen anybody else do it. Lydia screws up her mouth. So these girls are either brilliant or insane. How many times have you done this? She asks. The sisters look at each other, and it's Soledad who answers. Five, maybe. Six. Lydia lets out a deep, low breath. She nods. Okay. You want to come with us? Rebecca asks. It's not until after the words are out that she glances at her sister, remembering they're always supposed to check with each other first about everything. Soledad touches the top of Rebecca's head, and the gesture reassures her sister in the language of their lifelong intimacy that it's fine. Maybe, Lydia answers, ignoring the hitch in her lungs as she expels the word. They talk a little while they wait, and Lydia learns that the girls are 15 and 14 years old, that they've traveled over a thousand miles so far, that they miss their family very much, and that they've never been on their own before. They don't say why they left home, and Lydia doesn't ask. They both remind her of Unifer, though it's probably only their age. The sisters are taller and more slender, darker skinned than her niece, and both are luminous and funny. Unifer had been studious and solemn. Even as a baby she'd had a certain gravity to her. Lydia's older sister, Yemi, had selected Lydia, who was just 17 the year their father died and Unifer was born, to be the girl's godmother. Lydia remembers holding the baby over the baptismal font and crying. She made sure not to wear mascara that day so she wouldn't stain the baptismal dress. She'd known she would cry, not from joy or the honor of being the godmother or the emotion of the moment, but because her father wasn't there to see it. So Lydia's own tears had splattered across the child's forehead along with the holy water, and Lydia was surprised to see, through the blur of her vision, that the baby in her arms didn't join in her tears. Unifer's eyes were wide and blinking. Her mouth, a perfect and puckered pink bow. Lydia loved that baby so much that she couldn't imagine she'd ever love her own child more. When Luca was born, years later, Lydia learned the incomparability of that kind of love, of course. But it was still Unifer, that somber, shining girl, who had allayed her grief when she lost the second baby. Wise little Unifer at nine years old, who'd cried with her and stroked her forehead and reassured her, but you do have a daughter, Tia. You have me. The enormity of Lydia's loss is incomprehensible. There are so many griefs at once that she can't separate them. She can't feel them. Beside her, the sisters talk lightly to Luca and he responds with his reanimated words. There's an effervescence among them that feels extraordinary. The sound of Luca's voice is an elixir. The sun feels hotter when they're sitting still, and Lydia notices that her arms are as tan as childhood. Luca, too, is a shade browner than usual, and there are dots of perspiration all along his hairline beneath Sebastian's cap. But the weight beneath that sapping sun is almost too brief, Lydia thinks. She could have used more time to talk herself into this. It's not even two hours before the distant rumble of the train grows into their consciousness and all four of them rise without speaking and begin to ready themselves. In truth, Lydia's in no way convinced that they're actually going to go through with it. She hopes they do because they need to be on that train. And she hopes they don't, because she doesn't want to die. She doesn't want Luca to die. She feels as if she's outside her own body, listening to that train approach, moving her backpack to the other side of the roadway, prompting Luca along in front of her. She packs their canteen into the front pocket of her backpack and zips it up. Even if she felt confident that she could jump onto a moving train, how can she ask her son to do this crazy thing? Her shoulders feel loose, her legs erratic beneath her. Adrenaline sluices all through her jittery body. Beside her, Luca follows a crack in the asphalt beneath his sneakers. He keeps his eyes and thoughts fixed on the minutia. He leaves it to mommy to take in the broad sweep of the task at hand, the dun-colored grasses and scrubby trees crowding the embankment, the dome of blue overhead, the overpass and train tracks intersecting like a cross. 
The wind fuzzes through Luca's hair as the noise of the train grows closer, the booming clatter and reverberation of those monster wheels hauling themselves along the metal of the track, the very loudness of that noise seems designed as a warning that enters through your ears but lodges in your sternum, stay away, stay away, stay away, don't be crazy, don't be crazy, don't be crazy. Luca holds his backpack by the top handle, low in front of him with both hands. There's one kid at school who's a daredevil. Her name is Pilar, and she's always doing crazy stunts. She leaps from the very top of the jungle gym. She flies from the highest arc of the swing. Once, she climbed a tree beside the school gate and shimmied out on an upper limb, from where she climbed onto the roof of the school building. She did cartwheels up there until the principal called her abuela to come talk her down. But not even Pilar would jump onto a moving train from an overpass, Luca thinks. Pilar would never, in a million years, believe steady, rule following Luca capable of participating in such madness. He watches the nose of the train approach and disappear beneath the southern edge of the roadway. He turns then, and sees it emerge from beneath his feet. Mommy peers over the edge of the low guardrail just as the train pulls itself into view. It's good. Rebecca smiles at them. Nice and slow. Ready. Soledad says. Her little sister nods. Lydia's face is grim while she watches the girls. Luca studies the stretch of the train and sees a few migrants clustered near the tail end, on the last five or six cars. One is standing, silhouetting his body into an X, and he waves at them. Luca waves back. Let's go, Soledad says. She and her sister line up beside each other, smack in the center of the track. They squat, holding their packs beneath them, and wait for the right car. They look for one that's flat on top. One that has the kind of grating you can walk on, sit on, grab onto. The first half of the train is all rounded tanker cars, so they wait. And then finally, quite slowly, Soledad tosses her pack and then follows it. With one graceful, chaotic, suicidal lurch, she moves her body from the fixed to the moving, she drops, Lydia can't tell how far it is, six feet. Ten. And then the girl is instantly receding, her form growing smaller as she moves away with the train. Come on. She shouts back to her sister. Now. And then Rebecca, too, is gone, and Lydia realizes how quickly this has to happen, that they have no time to weigh their options, no time to consider best practices. She rejects the awareness that all her life she's been afraid she would jump accidentally, like that girl from her favorite novel, from cliffs, from balconies, from bridges. But now she knows, with 100% certainty, she knows she would never have jumped, that the fear has always been an elaborate trick of her mind. Her heels are glued to the roadway. A week ago she'd have screamed at Luca to get back from there. She'd have told him not to stand so close to the edge. She'd have reached out and grabbed his arm to convince herself that he was safe, that he would stay put. Now she has to launch her child onto this moving train beneath them. The small cluster of migrants on the last few cars is approaching. They duck low to pass beneath the roadway and then, when they emerge on the other side, they're facing Lydia, their arms open wide, they gesture at her to toss the backpacks. She tosses the backpacks. And then she grabs Luca by his two shoulders, stands behind him. Step over, she instructs him. Luca steps over without hesitation or objection. His heels are on the roadway. The toes of his little blue sneakers stick out into the air as the train passes beneath them. Luca hums to cover the dreadful noise of the train. Squat low, she tells him. Just like the girls did. He squats low. If he jumps from this place and dies, it will be because he did exactly what Lydia told him to do. She feels as though she's watching herself in a nightmare doing a monstrous thing that makes her panic. A thing, thank God, that she would never do in real life. And then just as she's about to reel him in, to crush his small head against her chest, to wrap him in her arms and weep with relief that she wakened in time, she hears it. With conviction, Sebastian's voice, cutting through all the external and internal noise. The voice, then, when she opens her mouth and screams into Luca's ear, is almost not her own. Go, Luca. Jump. Luca jumps. And every molecule in Lydia's body jumps with him. 
She sees him, the tight tuck of him, how small he is, how absurdly brave he is, his muscles and bones, his skin and hair, his thoughts and words and ideas, the very bigness of his soul, she sees all of him in the moment when his body leaves the safety of the overpass and flies, just momentarily, upward because of the effort of his exertion, until gravity catches him and he descends toward the top of Labastia. Lydia watches him drop, her eyes so big with fear they've almost left her body. And then he lands like a cat on all fours, and the velocity of his leap clashes with the velocity of the train, and he topples and rolls, and one leg splays toward the edge of the train, pulling his weight with it, and Lydia tries to scream his name, but her voice has snagged and gone, and then one of the migrant men catches him. One big, rough hand on Luca's arm, the other on the seat of his pants. And Luca, caught safe in the strong arms of this train top stranger, lifts his moving face to seek her. His eyes catch her eyes. I did it, mommy. He screams. Mommy. Jump. Without a thought in her head except Luca, she jumps. Chapter 15. The year before Sebastian's murder, Mexico was the deadliest country in the world to be a journalist, no safer than an active war zone. No safer even than Syria or Iraq. Journalists were being murdered in cities all across the country. Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. And yet, because Los Jardineros didn't specifically target reporters the way most cartels did, Sebastián hadn't received an official cartel death threat for almost two years. So it's not quite accurate to say that Sebastián and Lydia felt a false sense of security, no one in Acapulco felt secure. The free press was a critically endangered species in Mexico. But in the aftermath of their discovery that Lydia's friend was La Lechuza, the absence of an explicit warning from him, combined with the fact of her fraught but genuine attachment to Javier, functioned as a sort of short-term analgesic for the worst of their personal fears. Sebastian continued to take the usual precautions, he avoided adhering too closely to a daily routine, he limited driving his recognizable orange beetle to crime scenes, and whenever he wrote a particularly risky piece, he used the anonymous byline staff writer to conceal his identity. In those cases, the paper also sprang for a hotel room in the tourist district. He'd take Lydia and Luca and they'd hunker down for a few days out of sight. When it appeared that retaliation was not forthcoming, they'd re-emerge and continue with their lives. But those safeguards were largely illusory. Sebastian knew that any research he conducted, any crime he investigated, any source he contacted, was a potential landmine. He was as careful as a truth-telling Mexican journalist can be. For her part, Lydia became hypervigilant for any signs of danger. Javier continued to visit her in the bookstore almost weekly, and the torment she'd felt the first night she discovered the truth about him slowly gave way to something else. She still sat with him, served him coffee, spoke with him about a range of subjects. She listened twice more when he read her poems from his moleskin notebook. She even smiled authentically at him, and despite a sickening feeling of culpability and a reluctance to admit it she was still charmed by him. His intellect, his warmth, his vulnerability and sense of humor, none of it had changed. Yet, when there was news of a fresh murder, which happened more infrequently than before but not infrequently enough, Lydia experienced a sort of exaggerated emotional flinch, and she knew that her careful retreat from him was not only necessary but also inevitable. Her behavior need only follow what her heart had already accomplished. What if we tell him? Lydia said to Sebastian the week before Unifer's quinceañera. They dropped Luca at her sister, Yemi's, house earlier for a sleepover with Adrian. Tell who what? Tell Javier about the article. Before it comes out. Sebastian closed his leather menu and set it down on his plate. Estas loca, mujer. She was buttering a warm roll from the covered basket, and didn't look up at him. Yes. But I think I'm serious, too. She pressed the butter into the bread and waited for it to soften. Sebastian looked away from her, out over the water. The restaurant was on a hilltop above the bay and it was dusk, and he could see lights winking through the valley below, their ghost lights glimmering echoes in the water. He didn't want to consider the idea. He wanted to consider the view and the menu and his beautiful wife. After years of narco-journalism he'd become good at compartmentalizing, at putting all the ugliness away. Sebastian was skilled at enjoying himself. But he respected Lydia and didn't want to be dismissive. 
If we talk about this for two minutes, do you promise then that we can not talk about it for the rest of the night? He asked. Yes. She smiled and bit into her bread. Okay, he said. Why would we tell him? What's the benefit of doing that? She took a sip of water. To gauge his response ahead of time, to know what we're up against. Sebastian sat very still while he listened. Maybe he'd even meet with you. You could get him to go on the record. Do you think he'd do that? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, we know how smart he is. Maybe he'd see it as an opportunity to try and control the message. Get some good PR, get out ahead of the curve. Every narco has a Robin Hood complex. Right, so you appeal to that. Maybe he'd even like it. But that's exactly what I'm afraid of. I can't be beholden to him. No, I know. But he might not know. He might think this means I'm his new PR guy. I'm on his payroll after this. I. Lydia grimaced. It's too risky, Sebastian said, opening his menu. What are you going to eat? Lydia read the article on Monday evening, the night before it went to press. She and Sebastian had to calculate the level of risk to determine their safest course of action for the coming days. The paper had offered to put them up in a hotel again, to get them out of sight. The piece would not be published under his name, but it would be easy enough to figure out who'd written it. Any one of his sources could reveal him to Javier. They already may have. Sebastian paced behind her while she read at the kitchen table from his laptop, La Lechuza revealed, portrait of a drug lord. The story was accompanied by several photographs. Sebastian and his editor had selected a flattering picture of Javier, sitting elegantly with his legs crossed at the knee, one arm draped across the back of a velvet couch. He wore dark jeans and a tweed blazer, and looked every inch the bookish professor, his eyes warm behind the thick glasses, his face smiling but not smug. Lydia thought again of the first morning he'd come into the shop, how deeply his friendship, his vulnerability, had affected her in the months before she understood who he was. She still felt reluctant to learn more unpleasant things about him. She still felt a memory of fondness for him, which unnerved her. She pressed her eyes closed and took a deep breath before she began. She was amazed by Sebastian's familiarity with his subject, he clearly knew a very different Javier than she did, and yet the account was both objective and compassionate. In her husband's words, she recognized her friend's intensity, but she also discovered for the first time the gruesome details of Javier's capacity for cruelty. The beheadings were only the beginning. Lost jardineros were also known to dismember their victims and rearrange their body parts into horror show tableaus. According to Sebastian's report, during Lost Jardineros war with the previous cartel, Javier was rumored to have shot the two-year-old son of a rival while the boy's father watched. He'd painted the man's face with the blood of his murdered child. Those details had been mythologized, of course, there was no proof of that brutality, but when she read that Lydia closed her eyes for nearly three minutes before she could continue. The article also highlighted the grisly statistics of Javier's ascension. During the transition of power, Acapulco's murder rate was the highest in Mexico and one of the highest in the world. The city hemorrhaged tourism, investment, young people, and that kind of bleeding was difficult to staunch even after the violence tapered off. It was also true that, though the bloodshed had become less visible to the average citizen in recent months, there were still a dozen or more murders in the city each week. In addition to those numbers, countless more had silently disappeared. The very essence of Acapulco had changed, its people were permanently altered. Entire neighborhoods were abandoned as people fled the rubble of their lives and headed north. For those who left, El Norte was the only destination. If a tourist mecca like Acapulco could fall, then nowhere in Mexico was safe. The profile drew a bright line between Javier's ascent and the truth of the city's ruin. It was a brutal new cosmopolis, and its ugliness was underscored by the memory of Acapulco's glorious past. Sebastian's account was heartbreaking, unvarnished, and utterly convincing. It also credited Javier with the dawning peace, commended the control he exercised over his men, and appealed to him for continued restraint. It ended with a psychological profile of the man himself, and as Lydia read it, she knew it to be exactly true. Unlike his contemporaries and predecessors, Lilachuza was not flashy, gregarious, or even particularly charismatic. 
he seemed enlightened. But like every drug lord who's ever risen to such a rank, he was also shrewd, merciless, and ultimately delusional. He was a vicious mass murderer who mistook himself for a gentleman. A thug who fancied himself a poet. The article ended with the inclusion of a poem written by Javier himself, and Lydia's mouth dropped clean open when she saw it there in print. She knew this poem. The first one he'd ever shared with her. How in God's name did you get this? She whispered. Sebastian stopped pacing long enough to lean over her shoulder. Lydia read the poem again, even more terrible printed there on screen than it had been when Javier had entrusted it to her. Oh, yeah, Sebastian said. That was crazy. You know we run that annual poetry contest. His daughter, Javier's daughter, sent it in. She submitted it on his behalf. I guess she wanted to surprise him. Wow, Lydia said. Marta. The inclusion of the poem was mortifying. It served to coalesce all the facts into a vivid portrayal and to corroborate, somehow, the accuracy of Sebastian's description. As she closed the browser and leaned back in her chair, Lydia discovered that there were many different ways to feel horrified at once. Well, Sebastian shoved his hands into the pockets of his jeans and leaned back against the kitchen counter. He was barefoot and his socks were twisted into a small heap on the counter behind him. Lydia stared at those socks. What do you think? She folded her hands beneath her chin and shook her head. I think it's fine. Fine. Not good. No, I mean it's good. It's good, Sebastian, I'm not talking about that. I mean I think it'll be fine with Javier. He nodded at her. Okay. They were quiet while she contemplated further. In fact, I think it will be better than fine with Javier. I think you'll like it. It's fair. More than fair, almost flattering. He nodded some more. You feel confident. Again, she waited a moment to make sure her answer was true before she said it. Yes. Sebastian went to the fridge, retrieved two beers, twisted off both caps, and set one down in front of his wife. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little nervous. He tipped the bottle into his mouth and drained half at once. I'm relieved you feel good about it though. You're sure it's okay. He watched Lydia twist her brown bottle in circles on the table. You don't think we need to disappear for a few days, just to be on the safe side. She knew how important it was to be sure. She didn't fling the answer out recklessly, she measured it first. And then, no, I think we're fine, she said. A hundred percent. Yes. A hundred percent. She closed the laptop and pushed it away. Sebastian was leaning against the counter. He hadn't shaved that morning, and there was a shadow of stubble across his chin. Are you surprised? You think it's too sympathetic? He asked. No. I mean, it's still horrifying. She sipped from the bottle. But accurate. You show that he's human. So as far as the truth goes, I think he'll be pleased. That was a Monday evening, less than two weeks ago. Lydia remembers it was Monday because she'd just brought Luca home from football practice and he'd been hungry, so she'd given him a slice of toast and a banana even though he was late getting to bed. He'd tracked dirt into the hallway because he forgot to take his cleats off at the door, and Lydia had been annoyed because she'd just swept. Less than two weeks ago, dirt on the floor in her hallway was a thing that could annoy her. It's unimaginable. The reality of what happened is so much worse than the very worst of her imaginary fears had ever been. But it could be worse still. Because there is still Luca. On top of the train, Lydia takes two of the canvas belts from her pack and secures one through the back belt loop of Luca's jeans before threading it through a metal loop atop the grating where they sit. Then she belts herself to the top of the train in the same way. She doesn't know if that small strap of canvas would actually do much to save Luca, should he fall. All she can do is try. She imagines that most accidents happen when migrants are trying to get on and off the trains anyway. Her feet smart in a way they haven't since she was a young girl leaping from the swings at a full arc, when she'd land with a thud, and feel that echo of tenderness reverberate up her legs. They're sore, but it's not a bad pain. It's only a reminder that she's alive, that her legs can be used like pistons and springs, that her feet can still make a racket beneath her. She flexes one leg and then the other, bangs her feet against the metal grating to loosen the ache. 
Rebecca and Soledad are a few cars ahead of them because they jumped earlier, but soon the girls make their way back to them, stepping along the tops of the freight cars, leaping across the gaps, ducking flat when the train passes beneath the roadway. Lydia performs a series of elaborate flinches while she watches them. Soon they're all seated together, along with the four young men who were already here, including the one who caught Luca when he jumped. Lydia watches the men react to the girls' arrival. She studies their faces as, one by one, they absorb the circumstance of the girls' extreme beauty and one by one, they shift their bodies ever so slightly away from the teenage sisters. The men are deferential. They know what hardship lies along the road for these girls, and they're sympathetic to that danger. Soon they all move past it. The men smile at Luca. They tap him and point out interesting sights as they pass, a mother cow with her calf, a huddle of trees like a rugby scrum, a stark white cross atop a low hill. The men bless themselves when they go by a steeple or a roadside grave. They pray. Those first few hours on La Bastilla are exhilarating. The train ambles west and west and north, and Luca feels a giddy sense that they are really going now. It feels so good to be a passenger, to make fast progress with the power of machinery doing the work. They drink water from their canteens and eat granola bars. Lydia gives one to the sisters to share. Soledad and Rebecca sit back to back their knees propped up like tent poles. Soledad eats her half in one gulp. Rebecca savors hers picking crumbs from the corners and allowing them to dissolve in her mouth before swallowing. The landscape rolls beneath them, shifting colors. Sometimes the trees draw close to the tracks, squat and scrubby. Sometimes they stand back and pierce the sky. Sometimes obstructions press in at the top of the train and threaten to knock the passengers off, overgrown foliage, the narrow structure of a bridge crossing over a ravine, and most alarmingly, the cramped tunnels, where the ceilings seem to skim just inches above their heads, and the echo of deafening noise amplifies the fear of falling. The migrants are alert to these dangers, they crouch, flatten, lean. They draw their arms and legs in and hold their breath. Periodically, the train stops, and after a while, Luca begins to understand how to predict those interruptions. First, there will be an abrupt change of direction, that means there's a town nearby, large enough that whoever laid these tracks determined the train should go there. The train turns and lurches, slowing first for the change of direction, and then further as the town approaches. The migrants shift into postures of alertness, make themselves flat atop the cars, so Luca and Lydia do the same. They watch for the dark trucks and white stars of La Policia Federal, whose job it is to clear migrants from the trains. What happens if we see La Policia? Luca asks. He's lying flat on his stomach, stretched out between Mommy and Soledad. Soledad faces him and rests her ear in the crook of her elbow. You run for your life, Chiquito, she says. Sometimes the stops are brief, a few minutes, sometimes they last an hour or more, while the migrants hold their collective breath, their muscles taut their senses strained. Their eyes comb the landscape for movement beyond the men loading and unloading freight from the hollow cars beneath them. Sometimes the working men throw snacks up to the migrants on top of the train before it leaves, or refill their water bottles from a nearby hose. Other times, it's as if the men have been warned not to aid the migrants, like they're invisible on top of the train, and those times are like careful choreography, all pretending not to see or be seen. And then at last, there's a whistle, a jerk, and the gradual acceleration of relief as the train resumes its journey to the next place. When the light descends to that golden, glowing hour, when it touches Soldad's skin like an uninvited spotlight, the sisters put their heads together and talk quietly for a few moments. We don't stay on the trains at night, Soledad explains to Lydia, after. We'll get off at the next place, Rebecca adds. Whenever it stops again. Lydia nods. She doesn't ask why. We'll get off then, too, right, Mommy? Luca asks. It feels like the sisters have invited them, indirectly, to go with them. Rebecca looks to Lydia, the girl's face nearly as hopeful as Luca's. Soledad is harder to read, turning askance so Lydia can see only her profile. Lydia's loath to get off, after their difficulty boarding. Now that they're finally moving, she'd like to stay on the train all the way to El Norte. But on the other hand, it's precisely because of these girls and their instructions that she and Luca managed to get on La Bastilla at all. They've returned Luca's voice to him. 
They know things. Okay, Lydia says. When the train stops at San Miguel de Allende just before sunset, Luca and Lydia follow Soledad and Rebecca down the ladder. They wave goodbye to the men who remain behind, and wave hello to the men who are opening one of the freight cars to unload the waiting cargo. They set off quickly into the town. San Miguel de Allende is immaculate, with low stone walls lining the streets, and manicured trees and flowers in the plazas. They follow a wide avenue as it swoops past a pink church, rosy in the setting sun, with pennant flags strung festively from the facade to the front gates of the churchyard. Luca can still feel the leftover vibration of the train in his bones as they walk. The concrete underfoot has a new sensation of active stillness. They pass a furniture store, a pharmacy, a bar, a fancy house with balconies, three men loitering beneath a palm tree, causing the sisters to quicken their steps. They pass new houses of stucco and old houses of stone, a supermarket, a football field, a woman begging on the street, a nicer supermarket, and finally, a roundabout that seems to demarcate the downtown's edge. The sisters walk by instinct, and they've become good at it following the signs and the people, wending their way into the denser parts of town in search of La Plaza Central. They feel safest where it's clean and crowded. A hotel, a hardware store, a bus station, a statue of a winged angel attacking somebody with a sword, and the daylight descends from pink to purple. Beside a fruit vendor, a man sits astride a milk crate wearing a white cowboy hat. His accordion grows and shrinks in his hands like flamboyant lungs. He makes the music the whole street moves to. A lady is grilling meat nearby, and the aroma makes Luca's stomach twist in hunger, but they keep walking as the streets become narrow instead of broad, stone instead of tarmac. Paper lanterns stretch across the spaces overhead, affixed to the wrought iron balconies and bobbing in the urban breeze. It's different from Acapulco in every conceivable way except one, it's like a sensory postcard of a Mexican town. The sun sets west at their backs, making everything blush. Luca squeezes his mother's hand. Mommy, I'm hungry. Good timing, Chiquito, Soledad says. We're here. Here is the Plaza Principal of San Miguel de Allende. They duck beneath the arched stone portico of a cinnamon-colored building and take a moment to rest. Luca lets go of Mammy's hand and leans his pack against the wall behind him. In the plaza, people are eating tortas and drinking cokes. They're chatting and laughing. Three mariachi bands in competing colors, orange, white, powder, blue, keep just enough distance between them to be heard above their rivals. They stroll the corners of the plaza and romance the tourists with the brightness of their music. There's a band of odd trees that fills the square between them, their trunks tight and compact. The weird spread of their limbs above blends their foliage into one thick, spongy green ceiling. A riot of pink spires topped by a golden cross rises from the canopy like a fairy palace. It's the Parroquia de San Miguel Archangel, and the church makes a stunning silhouette against the dusky sky. Crazy. Rebecca says the word they're all thinking. It's one of the strangest places Luca has ever seen. And just as the last ray of sunlight lifts diagonally from the Plaza Principal and slides up the steeples on its way out of town, all at once the studded lampposts blaze to light. The strings of lights around the tree trunks pop and glow. It's overwhelming, to be in a beautiful, festive place like this. Lydia is overcome by guilt. Because it feels incongruous and seductive and wrong to witness the simple charm of a pretty place. She can see that same kind of notion land across Luca's features, and she reaches for his hand. His mind does this awful thing to remind him not to be enchanted, it floods him with the helpful memory of all his dead family, the endless roll of gunfire through Abuela's bathroom window, the screams outside, the futile press of Mammy's hands against his ears, the single spot of his bright red blood against the green shower tile. Everyone gone. Luca is gone with them for a moment, so he doesn't hear Mommy when she says his name. He doesn't see the faces of Soledad and Rebecca swarm toward him in sisterly concern. He's unaware of his own sobbing, the way he clamps his hands over his head. He doesn't know how long he's gone, but when he returns, he's tucked into the curl of Mammy's body and she's rocking him. Her hands through his hair, her voice a hum of tight comfort in his ear. Shish, Amorcito, it's okay, Lydia says. He nods. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm okay now. But she doesn't let go. 
Soledad catches Lydia's eye across the top of Luca's head, and some byway of recognition darts between them. They perceive each other, the unspoken trauma they've both endured, their reasons for being here. It's as subtle and significant as a heartbeat. And then Soledad says, Rebecca, let's hurry now, and get him some food. Figure out where to sleep. Lydia funnels gratitude into the slow blink of her lashes. The sisters return quickly with dinner. It's like a magic trick, so that Lydia can see for the first time some benefit to their beauty. It's the best food Luca and Lydia have eaten since the quinceañera, because the sisters have learned important things. They don't bother with the street vendors, whose generosity might be contingent on feeding their own families first. Instead, Soledad and Rebecca have learned, it's best to find a fancy restaurant, and befriend a young man there who may emerge for a cigarette break or to make a delivery. That young man may find himself beholden to the beauty and raw need of two young girls who are alone so far from home. Very often, the sisters have learned, that young man will disappear momentarily and return with two heaping containers of hot spaghetti, still steaming and tossed with garlic, oil, and salt. Perhaps there may also be a spoonful of bolognese or some vegetables. A heel of warm bread. There is always a smile, a blessing, a flare of recognition from the hard-working young man who, because of the way beauty begets empathy, among other things, imagines his own little sister or cousin or daughter in the place of these girls. He bids them a safe journey, implores them to look after themselves. Sometimes he also provides forks. The girls are always effusive in their thanks. They call all of God's blessings down upon the young man's head. On the broad pink steps of the elaborate church, Luca and Lydia, Soledad and Rebecca fall gratefully on the spaghetti. They eat in silence, sharing the two forks, until every morsel is gone. Lydia thanks the girls, and her spoken gratitude feels entirely insufficient, because what she really needs to say is that the food, yes, but also their kindness, their humanity, their very existence, has nourished some withered, essential part of herself. Rebecca and Luca have wandered over to rinse their hands in the fountain, but Soledad is looking directly at Lydia's face. Maybe we should stick together for a while, she says. Lydia nods. Yes. Night collapses over the city. The bars and restaurants empty and shutter their doors for the night, and eventually, even the lingering mariachis disperse to their homes. As the lights of San Miguel de Allende falter and quench, the four travelers move their packs and their bodies toward the center of the plaza. They stretch themselves out on the municipal benches. Like bums, Luca thinks. It's their first night sleeping outdoors, and it doesn't feel like an adventure at all. He wants his bedroom with its stack of books on the floor and his ballon de football lamp. He wants Poppy's warm shadow on the wall. But his belly is full and his head is resting on the squishy part of Mammy's thigh, and Luca is exhausted. There's a tug of war in his heart already, between wanting to remember and needing to forget. In the months to come, Luca will sometimes wish he hadn't squandered these early days of his grief. He'll wish he'd let it pierce and demolish him more. Because, as the forgetting part takes anchor and stays, it will feel like a treachery. He'll mistakenly believe it's his own cowardice erasing Poppy's details, the mole above his left eyebrow, the tight, rough little curls of his hair, the timbre of his voice when he laughs, the sandpaper feel of his jaw against Luca's forehead when they read together at night in Luca's bed. But Luca doesn't know any of that yet, nor does he know that, no matter what he does right now, that creeping amnesia is inevitable, it's not his fault. So, in fatigue, he pushes those memories away and shuts them out. He recites to himself the geographic particulars of Nairobi, Toronto, Hong Kong. Soon, he's snoring softly on his mother's lap. Despite her bone-deep exhaustion, Lydia is the only one unable to sleep. She stiffens when a young couple approaches, tipsy and giggling. They steal beneath the trees for a kiss and then stop in their tracks when they see the darkened silhouette of Lydia sitting up on the bench, her backpack clutched in front of her like a shield, the sleeping figures of Luca and the sisters nearby. The children don't stir, and the couple quickly retreats. Behind the noise of crickets, their footsteps echo and diminish. Lydia envies the chorus of shuffling breath around her, how easily young people can slip into their weariness like a warm bath. She used to do that too, she remembers, before she was a mother. She could do anything back then, before she had maternal fear to spark any real caution in her soul. 
She'd been reckless in her youth. As a teenager, she dived from the cliffs at La Quebrada, just for the thrill, for the quaver that jolted through her when she leapt. She shudders now at the memory of that unnecessary danger and turns to look at the sleeping girl stretched head to head on the next bench over. When at last a dim light begins to creep through the canopy, signaling the coming safety of daylight, Lydia's mind releases her to sleep. Chapter 16. The joke at home had always been that Luca and Sebastian shouldn't talk to Lydia until she was well into her second mug of morning coffee. She always had two at home and a third in the shop when she opened. She got into the habit of cleaning the filters and filling the carafe at night so she wouldn't have to contend with all that in the morning when she was still half asleep. It was the first thing she did each day when her alarm went off, on her way to the bathroom, she'd flip the power switch on the coffee maker and feel a gurgle of happy impatience when the red light came on. On Sundays when she had extra time, she'd steam milk for froth, or brew the grounds with cane sugar and cinnamon for café de ala. Now there's no coffee at all most mornings, which triggers a daily headache, made worse when Lydia's exhausted from lack of sleep. They return to the tracks early, and there are a dozen or so other migrants gathered there waiting for the train. Nearby, a man wearing nice jeans and a clean collared shirt stands at the back of a pickup truck with the tailgate folded down. Inside there's a huge pot of rice and a cooler stacked with steaming tortillas. He's the padre from the trackside church with the pennant flags, and before he feeds the migrants, he offers them communion and gives a blessing. Then he fills the tortillas with the rice and hands them out. He also has a big orange barrel that says Gatorade even though it's fruit punch. One of the other migrants fills paper cups and hands them around to whoever's thirsty. Lydia and the girls sit on one of the benches and eat in silence. It's Luca who notices. Why are they waiting on that side of the track? He points. Hut Lydia says, chewing. The migrants are gathered on the southbound side. Rebecca takes her tortilla with her as she walks over to the waiting men. She speaks with them, and then returns to explain. We've missed the Pacific route, she says. What? Soledad sounds alarmed. Not by much, don't worry. Rebecca sits down beside her sister. Only an hour south of here is Salea. Ah, the third largest city in the state of Guanajuato, Luca interjects quietly. Both girls turn to gawk at him, and he slurps his fruit punch, embarrassed. Rebecca continues, so we can ride the train south and change at Salea for the Pacific route. But why? Lydia asks, sitting forward. Isn't it shorter if we go this way? It's not safe, Rebecca says. Our cousin told us. Everyone told us, Soledad corrects her. Everyone told us we have to take the Pacific route. All the other routes are super dangerous because of the cartels. The food is pasty in Lydia's mouth. Everyone says the same thing, Soledad agrees. Only the Pacific route is safe. Lydia doesn't need to be convinced, but she does have a question. The girls seem to know a lot more than she does. Do you know which cartels run which routes? No, but God is watching out for us, Rebecca says. She makes the sign of the cross. We will be okay. Just to make sure, the sisters go into the church to light a candle while they wait. When the southbound train comes through San Miguel de Allende, it doesn't stop, but it's traveling slowly, and the gathered men all board with ease. Luca watches the sisters jog along beside the train. Their fear makes them graceful and strong, their movements precise. Men wait at the top of the ladder to grab their hands and haul them onto the roof. Luca will not be left behind. He runs, and mommy with him, and he feels very brave until just at the moment when he grabs onto the advancing ladder, and the cursory vibration echoes into the palm of his hand and all down into the bones of his body, and that reverberation reminds him how small he is, and how colossal the train is, and how dead he would be if he let go at the wrong time. Mammy's behind him, and she boosts him from the backside, and he grips the ladder so hard his knuckles turn colors, and he's almost afraid to let go with one hand so he can climb up to the next rung, but he knows he must because he has to make room for mommy. So he climbs, and the fear is like a balloon in his throat but now there are two men at the top, and one reaches down and grabs him by the backpack and the other by his upper arm, and now he's on top of the train and Rebecca is smiling at him and here comes mommy over the edge. They did it. K. Macizo, Chiquito. Rebecca is impressed. 
He grins. Luca has never liked a girl before. Okay, that's not exactly true, because he liked Daredevil Pilar from school because she was really good at football, and he liked his cousin Unifer because she was nice to him like 85% of the time, even when she was mean to her brother, and he liked this one girl Miranda, who lived in their same apartment building, because she wore bright yellow sneakers and could make her tongue into the shape of a shamrock. So maybe it's more accurate to say that Luca's never been in love before. On top of the train, Luca watches Rebecca and tries to act like he's not watching Rebecca. Not that anyone would notice anyway, because everybody's too busy watching Soledad to notice anything else. In the half-light left over from Soldad's corona, Rebecca glimmers like a secret sun. She's stretched out on her back next to Luca on top of the train. So why'd you guys leave home? She asks him. Luca grinds his teeth and tries to formulate an answer quickly, before she can feel bad for having asked, but he can't think of anything to say. You running from your dad? She guesses. No, Luca says. Poppy was great. He rolls onto his side so he can look at her even though that means his arm is no longer stretched alongside hers. Are you a spy? She asks. I won't tell anyone, I swear. She's holding a piece of cardboard over her face for shade, and her black hair is all looped through the holes in the metal grate beneath them. Yes, Luca says. I'm a spy. My government received a tip about a nuclear warhead on this train. I'm here to save the universe. Thank God, it's about time. Rebecca laughs. The universe needs saving. The train rocks unevenly beneath them. Nearby, Mommy chats quietly with Soledad. What about you? He asks. Why did you leave home? Sigh. Rebecca frowns. She actually says the word suspiro instead of sighing, which is funny despite the unhappiness of her expression. Everything was bad, in the end. She sits up. Soledad is super pretty, you know. She lifts the cardboard to the side of her face where the sun is. Is she? I didn't notice, Luca says. Piazzo. Rebecca laughs and uses the cardboard to swat him on top of the head. Anyway. We come from a really small place, only a little scrap of a village in the mountains, or not even a village, really, because of how stretched out it is, just a collection of different tucked away places where people live. And it's a really out of the way place, the city people call it a cloud forest, but we just call it home. Why cloud forest? Luca asks. Rebecca shrugs. I guess because of all the clouds. Luca laughs. But every place has clouds. Not like this, Rebecca says. In my place, the clouds are not in the sky, they're on the ground. They live with us, in the yard, sometimes even in the house. Wow. Rebecca half smiles. It was always soft there. Enchanted. And there was no cell service or electricity in the house or things like that, and we lived there with our mommy and poppy and abuela, but it was pretty impossible to make a living in that place because there was no work, you know. Luca nods. So our poppy, he was mostly away, living all the time in the city, in San Pedro Sula. In his head, Luca thinks, San Pedro Sula, second largest city in Honduras, a million and a half people, murder capital of the world. Out loud, he says, ah, you are Honduran. No, Rebecca corrects him. Chuorti. Luca makes his face into a question. Indian, she explains. My people are Chuorti. Luca nods, even though he doesn't really understand the difference. Anyway, Poppy was a cook in this big hotel in San Pedro Sula, and it was almost a three-hour journey by bus from where we lived, so he only came home maybe once every couple of months to visit us. But that was still okay because this place, our little cloud forest, even though we missed our poppy, it was the most beautiful place you've ever seen. We didn't really know that then, because it was the only place we'd ever seen, except in pictures in books and magazines, but now that I've seen other places, I know. I know how beautiful it was. And we loved it anyway even before we knew. Because the trees had these enormous dark green leaves, as big as a bed, and they would sway in the wind. And when it rained you could hear the big, fat raindrops splatting onto those giant leaves, and you could only see the sky in bright blue patches if you were walking a long way off to a friend's house or to church or something, when you passed through a clearing and all those leaves would back away and open up and the hot sunshine would beat down all yellow and gold and sticky. 
and there were waterfalls everywhere with big rock pools where you could take a bath and the water was always warm and it smelled like sunlight. And at night there was the sound of the tree frogs and the music of the rushing water from the falls and all the songs of the night birds, and Mommy would make the most delicious chilate, and Abuela would sing to us in the old language, and Soledad and I would gather herbs and dry them and bundle them for Poppy to sell in the market when he had a day off, and that's how we passed our days. Luca can see it. He's there far away in the misty cloud forest, in a hut with a packed dirt floor and a cool breeze, with Rebecca and Soledad and their mommy and abuela, and he can even see their father, far away down the mountain and through the streets of that clogged, enormous city, wearing a long apron and a chef's hat, and his pockets full of dried herbs. Luca can smell the wood of the fire, the cocoa and cinnamon of the chilate, and that's how he knows that Rebecca is magical, because she can transport him a thousand miles away into her own mountain homestead just by the sound of her voice. The clouds were so thick you could wash your hair in them, she says. But then one day something awful happened, because we were so isolated up there in our place, so when the narcos came through, and all the men from the village were gone away into the city for work, those bad men could do whatever they wanted. They could take whatever girls they wanted for themselves, and there was no one there to stop them. Luca blinks hard at her. He doesn't want to experience this part. He suddenly dislikes Rebecca's easy magic, the way he can feel those men barging through the forest, their steaming bodies vaporizing the clouds around them as they swipe and stomp their way through the undergrowth. But he can't stop himself from asking the question. Those bad men. They took you. No. Rebecca makes a kind of face that reveals all her straight, white teeth but it isn't a smile, not at all. We were lucky because we heard the screams coming from our neighbors, because of the way those clouds could trap and funnel the sound, even from far away. So we stopped the fire from making its smoke, and we hid. They never found our place. Oh. Luca feels relieved. But then. But then after they were gone, and we discovered what had happened, that they'd taken four girls from our side of the mountain with them, our mommy decided that very day that Soledad and I had to leave that place, even though it was the only place we knew in the world. We didn't want to leave it. Luca can feel his face crumpling for her, and he tries to arrange it into an expression of comfort instead of pain. So the next day, mommy walked Soledad and me down the mountain and she put us on the bus to San Pedro Sula. Wait, what? She didn't go with you. Rebecca draws her knees up in front of her and fans herself with the cardboard. She shakes her head. She said nobody would bother two old ladies. So she and Abuela stayed behind. Luca swallows. He doesn't want to ask the next question, but he does, what happened to them? I don't know, I haven't seen them since that day. We got to the city, we found our poppy at his hotel and we stayed with him in an apartment that was just a room. It was awful there. So bright and hot and loud because there was always noise from cars and radios and televisions and people, but Poppy said we were safer, anyway. He liked having us with him even though we barely ever saw him because he was working all the time and he wanted us to start going to school. Was school the same there as it was back home? Rebecca makes a sad smile. No, Luca. Nothing was the same. She turns to look over her shoulder at Soledad. But we tried to make the best of it anyway. We never had much schooling at home, or only when we were little, so it was hard for us to catch up. And there weren't many other Indios there, so we felt out of place. We hoped to take the bus back up the mountain some weekends with Poppy so we could visit with Mommy and Abuela and our friends, so we could gulp the clouds and refill our spirits, but weeks and then months went by, and Poppy was always working, and we never had extra time or money for the bus, and then Sol, she accidentally got a boyfriend. Luca holds up one hand. Wait. How do you accidentally get a boyfriend? Shish, Rebecca says. Don't let her hear you. Luca drops his voice, leans closer. But how? Like, she was walking home one day by herself and this boy noticed her, and he called to her. That was always happening to her wherever she went in the city, so she just did what she always did, which was to ignore him, but he didn't like that so he chased after her and grabbed her by the throat and a few other parts and he told her that he was her boyfriend now. Luca feels his face wash into a shade of gray. I, I shouldn't be telling you all this stuff, Rebecca says. I'm sorry. No, I can handle it, Luca says. You don't have to be sorry. 
Rebecca picks at a loose orange thread on the seam of her jeans. I haven't been able to talk to anybody about this since it happened, she says. Only Soledad, and she won't speak of it. Luca nods. I understand. But it's like you're my friend, you know. Rebecca smiles. I am, Luca says, and he feels proud. You seem a lot older than you are. Like you're this old man in this tiny body. Luca tries to take this as a compliment. His body isn't tiny, it's only moderately smaller than a typical eight-year-old's. I've seen bad things, too, he assures her. Yeah. He nods. I guess you wouldn't be on top of this train if you hadn't. S un prerequisito, Luca says. A prerequisite. Rebecca nods. My poppy died, he whispers. He hasn't wanted to say those words out loud, to admit it. This is the first time, and he can feel the words leaving his chest, like something rotten has broken off inside him and fallen away. There is a ragged wound now, where he'd been holding those words. Oh no, Rebecca says. She leans forward like she's suddenly off balance, but then she touches her forehead against his and they both close their eyes. The rest of the sister's story emerges in stolen moments over the next several days. How Soldad's unwanted boyfriend turned out to be the palabrero of the local clica of an international gang. How he was, therefore, just violent and powerful enough to do whatever he liked to her without fear of reprisal, but not quite violent or powerful enough to preserve her all for himself. How Soldad's life quickly deteriorated into a series of lurid traumas. How Soledad confided some of it to Rebecca but went to extravagant lengths to hide the situation from their poppy because she understood that, were he to discover her circumstances, his resulting efforts to protect her would get him killed. Rebecca knows that Ivan, which was the name of the unwanted boyfriend, sometimes allowed Soledad to go to school, and sometimes did not. But there is much she doesn't know, how he always allowed Soledad to go home at nights because the idea of her having a curfew served, in the depravity of his mind, to sustain her virtue. How her decency, her moral resistance to him, her very obvious loathing, all turned him on. How, as Soledad began to perceive this, she sometimes pretended to enjoy his company in hopes he'd grow tired of her. And how now, when Soledad remembers that pretend enjoyment, she feels flooded with shame. It was futile anyway, because that effort at subterfuge was no match for her beauty. One day Ivan showed Soledad a picture of the hotel where her father worked. He said her father's name to her, and then gave her a cell phone and instructed her to answer it whenever it rang or beeped, no matter what she was doing. He showed her how to text. It's good to be alive, right soul? He said, and she cringed at the way he shortened her name, as if he were someone she loved. During all those weeks of suffering, Soledad, who knew the only flimsy protection she could offer her baby sister was her unaccustomed distance, barely saw Rebecca at all. When Ivan called, Soledad stopped whatever she was doing, as instructed, and she went to him. She left her shopping basket in the middle of the aisle, or got out of the line where she waited for the bus, or lifted herself out of the chair in the middle of her reading class, and she moved across the city to him like a zombie magnet. Twice, Soledad saw Ivan shoot people in the back of the head. Once, she watched him kick a nine-year-old boy in the stomach until he coughed up blood because that was one of the ways they initiated new chequios into the gang. That day, she asked him what would happen if she didn't answer her cell phone sometime, and he backhanded her in the mouth, leaving a bruise along her lower jaw and a welt on her lip that was difficult to explain to Poppy. I only meant if I was in the shower or something, she explained to Ivan afterward, or if my poppy was there and I couldn't answer. And when she said this, Ivan cocked back and pretended he was going to hit her again, and Soledad winced and cowered, and Ivan laughed and said, just answer your phone, puta. And after that, he let one of his homeboys pay him to be alone with her for an hour. Soledad didn't actively want to die, not really. She'd always been a happy child. She remembered how it had felt to be happy, and she wasn't sure she could ever feel that feeling again, but the memory of it provided her with some measure of hope. Still, during that long stretch of weeks with Ivan, there were plenty of times when it crossed her mind to drag a razor blade across the raised tangle of vessels in her wrist. Or to lift the homemade gun from where Ivan placed it on his bedside table before he did what he did to her, to train it on him and pull the trigger. 
to shoot him and watch his brain splatter satisfyingly against the ceiling above him, and then to turn the gun on herself before his homies could swoop in and punish her. To be done with it all, to be free from this repetitive torture. But then she thought of her poppy, the suffering her release would cause him. Her mommy and abuela back home in the cloud forest, too, when poppy would have to go home to their mountain place and deliver the news. But more than any of that, even, Soledad thought of Rebecca. Her sister was afraid, but still intact. Rebecca was still undiscovered, and it was the improbable miracle of that truth that kept Soledad going. The possibility of her baby sister's salvation. Then one afternoon, Ivan lay in bed wearing boxer shorts and smoking a cigarette. He blew the smoke toward Soledad where she sat slightly curled over herself on the edge of the bed near his feet. So I heard you got a sister, he said, nudging her backside with his toe. Soledad was very grateful not to be facing him when he said this because she knew her face would have told the whole story of panic that these words provoked. How come you never mentioned her? Soledad was wrapped in a sheet, it was tucked beneath her arms. She made her face into the approximation of a smile and turned it toward him. We're not close, she said. She's nothing like me. Outside she could hear two of Ivan's homeboys arguing, but there were also children playing somewhere beyond, squealing, chasing one another up the block. The sunlight rocketed through the open window. Nothing like you, huh? He said, sitting up and yanking the sheet down to her waist. He tapped the bottom of her breast and watched it react. That's not what I heard. Then he tossed his still full cigarette into the ashtray beside the bed and sat up on his knees. Damn, girl. Let me get in there again. Soledad endured him with something more immediate and terrifying than her regular revulsion, and when he was finished, and he instructed her to come back in the morning and bring her sister, she went home, packed her backpack, took all the little bit of money Poppy had managed to save from the coffee can on top of the refrigerator, and then sat down at the table to wait for Rebecca to get home. She wrote Poppy a note. Carido Poppy. I love you so so much, Poppy, and I'm sorry for these words I have to write that I know will break your heart. And I'm sorry for taking all your savings, but I know that you work hard and save this money only for us, and I know that you'd insist we take it and use it to get away from here if you knew the terrible things that were happening to me. And I didn't tell you sooner because I thought I could protect you and Rebecca if I stayed quiet and just did what they told me to do, but there are monsters in this city, Poppy, and now I'm so scared, and I have to get Rebecca out of here before they hurt her too. So we're leaving today, Poppy. We are already gone. And you must be very careful and look after yourself, please. We are taking you with us in our hearts, and we will call you when we get to El Norte, Poppy. And we'll send for you when we have jobs, and you can come to us, and you can bring mommy and abuela, too, and we will all be together again as it is meant to be. God bless you, Poppy, until we meet again. All my love, from your devoted daughter, full of sorrow. Soledad. Much of this Rebecca doesn't know. But she does know that Soledad texted their cousin Cesar in Maryland that afternoon while she waited for Rebecca to get home. And she knows that Cesar didn't ask any questions because he already knew all the worst possible answers and all he wanted to do was get them out of there. Rebecca knows that Cesar asked if they could wait a few days so he could try to arrange for a coyote to bring them all the way from Honduras to El Norte, but Soledad told him they couldn't wait. They were leaving today, right now. Rebecca knows that Cesar has since prepaid for their crossing with a trustworthy coyote who will meet them at the border. Rebecca doesn't know that the sum of money their cousin paid for their crossing was $4,000 each. But even if she had known, that kind of money doesn't even make sense to her. It's so far into the realm of the incomprehensible that it might as well have been $4 million. As Rebecca reveals what scraps of story she does have to Luca, he starts to understand that this is the one thing all migrants have in common, this is the solidarity that exists among them, though they all come from different places and different circumstances, some urban, some rural, some middle class, some poor, some well-educated, some illiterate, Salvadoran, Honduran, Guatemalan, Mexican, Indian, each of them carries some story of suffering on top of that train and into El Norte beyond. Some, like Rebecca, share their stories carefully, selectively, finding a faithful ear and then chanting their words like prayers. 
Other migrants are like blown open grenades, telling their anguish compulsively to everyone they meet, dispensing their pain like shrapnel so they might one day wake to find their burdens have grown lighter. Luca wonders what it would feel like to blow up like that. But for now he remains undetonated, his horrors sealed tightly inside, his pin fixed snugly in place. Chapter 17 for both Lydia and the sisters, there's a constant tug of war between the gruesome feeling that something's chasing them, that they must move quickly away, and a physical hesitation, a reluctance to move blindly toward whatever unknown demons may loom in the road ahead. The Casa del Migrant they find in Salea is a respite from that tug of war, and as such, after a sleepless night outdoors for Lydia, a holy blessing without compare. It's only midday when they arrive. Luca and Rebecca play basketball in the yard and no one else can join, some complicated game with jumbled rules of their own devising. Lydia and Soledad sit quietly together, watching from a nearby bench. They help in the kitchen, listening to Las Noticias on television, and then Lydia naps. When she wakens, she watches her son playing dominoes with Rebecca. She notes how quickly those two have bridged the gap between their respective ages, 8 and 14, Luca seems to have grown up and Rebecca to have simplified quite neatly, so they meet seamlessly in the middle. It feels as though they've known each other forever, as though these girls have always been here, waiting to become a part of their lives. That night Luca asks if he can snuggle in beneath Rebecca's arm in her bunk. It's not appropriate. Lydia draws the line. Luca knew it was a long shot anyway, but hardly any of the rules from his old life seemed to apply anymore, so he figured it was worth asking. He climbs in bed without complaint. Lydia hauls her backpack beneath the sheets by her feet and wraps its strap twice around her ankle. They all sleep soundly. Glory, glory to have a door with a lock. Soledad has told Lydia nothing of where she and her sister came from or what they endured. Lydia's said nothing of her family's circumstances either, but there's that silent bond of knowing between them regardless, a magic that's marginally maternal, but entirely female. So it's not surprising that in the morning, the girl, who seems much older than just the 18 months that separate her from her sister, and who's not typically so forthcoming about private matters regarding her body, confides to Lydia that she's pregnant. Taking her cue from Soledad, Lydia endeavors to deliver her response to this news in a calm, unvarnished manner. Your baby will be a U.S. citizen, she whispers across the top of her coffee cup. Soledad shakes her head and stands up from the table to clear her plate. The baby isn't mine, she says. When she stretches her arms above her and her baggy t-shirt grazes the waist of her jeans, her tummy is still flat. That day and night at La Casa are so significant in their restorative value that, in the weeks to come, when they think back to the halcyon memory of this place, their stay here will seem much longer than it was. Like all priests in Mexico, the padre who runs La Casa wears regular street clothes, a yellow polo shirt and a softened pair of blue jeans with a tar stain on one leg. His only religious adornment is a simple wooden cross that hangs from a leather cord around his neck. He's slender, with gray hair and glasses. There are more than 20 migrants resuming their journey today, and the padre gathers them in the yard before they leave. He gives a speech that Lydia thinks of as a kind of pep talk with an identity crisis, because he means to encourage them, but there's no pep in his talk. He stands on an upturned milk crate in front of the gathered crowd, and mostly, he warns them. If it's possible for you to turn back, do so now. If you can go home again and make a life for yourself where you came from, if you can return there safely, I implore you, please do so now. If there is any other place for you to go, to stay away from these trains, to stay away from El Norte, go there now. Luca has his arm around Rebecca's waist, his head leaning in, her arm around his shoulder. Lydia looks at their faces, they do not flinch from these hard words. Some of the other migrants shift their weight nervously beneath them. If it's only a better life you seek, seek it elsewhere, the padre continues. This path is only for people who have no choice, no other option, only violence and misery behind you. And your journey will grow even more treacherous from here. Everything is working against you, to thwart you. Some of you will fall from the trains. Many will be maimed or injured. Many will die. Many, many of you will be kidnapped, tortured, trafficked, or ransomed. 
Some will be lucky enough to survive all of that and make it as far as Estados Unidos only to experience the privilege of dying alone in the desert beneath the sun, abandoned by a corrupt coyote, or shot by a narco who doesn't like the look of you. Every single one of you will be robbed. Every one. If you make it to El Norte, you will arrive penniless, that's a guarantee. Look around you. Go ahead, look at each other. Only one out of three will make it to your destination alive. Will it be you? He points at a man in his fifties with a neatly trimmed beard and a fresh t-shirt. Si, senor. The man answers. Will it be you? He points to a woman about Lydia's age with a silent toddler on her hip. Si, senor. She says. Will it be you? He points at Luca. Lydia feels a crush of wild despair steal over her, but Luca lifts his small fist in the air and shouts his response. See, si, Sara yo. The speech does the job of energizing the migrants and stealing their resolve, which in turn makes them restless and impatient during the long wait for the train. In the third hour, a few give up waiting and begin to walk. In the fourth and fifth hours, more follow. Luca, Lydia, and the girls head toward the western edge of the city in search of an overpass, but the only one they find is way too high. Jumping from there would be suicide. So they search instead for a curve where the train might slow down. It's mid-afternoon by the time La Vestia finally arrives, and it's more crowded than they've seen it before. Even from a distance, Lydia can see the silhouette of migrants atop the cars. It's moving much faster than when they boarded yesterday at San Miguel de Allende. Lydia nearly says they should wait, they're not going to make it. She wants to articulate her hesitation, but she's not quick enough, and now the train is too loud. The noise thunders into her bones. They all run, and she holds Luca's hand tightly in her fist. The men atop the train shout down to them, instructions and encouragement. Rebecca goes up first, and then Soledad, who reaches back for Luca. He grabs at her with his free hand, and there's a terrifying moment where he's stretched between them, one arm taut with Soledad on the shrieking beast, and the other linked to Lydia racing beneath. He's like taffy, soft and exposed. And then Lydia hurls his little arm toward the train, and he's up. Soledad has him, and then the men from above, lifting. He is safe, he is safe. Lydia runs, not yet relieved, not until she joins him there, she runs and the train is picking up speed and she's falling behind the ladder, and she can't keep up, and then a burst of panic makes her legs go like pistons and she grabs at the metal bars, terrified, terrified that her legs won't be able to maintain this speed, that they'll drop, that she'll go under, but this is not her day, because all at once her feet have found the bottom rung, and her hands are only one rung above them, and the train is picking up speed so quickly now. She can't believe the velocity, but her body, all four of her limbs are attached to the train now, and she's curled there at the bottom of the ladder like a bug, and she allows herself one tiny sob of relief before she uncurls herself and, pushing up from the bottom rung, begins to climb. When she gets to the top she reaches for Luca, and she straps them down quickly with the belts, and then she holds him and cries quietly into his hair until her heart begins to calm. Lydia wants to keep Luca and the sisters to herself, to set their little group apart from the others as a unit. But the men are so friendly, so eager to help. Too eager, she worries. There aren't many women on La Bastilla, and very few children, so Lydia feels noticed by every single man they see. She's aware that she and her companions represent something to these men. They look like home. Or they look like salvation. Or they look like prey. To an Halkin they might look like reward money. And even if none of that were true, the two sisters cause a stir wherever they go, just by the very presence of their faces. Lydia is distracted by these observations, which is why, despite her constant watchfulness, she doesn't immediately notice the boy near the other end of their train car watching her. But Luca does. And he remembers. And in the act of remembering, he experiences a strange, incongruous moment of satisfaction, a brief wash of endorphins he's never noticed before, but that his brain has been performing all his life, a slight chemical self-congratulatory pleasure for achieving this task of almost perfect recall, Luca has seen that face before. He recognizes that boy, and so even before the tattoo is visible from where the boy is sitting cross-legged at the other end of the train car, Luca recollects it the bloody sickle creeping out of the sock. The three drops of blood-red ink dripping from the blade. Luca shivers beneath the hot sun. 
The boy is staring at mommy. And then, as Luca watches him, he retrieves a phone from his pocket, scrolls around a little bit, and then looks back at mommy again. Then he puts it in his pocket. Luca is paralyzed by fear. A moment passes before he can give wind to his voice. Mommy, he says simply, and he thinks he says it quite calmly, though his body, still strapped to the top of that train, feels like a wild flap of panic. Mommy leans in but not close enough. He flutters his hand so she understands. Come here. Get closer. Do it quickly. Lydia scoots closer to him. Mommy, I recognize someone. These words alone are enough to send a slice of cold down Lydia's spine. Okay, she says willing her brain to slow down. Okay. Who is it? Her arms and legs feel like they've turned to liquid, but the fingers of one hand stay tightly curled around the grating. The other hand goes automatically to the chain at her neck. She slips her index finger inside Sebastian's wedding ring. Don't look, Luca says. He's staring at you, at us. Lydia's mantra comes heroically crashing through her consciousness penetrating the violent static of this new information. Don't think, don't think, don't think, her brain tells her. Okay, she repeats. Who? Luca leans so his lips graze the top of her ear. The boy from the first Casa del Migrant at Huehuetoca. Lydia breathes deeply. Okay. Some boy they crossed paths with along the way. She feels relief in the jelly-like roll of her shoulders. Oh, Luca, she says. And she wants to reprimand him for scaring her to death but how is he supposed to know what may or may not provoke a stampede of dread in the confusing wasteland of their new life. So she also wants to laugh, to kiss him, to tell him not to worry so much. She puts her arm around him. It's fine, she says. It's okay. Don't you remember, that really bad kid, that cholo who got kicked out of the casa for bothering that girl. He did something bad to her. Yes, she remembers. Oh shit. The women at breakfast claimed he was a Sicario. Only moments ago, Lydia had dared to feel comforted by their unlikely progress. She'd allowed herself to indulge in the new fear of anonymous, indiscriminate threats. Now here is some Sicario from God knows what cartel, staring her down from a hundred yards away. She looks at the other migrants seated around them. Any one of them could be a narco. Any one of them could be a jardinero. She folds herself over her legs so her face is nearly touching the grating in front of her, or rather, her body does this without her mind instructing it to. An instinct to hide herself, to melt into the scenery, to disappear. Luca leans down, too. There's something else, he says, because he knows, although he doesn't understand how he knows it or what it means, that there's something deeply unsettling about the tattoo. What is it? Lydia is ready for this information, whatever it is. She opens the door to it. A tattoo. He has a tattoo. Her machete is strapped to her shin beneath her pant leg. She can feel the cinch of the holster, the way it presses into her skin. She whispers to Luca. What sort of tattoo? Like a big, curved knife, mommy, he says. With three drops of blood. Lydia's mouth goes dry, her fingers cold. Her body trembles from the inside-out core to tip beginning in her lungs. But to Luca, her face looks calm and impassive. Like a sickle. She needs, but does not want, clarity. Like this. She traces the shape of it on the palm of his hand with her finger. Luca nods. Thank you for telling me, Miho, she says. You did the right thing. Good boy. She touches his ear. Before Lydia can formulate a plan, before she can absorb this information, indeed, before she can even turn her face in the direction Luca has indicated to glimpse the boy with the Jardinero tattoo, there's a collective shriek and terrible commotion two cars up. They turn instinctively in the direction of the clamor. Everyone holds their breath and then almost immediately, with a long hoot of its whistle, the train enters a tunnel and all is in darkness. Mommy. Luca screams. I'm here. Lydia gropes for his hand. I'm here, Miho. What happened? I don't know, Miho. I'm scared. I know, Miho, it's okay. She reaches through the blackness and touches the soft fuzz at the back of his head. The tunnel is a short one, and soon they blast out into daylight again, and the sisters, who'd been dozing in a small heap until the commotion, sit up and blink rapidly at each other. A weary Morse code.
What happened? Soledad asks. There's still a lot of yelling coming from the car too ahead of theirs, and a couple of voices begin to emerge from the fray, louder than the others. One man is wailing, Hermano, Hermano, Hermano. And then he stands up on top of the train, and his companions grab him and pull him back down, and then a moment later the scene repeats itself. He seems determined to jump off, and now the story is traveling back along the train until it gets to the cluster of men seated in front of the sisters. One young man turns to share it. His brother fell off. Soledad gasps and crosses herself. Dios mío, how? She asks. The man points back at the tunnel they just passed through. Didn't see the tunnel. Was sitting up too tall on his knees, and bang. He hit his head on the top of the tunnel and got knocked right off. Soldad's face is a twist of horrified compassion. She leans past the young man because she can see now, beyond him, that the wailing brother is back on his feet a third time. The words fly out of her mouth by instinct, her hand darts toward him. Stop him. She screams. Grab him. But it's too late. The man has jumped. He's a distorted silhouette of arched arms and legs against the bleary yellow of the late morning sky. His shadow makes the shape of grief as he hurtles toward the earth. Too far, it's too far. Soldad's voice is still working independently of her body. Oh my god, oh my god. Their train car is already passing where the jumper has landed. His body rolls down the steep embankment and away. Luca counts his arms and legs, one, two, three, four. He counts them again to make sure. He still has all four, but they don't seem to be working. His body comes to a stop in a thicket of weeds, and the train storms on without him. Without his brother. Soledad is almost catatonic after watching the man jump, as if the incident loosened the fragile scab of her own suffering. She lies down again, and Rebecca pulls her sister's head into her lap. She strokes Soldad's long, black hair back away from her forehead, and quietly sings a song in a language Lydia has never heard before. Soledad stays there unblinking, but soon her expression softens, her dark eyebrows turn slack, and her lids flutter closed. She drifts into some state akin to sleep. Lydia doesn't stare at the boy at the other end of the freight car, but she's hyper-aware now of his attention. He sits with his legs outstretched and his weight leaned back on his propped hands, and he's watching them. Lydia does recognize him now, but only because Luca mentioned it. He's wearing oversized red shorts and a huge white t-shirt. Over that the giant red and black tank top jersey of some professional basketball team, and big diamond earrings in both ears. The jewelry is probably fake, but it does the trick of making him look like a hip-hop star, which is exactly the look he was hoping to achieve when he shaved those two tiny pinstripes into his right eyebrow. Lydia doesn't turn her head. With the precision of a huntress, she can sense his movements with her peripheral vision, when he lifts his flat-brimmed black baseball cap to scratch beneath it, when he leans slightly over the edge of the train car to spit, when he unscrews the cap from his water bottle to take a drink. She wonders if he can feel her anxiety, if her studied nonchalance is biologically ineffective, if her body is shooting off alarm pheromones he can detect. A primal consciousness has sprung up between them. So she's aware, too, of the ways her own body responds when, on a long stretch of straight, open track, he lifts himself up from his position and moves toward them. Lydia's heartbeat increases, her pupils dilate, her grip on Luca tightens, indeed all her muscles either constrict or twitch, and her skin prickles with goose bumps. Her palms grow slick and clammy. She lets go of Luca and gropes at the machete strap to her lower leg beneath her pants. Everyone watches the young man pick his way gingerly past the groups of migrants on the train top. Everyone always watches when someone is on the move they look for signs of drunkenness or erratic behavior. They look for the gleam of a concealed blade. They're especially alert to this young man because it's so obvious what he is. They lean away from him as he passes. You looking for the cafe car, amigo? An older man in a straw hat asks him. The nearby migrants laugh but it's a suspicious laughter. Why is he alone? Where does he think he's going? Just stretching my legs, the young man answers. They keep an eye on his tattoo after he passes, their friendliness a tinny facade. Most migrants understand the significance of those three drops of tattooed blood, one for each kill. 
Lydia pulls the machete from its small holster and draws it out from beneath her pant leg as the boy approaches. She presses the button to engage the blade and feels gratified by its appearance. Luca watches her silently as she conceals it beneath her sleeve. Some small flash of instinct advises Lydia to ditch the blade and watch instead for a passing bush for some soft landing point, and then to pitch her son from the train as soon as she spots a place where he might survive the fall. She reaches over and briefly grabs his leg to make sure her body doesn't wildly obey that foolish impulse. She presses gravity onto his folded legs and feels grateful for the insurance of the canvas belt. The boy's shadow is upon them. Lydia doesn't look up. Yo, I think I know you, he says. He puts his body down in the very small space between Lydia and the sisters. He squeezes in there, and if her body could tense up any further, it would. She can feel Rebecca trying to catch her eye, but she doesn't look at the girl, because she doesn't want to draw her into whatever this is. Rebecca reshuffles her body, making room for the newcomer, and meanwhile, Lydia's brain has been so busy telling her to run that it failed to come up with a suitable plan for this moment, so she says the first words that show up in her mouth. I didn't think so, but my son recognized you from back the road away, outside Mexico City. She does not say huehuetoka in case the memory of his eviction from that place provokes his anger. She holds her body like a cocked gun. Ah, see. He leans over to smile at Luca, which confuses Lydia. She can't understand the chit-chat. If he's a Sicario, then why is he plopped down here shooting the breeze? And where is his weapon inside all that abundant clothing? Wood up, gooey. He says to Luca. Cool hat. He stretches to touch the brim of Poppy's red baseball cap, but Luca moves out of his reach. Anyway, I'm Lorenzo, he says, putting his hand out to Lydia. She's never been more reluctant to shake someone's hand, but she shakes it lightly and retracts herself quickly, replacing her grip on the machete beneath her sleeve. And you are. He can't be any older than 18, 20, Lydia thinks. How is it that he speaks like this, as if she owes him her name? Araceli. She expels the fake name on her breath like a surfer riding a dying tide. Lorenzo shakes his head. I don't think so. Lydia bites the inside of her mouth. If she ever doubted herself capable of stabbing another human being, that uncertainty is no more. Pardon me. You're not Araceli. The only response she can manage is a soft snorting noise. Luca leans against her. When Lorenzo reaches into his pocket, she coils her body so tightly she begins to shake. She will thrust the blade into his neck. But no. She's in a bad position, there's no leverage. Would she be able to kill him? Or would she only injure him, incite him to repay her failed violence? It would be better to jump. To curl around Luca like a shell so at least he would survive this moment. The leap from the speeding train. But could Luca survive whatever follows that once she's gone? Lydia will get only one opportunity to sacrifice herself, then Luca's on his own forever. Her body twitches with indecision. She turns the handle of the concealed machete cold against her palm. But then Lorenzo's hand emerges from his pocket with only a cell phone. No pistol, no blade. He clicks the thing to life and scrolls through the pictures. Lydia's breath shudders through her. That's you, right. He turns the phone so she can see. It's a selfie Javier took of the two of them together at the bookstore. They're on opposite sides of the counter, both leaning across, their foreheads touching at the temple. Lydia looks directly at the camera, but Javier's face is turned slightly in, his eyes pulled toward her. Lydia remembers the day he took it, how he told her that Marta had instructed him thoroughly in the art of the selfie, how hard they had laughed together. Lydia quicks on Perez, right. The boy beside her says. She tucks her lips inside her mouth and twists her neck once, but there's nothing even marginally convincing in the gesture. Lorenzo holds the phone up beside her face to check her features against the likeness. Yep yep. Good looking folks, he says. And then, in a voice that sounds uncannily sincere, I'm sorry about your family. What passes for silence on the train is the slow motion roar of the engine hauling countless tons of chugging, clacking steel along the track behind it. The wheels shriek in their tracks, metal winds against metal, the couplers between the cars knuckle and grind and squeal. 
Several beats of that kind of silence pass before Lydia finds her voice. What do you want? Lorenzo powers the phone off and puts it back in his pocket. What do I want? Shoot. He whistles. Same things as anybody, I guess. Nice house, a little bling, a good looking girl. He turns and smiles at Rebecca, who's still sitting quite close to them, but doesn't seem to be listening. She doesn't meet his gaze, and Lydia doubts she can hear their conversation over the noise of the train. On her lap, Soldad's eyes are still closed. Lorenzo examines his nails, looking for one to bite, while Lydia watches. What do you want from me? She clarifies. He finds a tiny, unassaulted white corner of fingernail and rips it off with his teeth. He spits it over the edge. Nothing. He shrugs. Just being neighborly. Where did you get that picture? Lydia scrunches up her nose and uses her chin to point in the direction of the phone in his pocket. Mommy, I hate to tell you, he says. Everybody in Guerrero got that picture. Lydia sucks in a breath. It's not exactly news, but it does validate her fear. For what purpose? She wants absolute clarity. Lorenzo smirks at her sideways. You for real? I need to know what we're up against. Lorenzo pauses. Then shrugs. Word was to bring you in. This is a surprise. Maybe only Hollywood gangsters say things like dead or alive, but that was what she'd expected. She tries to push this information into her internal hard drive, but it doesn't compute. Not to kill me. She asks. To kill us. Lorenzo sighs. This isn't how this conversation was supposed to go. She's not supposed to be the one asking the questions. Gooey, I said too much already. I'm not trying to get myself killed too. Lydia shifts uncomfortably beside him, the handle of the machete growing sweaty in her hand. So that's why you're here. To bring us in. Maybe Javier wants only to kill them himself, to witness her suffering. She and Luca will not go with this boy. She will kill him if she has to, she'll do it in front of Luca if she must. Nah, Lorenzo says. I left all that behind me in Guerrero. He waves his arm toward the south. Lydia does not loosen her grip on the machete. Okay. De verdad, new leaf. He grins. I'm out. She feels unqualified to assess this claim. She makes no response. How'd you get out of Acapulco, though? Lorenzo asks after a moment. Everybody was looking for you. You got magic powers or something. You some kind of Santira. Una bruja. Single quote. Lydia surprises herself with a laugh but it's only a husk of a sound. I suppose fear has certain magical properties. She'll never know how narrow their escape really was. The two of Javier's men opened the door to their room at the Hotel de Quesa Imperial just as she and Luca were entering the lobby of the hotel next door. So where are you heading to now? Lorenzo asks. I don't know, she lies. We haven't really decided. Lorenzo pulls his knees up so his baggy shorts sag beneath. He gathers his arms around his legs. I'm going to LA, he says. I got a cousin out there in Hollywood, doing his thing. As good a place as any, she says. And then the train silence returns, and in that thundering quiet, she wonders, why? If he was well connected in Los Jardineros, if he was making enough money to afford those expensive sneakers and that decent cell phone. If he was okay with earning that first drop of tattooed blood, and the second, and the third, then what made him leave Guerrero? There are infinite possible answers, she knows. Perhaps he disliked murdering. Perhaps he felt that the acts of violence he committed had some undesirable effect on him. Perhaps he had nightmares, the faces of the people he'd killed floating up before him whenever he closed his eyes. Maybe he was haunted, hunted, ragged in his soul. Or maybe the precise opposite was true. Perhaps he was so entirely without conscience that he'd been unable, even, to adhere to whatever deformed excuse for a moral code Los Jardineros exercised. Maybe he raped the wrong woman. Or stole money from one of his jefes. Or maybe he murdered so gleefully that his depravity turned him into a liability. Maybe he's running too. Or maybe none of these things are true. Perhaps he hasn't left Los Jardineros at all, and he really is here only for her. Whatever the case, Lydia feels shriveled by Lorenzo's presence. He's a menace, sitting beside her, and now the threat feels urgent again. It's all around her. 
She breathes it, and it's the same as ever, senseless, confusing, categorically terrifying. Javier feels as close as the day she first confronted him in the bookshop. The Russian nesting dolls. He'd reached for her hand. She can feel his fingers pressing into the veins at her wrist. She can hear that Sicario urinating into the toilet on the other side of Abuela's green tiled wall. Lydia wishes this boy would move away from them. Nine days and 426 miles from their escape, they haven't made any headway at all. Chapter 18. Luca likes the estates where all the homes are lined up like soldiers wearing identical uniforms, indestructible white stucco walls, helmets of red Spanish tile, all tilted at the same angle to the sun. He likes the anonymity of them, and thinks how nice it would be to live inside one of those houses with mommy, how nobody'd ever find them there. One thing he doesn't like is when the train tracks temporarily veer south, because even though he misses home, he misses only the life that existed in Acapulco before the quinceañera, and he understands that to be a place that no longer exists. It's nostalgia for a phantom limb. So he's relieved when the tracks bend toward the west again, and then, near a neat little town in Jalisco, sidle up beside El Rio Grande de Santiago and, at long last, curve northward. The city appears gradually and with several false starts where Luca observes all the familiar symptoms of an urban metropolis, food vendors who pause at their grills to wave up at the passing migrants, the occasional clothesline strung with bright colors snapping in the sunny wind, a gathering of rowdy kids along the fence of a schoolyard. And then boom, it all recedes, and it's just cornfields, cornfields, cornfields. Two times this happens. Three. Four. And then finally, unmistakably, Guadalajara. Second largest city in Mexico. State capital of Jalisco. Population, one and a half million people. All across the top of the train, migrants prepare to disembark. They wake their friends, stuff wadded up jacket pillows into their bags, they tighten the straps on one another's backpacks. Mommy unstraps herself from the train but leaves Luca's belt attached to the grating. Lorenzo sits in the same spot, in the same position, and observes. Luca doesn't like the way he watches Rebecca and Soledad. Mommy, Luca says as the train slows enough that some of the men on their car begin to climb down the ladders and jump to the gravel below. Lydia is rolling up her canvas belt, and she looks at Luca with her what? Face. I don't need the belt, he says. You need the belt. Mommy. This time she does the more aggressive version of her what? Face. If I'm able to jump on and off a moving train, don't you think it's a little silly to buckle me in like a toddler? Luca juts out his chin at her. She grabs that chin in her hand, pulls her face down to his. The unchanged nature of her temper when he's ill-mannered is a comfort like a hot bath. It is not silly, she says. We ride these trains because we have no choice, but they are extremely dangerous, Luca. Did you learn nothing back there when that man fell? Okay, he says, irritably. Fine. He tries to wriggle his chin away from her, but she only squeezes harder. He still has control of his own eyeballs, though. She can't squeeze those. He moves his gaze away from her face, to her left ear. Don't interrupt me, she says. And look at me when I'm speaking to you. He looks at that earlobe. Luca. Look at me. He returns his gaze to her face momentarily and then moves it away again. Listen. I know this is all crazy. It's reckless and wild, riding these trains, sleeping in strange places, eating strange things. And I know I haven't said it before now, but, Luca, I'm so proud of you. He looks her briefly in the eye. I am, she says. It's incredible, how strong you are, that you're able to do these inconceivable things. Luca has an unexpected thought. Can you imagine what Poppy would say? Lydia lets go of his chin and smiles at him. Poppy would say we are both crazy. Tears spring into Luca's eyes, but he doesn't want them there, so he makes them disappear. Lydia drops her voice to a whisper. Poppy would be so proud of you. You're capable of things I had no idea you could do, Luca. She squeezes his knee. I never knew. She reaches across the landscape of their tangled legs to grab Luca's hand. But you are still my boy, do you understand? He nods. Why, poor Dios, if anything happened to you, Luca? I couldn't bear it. 
I know how much you've grown in these last days. But your body is still only eight years old. Almost nine, he says. Almost nine, she agrees. But please, please listen. Never be complacent. Never assume you're safe on this train. No one is safe, do you understand? No one. She squeezes his hands. Machismo will get you killed. Luca nods again. The train has slowed to a placid roll beneath them, and Soledad and Rebecca both tie up their hair to disembark. They're wearing their backpacks, and they're turned, talking with the group of four men who've been in front of them since Celea. One of the men has made this journey before, he's been deported twice from San Diego, so this is his third pass through Guadalajara. He's warning them. Lorenzo eavesdrops. You have to get off before El Verde, the man tells the sisters. You have to walk the next part of the tracks. Why? Soledad reaches up to tighten her black hair in its fixed coil. The people in this city are kind to migrants, God bless them. You will find a good welcome here. But first you have to get past La Policia. They clear the trains at El Verde, and if they catch you, the man finishes only with a shake of his head. Don't let them catch you. Soledad fills in the blank for him. That's right, he says and stay with a group. You can come with us if you want. His friends, one by one, begin moving toward the ladder, and he follows. Rebecca relays all this information quickly to Lydia and suggests going with them. Lydia hesitates. She knows how dangerous it is to trust anyone on La Bastilla. There are thugs and rapists and thieves and narcos hidden in the ranks of La Policia in every town, but it's not only the police who deserve their suspicion. It's every single person they meet, shopkeepers, food vendors, humanitarians, children, priests, even their fellow migrants. Especially their fellow migrants. She glances at Lorenzo's clean, expensive sneakers. It's a common tactic for bad actors to ride the trains posing as migrants, working to gain the trust of unsuspecting travelers, so they can lure them into a secluded place where they can commit some violence against them. Lydia understands the increased probability of that violence being leveled against the sisters. Any gesture of kindness, any valuable nugget of shared information, any pitiful story of heartbreak may be only a well-designed trap. A prequel to robbery or rape or kidnapping. Lydia's brain makes her do the work of considering all this before she decides. But there's no time. The train rolls on and the men are getting off. In fact the whole train seems to be emptying. These four men seem kind. They have the steep accents of Central Americans. They're probably Central Americans, right? Lydia has to decide. Lorenzo's waiting for her to decide, too. Why is he waiting? His lingering presence makes the decision. She unbuckles Luca and stuffs his belt into her pack. Let's go. Lorenzo follows. For the first while, it's all warehouses to one side of the tracks, and all dirt and grass and open sky on the other, so Luca has the impression of walking just outside of something, like the warehouses are a kind of border, fencing something better beyond. They stick to the tracks, where dozens of migrants walk ahead of and behind them, in a sort of miniature caravan. The boy Lorenzo hangs close, not walking with them exactly, but following only a few feet behind, matching his pace to theirs. Luca is worried about that boy, but he's distracted by the unmistakable smell of chocolate, which adds to the sense that, nearby, there's something much better. Do you smell that? Luca asks Rebecca. Chocolate. He nods. Nope. Don't smell it, she says. Luca laughs. Well, I sure do. They trudge ahead passing behind the Hershey's factory without ever realizing it's there. Luca presses a fist against his stomach to discourage the groaning. They haven't eaten since breakfast at the Casa in Celea, and now it's late afternoon. Hungry. Mommy asks. He nods. Me too. When the warehouses give way to brick and cinder block homes, the migrants are cheered by the appearance of two pigtailed girls in school uniforms, one slightly larger than the other, one with dimples, and one with a scab on her knee. Their mother sits at a wooden stall nearby, with a cooler of drinks and a small grill. She's selling lemonade and hot ears of grilled corn. A fat baby sleeps in a stroller by her side. There's a large basket there, to which the girls return in swoops, retrieving armloads of little white paper bags. These they pass out to the migrants with their blessings. 
Bienvenidos a Guadalajara, the girls say, and may God bless you on your journey. The one with the scabby knee presses a bag into Luca's hand and one into Rebecca's. Thank you, Lucas says. The girl skips away, the hem of her blue plaid skirt brushing against her brown legs as she goes. Luca rips into the bag. Mommy. It's chocolate. There are three Hershey's kisses inside. As the city grows dense around them, people come and go across the tracks, carrying lunch boxes or bags of groceries. Kids with brightly colored backpacks hold their mother's hands and clamber across the rails. Many of them look Luca and Mommy right in the eye, and say, God bless you, and they smile. Luca would like to smile back, but he feels peculiar, too. He is unaccustomed to pity. At El Verde, there's a bench outside a neat, walled-in garden. The bench is painted orange, pink, and yellow, and a sign on the wall behind it reads Migrants Pueden Descansar Aquí. Migrants can rest here. A large, mustached man is sitting on the bench, and when he sees the migrants approaching, he stands, fixes a cowboy hat over his bald head, and retrieves a bat-sized machete from the ground beneath him. He walks toward the tracks with the machete still in its sheet, and keeps it tipped back over one shoulder. Amigos, hoy es su día de suerte, he says loudly so they can all hear. Today is your lucky day. I will walk with you. The migrants in front of Luca and Mommy cheer, but Rebecca and Soledad exchange worried glances. The man falls in step beside them. You are right to be afraid, he tells them. But not of me. Rebecca sticks her thumbs under the straps of her backpack and says nothing. You have come a long way, yes. Honduras. Guatemala. Honduras. Rebecca is first to relent. Your journey has been okay so far. He asks. Rebecca shrugs. They walk for a few moments in silence, only the sound of their jeans swishing beneath them as they go. Luca holds Mammy's hand, but he strains against it pulling her arm nearly taut as he tries to hear what the man is saying to the sisters. Well, I want you to have happy memories of Guadalajara. He smiles, and catches Luca looking at him. He's so large he could use that machete as a toothpick. Luca shies back to Mammy's side. My name is Danilo, and when you get to wherever you're going, when you find a job and a good house, and you meet a beautiful gringo boy and you get married and have your children, one day, when you're an old lady and you're tucking your nietos into bed, I want you to tell them that long, long ago, you met a nice man in Guadalajara named Danilo, and that he walked with you, and that he swung his machete around to make sure the knuckleheads didn't get any ideas. Rebecca laughs now, she can't help herself. See. I'm not so bad. Soledad is still apprehensive. Where are all these knuckleheads hiding out? Oh, Amagita. Danilo frowns. I am afraid you will meet many of them in short order. Soledad raises her eyebrows but doesn't respond. It's like the good, the bad, and the ugly in this city, Danilo says. And the beautiful. Lorenzo adds, gesturing toward the sisters. Lydia cringes. Why is he still here? Walking just behind them and listening in on every word. She shudders at his remark, noting how the girls draw their bodies closer in instinctive response. Danilo continues as if Lorenzo hasn't spoken at all. It's a long walk from here into the migrant places, he says. And there are many dangers. What kind of dangers? Lydia asks. The usual kind, Danilo says. La policia, railroad employees, security guards. Especially dangerous for you too. He looks at the sisters briefly. It's better to get off the tracks before you get to Las Juntas, go into the streets and make your way to one of the shelters. There are signs for them, or shopkeepers will point the way. If anyone says they will take you there, don't go with them. If anyone offers you a job or a place to stay, don't go with them. If anyone talks to you first, don't speak with them. If you need directions, ask only the shopkeepers. I will go with you as far as La Pedrera. A few miles. Why? Soledad asks. Why what? Why walk with us? Why not? Danilo says. I do this at least three times a week, a walk with the migrants. It's my hobby. Good exercise. But if it's as dangerous as you say, why do you it? What's in it for you? 
Danilo has the kind of eyes that protrude slightly from beneath his lids, so there's no possibility of hiding their expression when he's in conversation. Luca can see that he's not annoyed by Soldad's inquiry. He appreciates her skepticism. I will tell you the truth, he says. Then he pauses for a moment to smooth down his mustache with his thumb and index finger. When I was a teenager, I stole a truck. My father died in a work accident, and I was angry with his employer, so I stole that man's truck. I destroyed all the windows and the headlights using my father's hammer. And then I slashed its tires and I drove it into a sewer ditch. Seems reasonable to me, Rebecca says. I drank for three months, and I did terrible things in my grief. But I never got caught, and God provided me with a good life anyway, despite my sins. So this is my penance. I am like the guardian devil for migrants who pass through my little neighborhood. I protect them. Soledad looks up at him, narrowing one eye as she searches his expression for indications of deceit. She finds none. Okay. Danilo laughs. Okay. Yes, okay, Soledad says. They are quiet again for a few moments. You ever have any trouble? Lorenzo asks from behind them. Ever get beat up or anything? Danilo turns without removing the machete from his shoulder and looks back at him. Not anymore, he says. Lorenzo nods and jams his hands into his pockets. Cool, cool. Luca begins chatting with Danilo and the sisters, so Lydia drops back to walk beside Lorenzo. She's both repelled by him and drawn to the information he might be able to provide. Maybe he knows which cartels have alliances with Los Jardineros, which routes present the greatest dangers of her being recognized. She doesn't know how to begin the conversation, because in her mind, every question sounds like an accusation. Finally she speaks one out loud. How is it that you came to be traveling alone? Don't you have family in Guerrero? Nah, not really. Lorenzo has plucked up a blade of dry grass from beside the tracks and tucked it into the corner of his mouth. He speaks past it. My mom got married a few years ago and her husband didn't really want me around, so I split. Lydia glances over at him. How old are you? Seventeen. Younger than she thought. And how old when you left home? Lorenzo looks up from his feet and snags the grass blade from his mouth. P.S.S.H. I don't know. Thirteen, fourteen. Old enough to look after myself. Lydia takes care not to contradict him, but he feels it anyway. Not everybody has a mommy like you, all right. Some mothers don't give a shit. He tosses the grass at his feet. I'm sorry, Lydia says. Whatever. No importa. He slings his hands into the pockets of his baggy shorts. I was traveling with my homeboy anyway. We left together because he wanted to get out too, but then we got separated in Mexico City and I haven't heard from him since. But you have a cell phone, she says. Yeah, his stopped working. Oh. They walk quietly for a few minutes, and then he says, Yo, it was really sad what happened to El Jefe's daughter, but for real, what he did to your family. So few de locos. Lydia frowns. What? Lilachuza. What he did to your family, it was too much. When I saw that girl on the news in her quinceanera dress. That girl. My niece. Yeah. My goddaughter. Unifer. Yeah, when I saw her on the news, I mean for real I was already thinking about leaving, but that was it for me. Shit is out of control down there. Lydia cannot discuss this with him. They are only bodies to him, strangers on the news, people like the ones he has killed himself. That girl in her quinceanera dress. But then Lydia's mind snags on a previous detail, an exit ramp. What happened to his daughter? She asks. Lorenzo looks confused, so Lydia clarifies. Javier's daughter, Lelechuz's daughter. You said it was sad, what happened to her? Yeah, you didn't hear. Hear what? What happened? On the day Sebastian's article was published, Javier read it in the backseat of his car while his driver shuffled him through the sluggish morning streets of Acapulco. All his life, Javier had enjoyed an almost preternatural ability to predict incidents and their outcomes. 
When he was 11 years old and his father was diagnosed with colon cancer, Javier knew that death would be swift, he knew that his mother, who'd previously been a good mother, devoted and affectionate, would handle it poorly, that she'd medicate her grief with alcohol and new men. He foretold and accepted her abandonment well before it came to pass. As a result of that aptitude, Javier was almost immutably composed. Nothing ever really surprised him. So it was uncharacteristic that he failed to see the article coming. He wondered if his love for Lydia had blinded him to the inevitability of it, and that possibility caused him to feel a faint wrinkle of resentment toward her. Even before he read it and even with the anonymous byline, Javier, who read the article with his usual equanimity, presumed the article was the work of Lydia's husband, whose journalistic expertise in the drug trade was well known. Initially, he didn't need to measure his response, because the article didn't provoke much feeling in him. On the contrary, Javier regarded it to be a mostly fair depiction of his life. There were, of course, some marginal inaccuracies, one or two instances of exaggeration. There was more righteous condemnation than Javier was prepared to accept, but that was to be expected. Beyond those details, Javier thought Sebastián had managed to apprehend something true about the essence of Los Jardineros in Acapulco. And he was bewildered but unexpectedly pleased by the inclusion of his poem. Javier presumed that Lydia had somehow given it to her husband. Had she memorized it? A flattering notion. Secretly photographed it with her cell phone during a moment of lapsed judgment. Though the poem revealed something intimate about him, it also illuminated his humanity, he thought. He therefore portended that it might make him beloved by the people. He neither smiled nor scowled as he folded the newspaper and set it in the sunbeam on the leather seat beside him. Instead, he tried to anticipate the impact the article might have on his future. He understood immediately that there would be ramifications, that his relative anonymity was a thing of the past, that his liberty had been permanently compromised. He'd always known this would happen one day. He hadn't expected it to be so soon, but he would adapt. It was, at worst, a nuisance. Perhaps it could even be fun. He couldn't recall another time the press had devoted so much attention to a cartel as young as Los Jardineros. It had taken years of established work before ordinary people began to recognize the names El Chapo Guzman or Pablo Escobar, and there were plenty of people who still loved those men for their generosity and mythos, even after their spectacular downfalls. The only thing that truly unsettled Javier was his speculation that Lydia, his dear Lydia, had betrayed his confidence with the poem. That betrayal he had not foreseen, and it caused a treacherous quickening in his chest. But then it occurred to him that perhaps she hadn't been disloyal at all. Maybe she'd provided the poem as a faithful contribution, a nod to his true self. Maybe the poem was a gift. Lydia knew Javier as well as anyone knew him. His first response to the article was exactly as she'd predicted. At that same moment, several miles away, just at the outskirts of the city, on a sprawling finca with glittering all-day views of the turquoise sea, Javier's wife was also reading the article. She was a woman who had never been beautiful, but who took care to appear as if she might once have been. Her hair was platinum, her mascara and lipstick tastefully applied, her bosoms maintained by the architecture of expensive lingerie, her nails gleaming and square and only a shade pinker than natural. She hadn't had a cigarette in almost three years, yet here she was, smoke curling from the tip of her quivering menthol. She had a name, but she seldom heard it. Instead, she heard Mama or M. I. Reina or Doña. She'd reached an age where she expected each day to be the unveiling of some quiet new sorrow, and where she simultaneously believed there was nothing left in life that could truly surprise her. As she pursed her lips to draw on the menthol, the fine lines around her mouth became grooves. She stained the filter of her cigarette with a shimmer of gold coral lipstick and blew the smoke out over one shoulder. A nervous maid soundlessly approached and tipped extra coffee into her waiting cup. There were gulls out wheeling over the dappled blue horizon. The bougainvillea sang. But she sat, wordlessly rereading Sebastian's article for the third time. It troubled her. It's unsettling to see, emboldened by the veracity of black and white, the most deeply suppressed grapplings of your own smothered conscience, printed right there in the newspaper for all the world to read. 
Javier's wife had failed to sufficiently calm herself when their daughter, Marta, called from boarding school in Barcelona later that afternoon and destroyed her with the simplicity of a single question, Mama, is it true? And because of her failure, in that moment, to adequately reassure her daughter, she would forever blame herself for what happened next. Three days later, on the day before Unifer's quinceañera, the boarding school dean called to relay the news that Marta had been found hanging from the air conditioning vent in her dorm room by a pair of her roommate's knotted tights. The suicide note was addressed only to her father. One more death should not matter much. Chapter 19 Just on the outskirts of Guadalajara, inhaling the fragrance of chocolate, Lydia stops dead in her tracks. Her hand flies up to her mouth. Lorenzo turns to face her. Yeah, so I guess the daughter read that article your husband wrote, he says. Oh my god, Lydia says. You didn't know this. Lydia's voice falters. Yeah, somebody sent her the article, and when she read it, she freaked out and killed herself. Left her poppy a suicide note. Shit was ugly. That's why. Lydia's mind races to put the pieces together while the boy Sicario talks. That's why he went loco. Said you betrayed him, said your husband was responsible, said you were all gonna pay. He was really fucked up. Wait. Because her brain has seized. It's too full. Marta. Isolated memories surge up in Lydia's consciousness one after another and then pop like bubbles. Javier in the bookstore, Skyping with his daughter in Barcelona before an exam. Her apprehension, his fatherly encouragement. Javier laughing when he told Lydia about the pogo stick Marta bought him for his 50th birthday. How he'd tried it out just to please her and ended up with his back in spasms. Javier's insistence that Marta was the only good thing he'd ever done in his life. SMI Cielo, MI Luna, Y Todos Mis Estrellas. My sky, my moon, and all my stars. There's an unwelcome pang in Lydia's chest. She didn't know. She didn't know about her father, about the cartel. I guess not. How could she not know? It seems so unlikely, but Lydia immediately perceives her own hypocrisy. She hadn't known either. The first domino of her understanding teeters and falls. Lorenzo shrugs. I don't know. But he made your family like a straight-up vendetta. It was practically a press release for Los Jardineros. Usually when there's a job, you only hear what you need to hear, and it's only the people involved who know anything about it but this time was different. Everybody in the city knew, everybody in Guerrero. Lydia begins shuffling her feet beneath her again, but her mind is whirring like a disengaged motor. She is blindsided. All this time, all these miles, the same futile, idiotic refrain kept presenting itself through her thoughts. This wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen. She'd misjudged him. She had missed something. A thousand times, she'd replayed the conversation she'd had with Sebastian the night before the article came out. He'd asked if they should go to a hotel for a few days, to be on the safe side. No, I think we're fine, she'd told him. A hundred percent. Yes, she'd said. A hundred percent. How that answer has haunted her. It has followed her into sleep every night. It has twisted in her gut without reprieve. All the frivolous reasons she hadn't wanted to go to the hotel, she hated to uproot Luca, for him to miss school, for her business to suffer. She hated the interruption to their routine. And she believed, truly, that Javier wouldn't hurt them. What she wouldn't give to go back to that moment with Sebastian, to say anything else. To suck those words back in and obliterate them. A hundred percent, she'd said. How presumptuous she'd been, how foolhardy. Of course she couldn't account for every eventuality. Why hadn't she seen that sooner? She could never have predicted this, but she could have predicted that something unpredictable might happen. Why, why, why? Her body feels like cracked glass, already shattered, and held in place only by a trick of temporary gravity. One wrong move and she will come to pieces. Marta's death changed everything, of course. It changed everything. Behind her shock, Lydia can sense waves of competing emotions, but she shuts them all down. De ninguna manera. She will feel nothing about Javier's dead daughter. No, Lydia will not even say her name. She will feel nothing about his anguish. The note he sent her at the Duquesa Imperial, I'm sorry for your pain and mine. Now we are bound forever in this grief. 
No. No. His grief is not the same as hers. Lydia will not feel empathy for him. She will rage. She will inhabit the fury of her own senseless bereavement, the one that Javier invented for her. Instead, she will walk, she will leave him behind, she will repeat the sixteen names of her murdered family. Innocence, all of them. Sebastian especially. An honorable man doing his job. She will list them and repeat them and remember. Sebastian, Yemi, Alex, Unifer, Adrian, Paula, Arturo, Estefani, Nico, Joaquin, Diana, Vicente, Rafael, Lucia, and Rafaelito. Mama. Repeat. Her husband, her sister, her niece and nephew, her aunt, her two cousins, all their beautiful children. Her mama. Lydia will not stop saying their names. Lorenzo is saying something beside her, but his voice recedes behind her own recitation. She needs to be away from him. She will walk beside Luca instead, press his warm fingers into the palm of her hand. Her repetition will become a prayer. They pass into busier neighborhoods with curious dogs and kids riding bikes and women pushing strollers. Luca sees one man with a white cowboy hat riding an old pony and talking on his cell phone, which makes him laugh. There are also girls who look to be around the sister's age who stand near the tracks in groups of two and three. They wear clothes that look like mammy's underwear, and white high heels or knee-high boots. They have neon pink lips, and they call out to their countrymen in their Central American accents as they walk past. The girls invite the men to come have a beer or a smoke or a rest, and Luca knows there's something off about their appearance, their dress, something improper about their posture, so languorous against the bustle of the day. But he doesn't understand how it all works. He doesn't understand the difference between the men who shake their heads sadly and avert their eyes, and the ones who leer and whistle, who trot off to disappear into darkened doorways with those young dress-up girls. When he tries to ask mommy about them, she only shakes her head and squeezes his hand. Several times they pass clusters of uniformed men who rouse themselves when they notice the passing migrants, but each time this happens, Danilo removes the still-sheathed machete from his shoulder and swings it alongside his body as he walks. He does some elaborate shuffle that passes for a dance, and sings as they go, Guadalajara, Guadalajara. Tienes el alma de provinciana, hueles a limpio, a rosa temprana. When the men in their uniforms notice him, they return their interest elsewhere, so by the time they reach La Pedrera, Lydia feels as though Danilo has saved their lives perhaps seven times. She grips his hand and says thank you, but he shrugs it off and wishes them a safe continued journey. He turns and ambles back down the tracks the way they came. They hear him singing as he goes. Guadalajara, Guadalajara. Saves a pure tierra Mahata. I wish he could come with us all the way to El Norte, Rebecca says to Soledad as they watch him go. I can take care of you, Lorenzo says in response. The sisters turn to look at him. Nah, we're all set, Rebecca says. Thanks. Lorenzo shrugs, but Soledad has no patience for this cholo and has never been a champion of subtlety anyway. She wheels on him. Are you still here? Did we invite you to join us or something? because I don't remember doing that. Damn, girl. Calmate. We're all going to the same place, aren't we? Are we? I mean, what, you own Guadalajara now? She turns away. Come on, she says to Rebecca. The girls start to walk, and Luca with them. Lydia doesn't move. She knows Lorenzo could use that phone in his pocket to call Javier right now. He could snap her neck and then snap her picture, collect a big reward. Her death could make him a jardinero's hero. But isn't it possible that, beneath the shield of his baby narco swagger, he's also a scared boy, alone in the world and running for his life? And isn't it also probably true that if he persists in not murdering them, he might know more things about the cartels that could help them? He's already been a wellspring, and Lydia would like the chance to interview him further, to pump him for more information. Luca and the girls look back at her from the corner they're about to turn. Luca is holding Rebecca's hand. The pace of their life has become so fast and so slow, Lydia never has enough time to make decisions. She works from instinct alone, and her instinct is strong in this instance. It tells her to go, to get away from him. Can I ask you one thing? She says. He shrugs. Do you think he's still looking for us? 
Sin duda alguna, he says. Without a doubt. It's not surprising, but still, there's no comfort in the validation. Her body feels leaden. But we're safer here, yes. Lorenzo's wearing a string backpack. He squints and looks around. I don't know, he says. I mean, anywhere is safer than Acapulco. But he has alliances in other plazas. Claro KC, there's a lot more cooperation with the other cartels than there was before him. He's got reach. Deep into rival territories. Which ones? She asks. I don't know. What do I look like, some kind of maldito expert? Well. Yes, she thinks. She moves her lips to one side. I'm just trying to determine our safest route. There is no safest route, far as I can tell, he says. You just gotta run like hell. She looks into his face, broad and young. His eyes are heavily lidded, his upper lip softened by a feeble crop of hair. He has the remnants of a breakout high on one cheekbone. He's a veritable kid. Who has murdered at least three people? Lorenzo, you're not going to tell anyone, are you? She asks. She tries to anchor his gaze, but he looks away. Nah, I told you already. I'm done with all that. I'm out. He jams his hands into the pockets of his shorts. She nods skeptically. Thank you. Ni modo. Single quote. It's an effort to turn her back to him, because she is still afraid. The shock of a blade entering her flesh, severing her spine. The pile of her body in the road beside the tracks. Suerte, Lorenzo, she says, and she turns to go. It's even harder not to look back after she rejoins Luca and the sisters, but she knows he might interpret any backward glance as a weakness or an invitation, so she only imagines him falling behind. She pictures him following from a hidden distance, but she doesn't turn to confront her suspicions. She keeps moving, Adelante keeps Luca and the girls moving. It's not until hours later, on the doorstep of a migrant shelter, that she accords herself a pause of reassurance. Just before she enters, she turns and allows her gaze to sweep up and down the vacant road, to linger and search in every shadow, and to thank God. He is gone. They're exhausted by the time they arrive. There are good migrant services in the city, and between that and Danilo's modest heroics, the Hershey's kisses, Luca has difficulty reconciling all the genuine kindness of strangers. It seems impossible that good people, so many good people, can exist in the same world where men shoot up whole families at birthday parties and then stand over their corpses and eat their chicken. There's a frazzling thrum of confusion that arcs out of Luca's brain when he tries to make those two facts sit side by side. At the shelter, Rebecca and Soledad stand guard for each other outside the bathroom door. It's a luxury to slough the dust of the road off your skin, to soap up and stand beneath a spray of warm water, to watch it pool at your feet, grimy and brown, before it circles the drain and disappears forever. Soledad likes to think of the water molecules racing down the drain pipes, intermingling and dispersing, joining other pipes beneath the streets of the city, gathering volume and speed as they rush and tumble towards some unknown destination. She likes to think of the filth she washes from her skin, diluted and diluted until it no longer exists as filth at all. Although Soledad has the cell phone Ivan gave her, she can't use it to make phone calls or text because it has no credit. If it did have credit, Soledad still wouldn't use it for two reasons, first, except for her primo Cesar, no one she knows has a cell phone anyway, and second, like Lydia, she's afraid that if she uses the phone, Ivan will then somehow be able to find her. So the phone functions mostly as a repository of photographs, but also as a propeller that reminds Soledad how far she has come, and how much better her life will be when she gets to El Norte. So when, after their showers, the director of the casa asks them if they'd like to use the communications room to email or call anyone, the girl's excitement is almost too much to articulate. Finally, they can call Poppy. Rebecca has never used a phone before, never lifted a device to her ear and heard the familiar voice of a faraway loved one. Soledad has never initiated a call. It's an ordinary modern convenience that, for the sisters, still carries the full weight of the miraculous. How do we do it? Rebecca asks her sister after the director has shown them into the quiet room and closed the door behind them. Soledad frowns. Get Luca. 
The room is small, and it contains a desk with a glowing computer, one rolling office chair, and a small, floral print couch. The phone sits on the desk beside the monitor. Rebecca returns quickly with Luca, who sits down at the computer, asks the sisters for the name of the hotel where their father works, and finds the phone number within seconds. He writes it down on the lone yellow notepad, but when he stands to go, Soledad asks him to dial it too. What's your father's name? He asks, covering the mouthpiece as the line rings in his ear. Elmer, Soledad says. Ask for Elmer Abarca Lobo in the main kitchen. So Luca does, but as he prepares to immediately hand the phone over to Soledad, the receptionist says, I'm sorry, but Elmer isn't working today. Hold on. Luca hears the sound of her voice, muffled for a moment before she returns to speaking clearly. Can I ask who's calling? She says. I'm here with his daughters. I was just putting in the call for them. I see, she says. Hold on, I'll put Soledad on, Luca says. He hands the phone to Soledad, who takes his seat, her face brightening in nervous anticipation. She hopes Poppy won't be angry with them. She hopes he'll understand why they had to leave the way they did, without warning, without a proper goodbye. She's been haunted, these last weeks, by the thought of him coming home alone to the dark apartment, exhausted from a double shift, and finding her note. She's tried not to think about the anguish it might have caused him. She bites her lip. Hello. She says. Hello, a woman's voice on the line, still the receptionist. You're calling for Elmer. Is this Elmer's daughter? Yes, it's Soledad. Is he there? May we speak with him? I'm afraid Elmer's not working right now, Soledad. Soledad's shoulders slump, and she leans back in the chair. Okay, she says. Can we leave a message for him? It's an important message and I don't know when we'll have an opportunity to use a telephone again. I'm here with my sister, Rebecca, and we want to tell him we're okay. Soledad, the woman says. Just that, just her name. Soledad. But something about the hesitation in those three syllables makes Soledad's stomach drop. She straightens up in the chair. I'm sorry, but your father won't be back to work for quite some time. Soledad grabs the edge of the desk, and turns her back to her sister. Luca reaches for the doorknob, but Soledad puts a hand on his shoulder. Her mouth is open, but she refuses to ask the questions that will lead to her enlightenment. She doesn't want to know. I'm sorry, Soledad, but your father had an accident. Not an accident. Your father, he, he's in the hospital. Soledad clamps her knees together and stands up, sending the chair rolling away behind her. Why? What happened? Rebecca stands up then, too, and Luca moves next to her. Is he okay? Soledad asks. The woman's voice is low. I think he's stable, that was the last we heard. Soledad takes one breath. Stable. But what happened? He was attacked coming into work last week. She moves to collapse into the chair again, but the chair is no longer behind her, and she almost falls to the floor. Luca grabs the chair and rolls it over. She sits. He was stabbed, the woman is saying. I'm so sorry. Which hospital? El Nacional. I'm sorry, Soledad. Soledad hangs up the phone, and it takes Luca less than one minute to find the number for the Hospital Nacional in San Pedro Sula. Again, he dials for them, but this time he hits the speakerphone button so they can all hear. And 1,360 miles away, in the ICU unit in a six-story green and blue building, a nurse wearing clean white scrubs and a blue stethoscope darts into the nurse's station and tosses a chart onto the cluttered desk. Luca, Rebecca, and Soledad all hear her pick up the phone. They lean forward. I think my father is there, Soledad says. Her voice sounds swollen and cobwebby in her ears. My father, Elmer Abarca Lobo. The woman at his work told us he was there since last week. They can hear things clicking and beeping in the background. Voices. A child crying. The nurse does not immediately reply. Hello. Rebecca says. I'm looking, the nurse replies. There are folders, charts. She's flipping through them. Soldad's hand darts over and grabs her sisters across the desk. Together, their knuckles turn hard and shiny. A woman at his work told us he was stabbed. 
Oh, as if the nurse suddenly remembers. Yes, Elmer, she says. He's here. Not in great shape, I'm afraid, but he's stable now. He lost a lot of blood. Rebecca clamps her free hand over her mouth. Soledad digs her fingers into the skin of her face, her lower jaw. Can we speak with him? No, he's not conscious, the nurse says. Can you come in? Rebecca shakes her head, but Soledad answers out loud. We're not in Honduras, she explains. We're in Mexico. Rebecca is stuck on a different detail. What do you mean he's not conscious? What does that mean? It means we have him sleeping right now because of the damage to his brain. He needs to sleep until the swelling and trauma are under control. Soledad pitches forward, curling her body over her knees. Damage to his brain, Rebecca says. I don't understand. Yes, the nurse says. He was stabbed in the face. Oh my god. Both girls begin to cry. Luca is shifting his weight ever more rapidly from foot to foot. He backs away from the phone until he's leaning against the wall beside the door. He was stabbed once in the stomach and twice in the face. The nurse keeps talking. She's not oblivious to the sister's pain, but she knows she has to impart this information, and it's better to do it quickly, like ripping off a band-aid, so they can move on to the next part, where they already know all the awful information and can begin to process it. The stab wound that did the most damage was to the right-hand side of his infraorbital region. Infraorbital. What is that? Asks Soledad. Please speak simply. Even the most hardened trauma nurse in the most violent city in the world would have difficulty conveying this detail to the family. His eye, she explains. They stabbed him in the eye. Soledad asks. Yes, the nurse says. Oh my god, Rebecca says again. Yes, the nurse says. She tells them he's resting comfortably, that he's stable, that they will keep him in the medically induced coma until the doctor feels it's safe to wake him up. She doesn't know how long that will be. She warns them that the stab wounds were significant, and that there may be lasting damage to his brain. She explains that there's no way to assess that damage until the initial period of rest and healing has concluded. Girls, the nurse says quietly, and they hear a door close on her end of the line, followed by a peripheral silence. Do you know who did this to your father? Soledad lets out a sob and then answers, yes, I think yes. I do. Rebecca's black eyes grow even larger and darker. A storm in her face. Listen to me, the nurse says then. I need you to listen carefully. Both girls breathe raggedly. They are shaking. Don't you dare come back here, the nurse says. Don't even think about it. Do you hear me? Their faces are wet, their noses filled with snot and tears. Rebecca sniffs loudly and lets a small cry loose into the room. He's getting the best care possible, okay. The nurse says. There's a catch in her voice, too. We are doing everything we can to make him well again. And if you come back here just to sit in our waiting room and wring your hands and cry and get yourselves both stabbed in the eye, too, well, it's not going to do him one bit of good, you understand. They do not answer. How old are you girls? Fifteen, Soledad says. Fourteen, says Rebecca. Good. Your poppy wants you to live until you are 100 years old, okay. You cannot do that if you come back here. Keep going. In San Pedro Sula, at the Hospital Nacional, they can hear the nurse blowing her nose. My name's Angela. Call me again next time you get to a phone, and I'll give you an update. Thank you, Rebecca says. The nurse clears her throat. I'll tell your father you called. After they hang up, they stay in the room without speaking. Soledad stands up and sits down and stands up again at least ten times. Rebecca sits on the edge of the couch and shreds a Kleenex into pulp. Luca does not move. He hopes the sisters will forget he's there. He hopes they won't speak to him or ask anything of him. He needs to get out of this room but cannot move. His poppy is dead. Luca lifts a hand to touch the red brim of his dead father's hat. He pictures Poppy on the back patio of Abuela's house without nurses or blankets or beeping machines that might save him. He pictures the silence of pooling blood. Luca stands there and blends into the wall. Soon, there's a knock on the door. 
Soledad is grateful for the knock, as it gives her something outside her body to attend to. She opens the door. About finished. A staff counselor stands in the hallway with another migrant. There's a 15-minute time limit when people are waiting. Yes, sorry, Soledad says. We'll be right out. Lucas slips out just before the counselor closes the door. Inside, Soledad whispers, I'm sorry. What? Rebecca looks up from her tormented Kleenex. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's my fault, Rebecca. Forgive me. Rebecca moves swiftly across the small space and throws her arms around Soledad so her rainbow wristband presses against the still wet blackness of her sister's hair. Shish, she says. It's all my fault, Soledad says over and over again, until finally Rebecca pushes back from her and shakes her roughly by her two shoulders. Don't be ridiculous. It's no one's fault. Only S.A. Hio de Puta. Soledad crumples even smaller into her sister's arms. But I had to make a horrible choice, she cries. It was you or Poppy, I knew that. I knew we were putting him in danger if we left. Ivan warned me. I just, I didn't really think he'd go through with it. I thought if we left, he. Dot single quote. She doesn't bother finishing the sentence because it doesn't matter what she thought. She was wrong. The sisters take two shaky breaths together, and Rebecca wipes Soldad's tears with her thumbs. Stop, Rebecca says. Stop it, Sol. Poppy would have made the same choice. When he's better he'll be so proud of you. You'll see. Soledad dries her face with a fresh Kleenex. She blows her nose. You're right. He'll be okay, Rebecca says. He has to. Into the clicking, beeping silence of Poppy's hospital room in San Pedro Sula, the nurse Angela enters solemnly in her white sneakers. She had known his name, of course, because of the identification they found in his wallet. But there had been no visitors, no inquiries, until today. Sometimes it's easier that way, you can provide the care the patient needs, manage his pain, and administer to his broken body without the weight of additional sorrow. Angela has been a nurse in this city long enough to know that the pain of the family often eclipses the pain of the patient. It's relatively quiet in the ward this evening, so after she checks his vitals and changes his waist bag, Angela has time to sit with him. It's still light out but she turns on the table lamp anyway because she finds its soft glow comforting. She closes her eyes briefly before she speaks to him. Her colleagues don't do this anymore because it's too taxing. Too heavy. Angela is the only one. The violence is overwhelming in this place now. It's become a gang pageant of blood and grisly one-upmanship. The ICU is always busy, but it's not as overcrowded as the morgue. The other nurses use irreverent humor to cope. They use a secret rating system of smiley faces to forecast their patients' chances of survival. Angela doesn't judge them for it. They have to go home to their children at the end of their shifts. They want to stay married. They want to eat dinner and drink a beer in the yard with the neighbors. But after 20 years on the job, Angela still can't shut it off. She doesn't even want to. She pulls the chair closer to Elmer's bedside and lifts his hand, careful not to disturb his IV line. She rubs the back of his hand with her thumb. Elmer, your daughter's called today, she says quietly. Soledad and Rebecca called from Mexico, and they're doing well, Elmer. Your daughters are okay. They're on their way to El Norte. Chapter 20